Okay, council is gonna reconvene for this special meeting of September 24th. Madam City Clerk, we have an announcement of the roll call. Let the record show that all members of the council are present with the exception of council member Sawyer. Thank you. Mr. McGlynn, item 4.1. Item 4.1, review and discussion of landscape maintenance options for citywide parks, civic sites, and roadway landscapes. Jason Nutt, Assistant City Manager for Public Works presenting. There's a different name down here. Yeah. Good morning, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, uh, Jen Santos uh, has been um, reassigned for today as she is, she is part of our critical overnight operations uh, in the Emergency Operations Center. And so uh, with that, uh, I'll be providing with the presentation today um, and hopefully giving you uh, some good quality information along the way. <clears throat> so what we're going to do in talking about our landscape maintenance uh, is really to do a quick background on where we're at. What does landscape maintenance mean? Um, talk about some definitions specific to uh, things that we'll be discussing along the way and things you might hear when we come back to award a landscape contract. Um, we'll discuss different service levels. This is gonna be the heart of the discussion is really trying to gain feedback from you as to what level of service Service we should be providing within our parks uh, and roadside landscape areas. Uh, and then lastly, we'll give you a little description about what other agencies have done, uh, what we could um, foresee with different levels of or different types of uh, performance metrics and, and again, try to, try to vet out some feedback from you uh, as, as what what level of service or what performance metric we should be looking for when it comes time for us to uh, go and solicit and award a contract for these services in the future. So with that, um, our emerging issues relating to landscape maintenance is really, is really how do we do weed control? And weed control can be done in a number of different ways. It can be done manually, it can be done mechanically, it can be done with chemicals. Um, and uh, our prior landscape contract was renewed last August uh, for one year. And as some of you recall, that was a 10th amendment. Uh, it had they'd been our landscape contractor for a substantial period of time, and we pay roughly about $550,000 a year. Um, as we've gone back and started to look at that, uh, that particular uh, value uh, is an unsustainable practice in the current bidding environment relating to landscape maintenance. And so we know that the increase in cost was, would come as we start to just try to even control and manage the facilities that we have out there today um, at the levels that we were asking the current contractor to do. Um, that contract expires at the end of this month, um, and that is after a one-month extension. So uh, we awarded the contract in August of 2018. It was for 12 months. Um, at the end, uh, on August 30th, we uh, agreed to, uh, with the contractor to extend for one month um, of additional time. And so we, now, we are now set to see that expire on September 30th. So as I said, I kind of want to talk about definitions because there are some words that get thrown out there and, and uh, I want to make sure that we're at least all speaking somewhat the same language. So we use a term called glyphosate and glyphosate is a synthetic herbicide. It doesn't describe synthetic herbicides. It is a specific particular product in, in a synthetic herbicide or, or, or several synthetic herbicides. Um, and its purpose is to not only kill the uh, or, a, or address the uh, topical component of the plant, but also work its way in through the system and down into the roots with an effort to try to address the entire weed for a longer period of time. A neonicotinoid, did I say it okay, Vice Mayor? Yeah, okay, uh, a neonicotinoid, Nicotinoid is a uh, it's a product that that addresses the sensory um, components of some uh, insects and animals that utilize sensory. Uh, things like bees uh, and keeps them from being able to function properly um, and uh, both of those products were prohibited by council. Council specifically asked us to not incorporate those into this last year's contract um, based on the August 21st council meeting. Uh, a weed is basically something that's growing out there that we don't want to grow. 
Um, it doesn't fit with our landscape protocol and it wasn't intentionally planted. And that, so when we use the term weed, it's something that we didn't specifically specify for that location and don't particularly want there. Um, integrated pest management is a term of art. Um, it's a plan and a strategy to develop how we would go about developing a program to do all sorts of these different components of landscape management. Um, whether we're using the physical prevention or we're looking at our cultural resources and whether and, and how that particular plant or organism fits within that, um, whether we're using mechanical means um, that exist out there to manage that specific product, uh, whether it's biological or it's chemical. And with chemical, we talk both synthetic and organic, and we'll describe those in more detail in a moment. Um, one of the things that we wanted to just highlight, uh, we've, we never use uh, uh, chemicals of any type, whether it be organic or synthetic, in certain areas, playgrounds, dog parks, picnic areas, creeks, bioswales, and, and so on. Um, this has been a practice of the city for many, many years. Um, all components of the organization uh, have abided by that. Uh, and that is something that as we move forward, it's in our intention to continue. In many cases, we have requirements from the Regional Water Quality Control Board that stipulate that we can only do certain things within certain areas. Um, and uh, we have, as you see up here, the Healthy Schools Act says that we can only provide certain levels of weed control and management or other pesticide management in and around school areas um, with certain products. And so we work hard to comply with all of those. So as we continue to go through, that's all pieces of an IPM strategy. Uh, and uh, while we have an IPM strategy, we're interested in growing that IPM strategy into the future in an effort to continue to keep up with current practices and policies. And quite frankly, this discussion that we're gonna have today is gonna start to kick off some of that future discussion. Organic and synthetic herbicides. Um, that's probably at the heart of the discussion that we're gonna have today. And so an herbicide is a is a uh, chemical used to control and manage uh, weedy debris or plant debris. Um, and it is fairly heavily regulated by a number of different organizations and I've provided those up there. Uh, and um, the question for us is which product should we or should we not use and do either or all of those products have value within an operation of weed control? In our past, we have worked, uh, we have contracted with, um, our current contractor, sorry, uh, has been authorized to utilize organic methodologies. Um, up until this last year, they were also allowed to use synthetic products. Um, this last year, council gave us direction to, to not use glyphosate. There was not a direction to not use synthetics. And so again, glyphosate and synthetic our uh, glyphosate is a component of synthetic. It is not all synthetics. Um, synthetics, and we'll talk, uh, that'll, that'll be uh, in one of the next slides to get into more detail about synthetics. Um, but uh, we do use those periodically up until this last year. Um, Santa Rosa Water uh, has a, an IPM strategy that allows them to use a synthetic um, once per application, um, but They've never done that over the last year of that contract. Um, you'll also see the EPA and the State Agricultural Commission, they approve uh, these products and there are labels and protocols with which they uh, are to be utilized. Um, anytime a spray uh, of either of these two products is used, it has to be recorded and then submitted uh, to those agencies uh, at the end of the year. An organic herbicide, uh, it's a chemical that focuses predominantly on the leafy component or the topical component of a weed or plant. Uh, its primary goal is to burn um, the, that product with an idea that you're controlling it from the, from the surface down. Uh, it's not a good product to get into the root, roots that would cause it to not regenerate in the future. Uh, in order to try to have the best 
application possible, you'll come back multiple times applying to that same uh, plant in an effort to try to stunt its growth or to try to ultimately restrict its growth so much that it begins to die off from the ground down. Um, as you can see, we rely on the OMRI, or the Organic Materials Review Institute. Uh, they have identified specific products that are uh, appropriate for this type of application, and the product itself generally dissipates within a 24-hour period. It doesn't stick around and last beyond, uh, beyond um, that time frame. But it is predominantly a, a burning concept, and that's the... Con that's the uh, method with which it addresses weeds. We took an opportunity to test out organics um, over a five-day period just to give you an idea of what an organic product does. Um, this is an area that we would typically want to use some type of chemical uh, treatment in an effort to control weeds. Uh, this is the um, back area of a ball field. Um, those typically are dirt or rock uh, in an effort to um, make that part of the outfield uh, a little more playable. Um, it also uh, provides for more stable ground for the kids and adults as they approach the wall so they don't trip and uh, end up hitting the wall or the fence. Uh, on day one, um, the uh, organic compound or the organic uh, weed control was applied. You can see at day three, you start to see uh, some of the weeds begin to burn off on the top. Um, but by day five, there's not a substantial amount of change in that. It requires continual response to come back. Again, it can be effective, it just takes additional time. We thought it would be appropriate just to kind of provide you with a visual demonstration of how that works. On the synthetic herbicide, again, it's a chemical weed control, but it is focused more specifically to address the root at its, at, at, at its base, or at the weed at its base. And so it not only addresses and attacks the surficial leafy component on top, but its intent is to get into the roots and kill off that weed um, earlier on in its process. Uh, those products can also be used to uh, as, as a pre-emergent in an effort to deal with weeds as they're starting to germinate. Um, so the hope is that you keep those weeds from actually uh, presenting themselves during a course of time. And some of those pre-emergents last for months, some last for, for longer. Um, once applied, it generally has a 24-hour life before its components dissipate as well. Uh, and this, these products are also fairly heavily regulated. So what I want to do next is to talk about what weed control means. Um, I think this is gonna be, in my opinion, probably the meat of the feedback that I'll be looking for you from, is to try to identify what level of weed control we're really looking at. Because the level of weed control will, will to some extent dictate what staff brings you when it comes time for contract management. For example, if we're looking at something that's 100% weeds, weed control, where there, is, there are no weeds uh, visible, um, you know, we might make, well, we will make a very specific proposal to you, whereas if we go to a different level, there'll be a different series of options for you to consider at the time we look to contract. So this is what 100% weed control looks like. This is, uh, in essence, a brand new park um, before we've really had a substantial growing season. Um, it looks really great. We would love to be able to do this. Uh, it, it is uh, costly and, and labor intensive to get to this level. At 90%, we start to see some weeds that generate, um, but for the most part, we have a fairly good control over the site. 70% um, weed control seems to be one of these thresholds that we're starting to hear a lot about, especially as we listen to um, different companies discuss or different agencies talk about either synthetic or organic control. 70% is one of those targets. And so here's an image and a picture of what 70% weed control looks like in one of our parks. 50% is another key target site. Um, and so 50% is the left side that kind of describes and shows the level of weed production that will occur during the course of uh, a growing cycle throughout the year. Uh, and we would hope to manage to about that level if 50% weed control were the proposed. 
on the right side of the screen, you'll see it's 25% weed control. Uh, at that point, we're really allowing the weeds to manage the space themselves. Uh, and we're just at that point doing, um, for the most part, safety uh, type of, of management. Uh, and then lastly is, is, is pretty much a native space. Uh, we're allowing the weeds to uh, fully consume. We are not doing any management of any type, whether it be chemical or mechanical. Um, the only type of management we would do in a situation like this is one specifically for safety. If this were on a roadside or at a median, um, we would be trimming that in such a way that it didn't impact users of the public space uh, adversely or create any other type of visual impact hazard. The next series of slides will go through, kind of talk about areas where, where we think, um, where we, the staff, would say, we feel that weed control needs to occur in these spaces. And so when we talk about, I kind of mentioned it in the first slide, we, we never deal with any type of chemical control within certain areas. Um, there are certain areas where where weeds also need to be controlled that might not be in playgrounds or in dog parks, um, but that, we have to figure out the most appropriate and prudent way of handling those. And so you'll see at baseball fields, it's both the infield and the outfield, the outfield in the area immediately adjacent to the fence line. Um, pathways, we talk about personal and public safety. Uh, this is one where you wanna make sure that the weeds aren't six foot tall adjacent to the sidewalk or adjacent to the walking path because you wanna feel safe as you're walking through. And so there's a level of weed control that we would want to impose in that area in an effort to, to make the public feel comfortable uh, in and around our parks. Um, adjacent to roadways, I talked a bit about vehicular safety. If I can't see the intersection and the vehicle coming out of that intersection that poses a safety hazard and we need to be able to manage weeds, whether it's, whether it's removal um, or whether it's just trimming, uh, there needs to be some level of weed control uh, to ensure the public safety in and around our roadways. Uh, from the park standpoint, it's a matter of enjoyability. What is the park there for? What is it we want that space particularly to be available to the public to use? Uh, and um, whether it's just general open space or whether it's something immediately adjacent to a park bench, the question that we have to ask is, is to what level of, of aesthetic uh, weed control or safety weed control do we want to accomplish in those particular areas? And then again, areas in and around playgrounds. You know, we do have fall zone requirements that we have to maintain, uh, and um, we try our best to make sure that there are no trip hazards or other um, types of hazard that exist within a playground that would cause uh, a child to get injured or an adult to get injured chasing after that child. Uh, and so we need to make sure that some of those spaces are kept open, free, and clear, uh, or at least in a safe and manageable condition. We can talk about uh, fence lines, not necessarily fence lines in an adjacent to ball fields, but fence lines that we may have on the park ends. Um, they could be adjacent to a sidewalk, it could be between properties. Uh, you know, we recently received an email from a constituent out at a place to play that was concerned about um, berry growth in and around that property. And so it's, it's products like that that we have to make a decision, okay, how best to handle that situation. Um, if you cut it, it will regrow. If you try to kill it, well, it's a berry, it'll regrow. But um, the, the idea is to, to start to understand expectations and to be able to set up a protocol that helps us best manage those facilities wherever they might be. Uh, and then there's also the parking lots and then other landscape areas. Um, Dutch Floor Park is a beautiful park. It's a great picture because it's predominantly turf. We generally don't deal with weed control in turf. Um, we kind of allow the turf management to handle in and of itself, whether it's um, periodic, uh, whether it's uh, um, periodic spot pulling of a weed or removal, or whether uh, it's, it's part of our um, aeration process, but uh, you know, turf is, is kind of an actual good product to handle weeds, uh, but it's not typically something we would do any type of application to. 
So to give you a picture of a couple of spots that have reduced weeds already, um, Finale Park, uh, I kind of led with some of this. This is one of our newer parks in town. Um, once you start new, it's a little easier to try to maintain it uh, in that condition. Um, but at the levels that we currently have, we're starting to see those things slide and more weed growth starting to occur. Uh, Luther Burbank Home and Gardens, obviously we put a huge amount of effort into managing and maintaining that, and we also have a fairly substantial volunteer group that assists with the efforts out at Luther Burbank Home and Gardens. And so that particular property looks fantastic all the time. Um, and then, as I mentioned with the Dutch Floor Park, when we talk turf areas, we have reduced weeds generally on a, on a, on a norm because the turf takes over and uh, it, it has a tendency to reduce the number of the, the amount of weed growth. So just to now step back to our current contract, um, weed removal with synthetics is allowed with our current contract. Um, our current contract prior to last August twice a year. Um, based on our last agreement uh, in August of 18, we eliminated their use of glyphosates. That didn't mean they couldn't use other synthetic products or other organic products, uh, but they do two applications a year and that's the extent that we allow them to do it. Um, they spend quite a bit of time trying to manage and maintain our turf areas. Um, we don't talk a lot about that, but that is a major component of the contract is our turf maintenance, uh, whether it's soccer fields, baseball fields, or our civic sites that have just generalized turf, uh, they're doing quite a lot of that work. Um, they're also helping us maintain and manage some of our landscape uh, medians and site on landscaping. Um, with the elimination of glyphosate, that's been, very, that's been stepped back quite a lot. Um, so they've chosen, um, based on our current contract, not to uh, do some of those. And unfortunately, our current contract doesn't have great performance measures. So it's difficult for our staff to be able to step and go have a discussion with the current contractor to state that they're not complying with the contract. Um, it's our intent moving forward that we have a much stronger performance metric for that contractor so that we can make sure both from the contractor standpoint and the city standpoint that we both have a mutually agreeable product that we're trying to deliver and that there are methods with which we're ensuring that that product is, is, as, uh, being, a, is being done to, assert to that performance metric. Um, our city staff uh, does uh, have to, in this case, assist our maintenance contractor. Um, there's just, the contractor's not getting to everything, and so we do have staff members that go out uh, at, routinely and do some of the weed control. For the most part, they're doing the safety protocols, ensuring that our, that our roadways, medians, and um, entry areas are safe for people to get in and out of. As I mentioned early on, the current contract's about $550,000. So talking about some of the weed application sites and some of the commonalities that we're starting to see as we look around to others, when you're dealing with civic and park sites, those entities that we've seen that are using an organic only method, their, their goal is to try to achieve a 50% weed control type of performance metric. When you move to a synthetic product, they're trying, they, they, the general feel is that you can achieve about a 70% weed control. Um, there is the ability to do combinations of these where um, you're reducing other forms of risk. Uh, for example, you'll have some um, folks that will find uh, park areas that have a lot of um, a lot of concrete or a lot of asphalt where there's not a lot of, of human interaction or animal interaction, they'll use a, a th synthetic to try to address weeds in those areas to try to reduce the labor impacts. Um, but, uh, and so this is just kind of an example of, of different generic uh, application concepts. Um, the other is roadway landscaping. Again, it's about the same percentages. Remember early on I said 70 and 50 seem to be sort of becoming normal targets. Um, in this particular case, one of the suggestions is that, that uh, 
people are utilizing synthetics still in and around the roadway areas where you're limiting the amount of traffic control that you have to do. You're limiting the exposure of the applicators to live, to live vehicles and you're, and you're minimizing the, the traffic impacts to the motoring public. Um, and so that seems to be somewhat of a commonality that's starting to work their way around. Um, and then utilizing organics in those other areas where you have more uh, public and animal interactions, maybe along the roadsides um, where you have uh, side on landscaping and, and whatnot. A couple of agencies that we had discussions with to try to, you know, to try to vet some of this. We talked with the city of Davis, uh, who recently awarded a contract. Um, they, uh, their original award was for an all organic contract. Um, they have since stepped back and are utilizing synthetics in and around uh, roadway areas and around those areas where um, there is very limited human and animal interactions. Um, the city of Clayton has um, reduced the use of, or eliminated the use of glyphosates, uh, glyphosates, um, but they have a lot of districts. We don't have a lot of districts in our town, so they've got a different funding mechanism for how they're, uh, for how they're financing their, their maintenance. Um, having worked in Novato as an example, um, most of our landscape maintenance was funded with, with um, uh, benefit districts, benefit assessment districts, uh, and those areas looked fantastic. Um, the areas that weren't with benefit assessment districts, we struggled to keep them looking as good as the rest of the town. Um, the town of Healdsburg, they discontinued the use of glyphosate, um, but they, they increased their staff to supplement the use of the contract in an effort to ensure that they had uh, safe spaces in and around. So those were folks that were typically doing um, weed eating type of landscaping in an effort to keep those tall weeds lower. And then of course they have a uh, transit occupancy tax and landscape and lighting districts through town that are also help feeding those. So that kind of concludes the presentation. Um, what I'm, like I say, I, I think the images of the different performance levels, that's what I'm really hoping to hear from council is, is where would our, where should our targets be? Not only from uh, the metric of what percentage weeds would we be comfortable with, but then also a discussion of, of the different types of management processes that we have or, or products that are out there. And if you have any suggestions, I, I would love to hear it and I'm happy to answer questions. Great, thank you for that presentation, Jason. Very informative, you're a man of many talents. Thank you. I've Council, a... questions for Mr. Knight. Jack? Thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you, Jason. Uh, good presentation, it was really informative. Uh, you know, I guess um, some of the questions I had is uh, on page six, if you could go back. Um, where was it? Some organic products are not regulated. I think it was basically where are we currently not using synthetics? Uh, because it has kind of schools, we listed schools, we listed parks um, not using synthetics, but we're using ball fields, we're using synthetics. I mean, I think what I'm looking for going forward is where are we gonna not have synthetic uses at all where pets and people interact with the landscape? You know, right off the bat, I'm thinking a median in a roadway or it's probably unsafe to have somebody there picking weeds, that might be an appropriate use in my mind for synthetics, but everywhere else, I think we should strive for biological uses. Um, sorry, you look like you were, were chomping at the bit to say something. No, I was just, um, I, I, I think, I appreciate those statements. Uh, I think your question is where are we not using right. synthetics? Right now, the current state of the environment that we have is we're not using either synthetic or organics currently and have not for the last 12 months. And that has been, you're saying, difficult? Uh, well, yes, because we're using only mechanical means mm -hmm. um, and neither the contractor nor the city have staff currently we're not staffed at the current level to do a full comprehensive management plan with mechanical. The Santa Rosa Water Department has a separate contract. Um, their contract uh, allows for the use of organics. Uh, mm -hmm. It does allow for a single application of synthetics on a specific location. Mm -hmm. um, and, but all of those are in second and third position to, to hand and mechanical 
uh, weed removal. And their particular contractor has, as I found out this morning, never used either of the two chemicals. They've done only things by hand and they're obtaining about a 70% um, weed free environment. Um, and so that there, there is certainly something to be said about the program that they've been able to establish. Uh, they have a lot smaller acreage and mm -hmm. it's, a small, it's a smaller company uh, that's local. Um, and so I, I don't know if that has anything specific, if specific relationship to the end product, but it, it very possibly could. So, okay. so, so I, think, I think to follow up to your, your, your questions, council member, I think what we're trying to do is establish what's an acceptable level of performance here. Mm -hmm. um, I think what, what's not being articulated fully yet in the presentation is the volume of, 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 of community concern that comes to us about maintenance levels. And because there's not a clear level of acceptability, we have a hard time communicating to folks. So if you, I think underlying this is some of what's the acceptable level. Mm -hmm. There may be exceptions that we won't, you want us to take into consideration around safety. But I think underneath it is a 70% an acceptable level of weed mm -hmm. control. We know what that said. We have a way to communicate that with constituents. We can tackle issues. But underlying it, you're also hearing that there's no contract performance, right? because we don't have this measure as a community. And what, what, what gets translated then is there's a, a level of artificiality and pristineness that comes with, frankly, only a, as you're seeing, only a commitment to certain type of chemical use. You get that pristine environment if you're gonna commit to using certain um, things that the council has told us not to use. But in the absence of metrics, and, and an acceptable level to talk to the community, we don't have a way to dialogue. So what we end up is in a volume of, of, of conversations and quite clearly no clear direction. Sure. So again, that's what we're looking for so we can help shape that future conversation, not only with our contractor, but with the community. This is, and you're hearing that there, there are ways to do this. You establish 25%, 50%. Mm -hmm. We want you to look at, as you said, we want you to look at medians in a slightly different way. We're willing to do that, but for us to understand how to contract with somebody long-term and what the performance right. is gonna be and talk to the community, we need metrics to start to be established to do that. Yeah, and actually I'm glad that you brought up, Jason, that you're kind of operating or you, you did in this last 12 months at 70% because I'll be the first to say that when I looked at that diagram, I'm okay with 70%. In fact, I felt like that was a, a good target if it's helping us achieve this goal of not using synthetics uh, because I want to be clear, I do want to get away from the use of synthetics even on roadway medians, but why I threw that out there was to me there would be a logic if we were going to use them there. But I'm also looking at Megan, who's in the audience and has put in tons of work on this beginning at the BPU, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say at public comment about that. Um, so 70% is good for me. Um, let's drive towards synthetics. And I do wanna just say one more thing, and that is, you know, when I brought this up when we were talking about the Measure M funds, and I, I still am a firm believer that we need to do more seasonal hires for maintenance of all our parks and where weeding can be uh, in incorporated into what their duties are and, and even go so far as to, you know, I think it'd be amazing if the city could come up with a, a contract with, you know, you know, Catholic Charities or somebody, COTS, that, you know, might have employment opportunities for seasonal workers, people trying to climb their way out of homelessness. So I'd love to see that and uh, thank you. Uh, that, that's all my questions and comments. Thank you. Ms. Fleming, you have a question? Yeah. I do have a question about process. Are we going to get, take public comment um, after we ask our questions? Yes. Okay, so I will answer your question about what sort of standards you would like after I hear from the public. <clears throat> I'm curious um, for a couple, I was not on the council when you last received direction on this. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, when, I, when I talked to a few people, I had heard that all organic was the direction from the council. It sounds like that's not the direction. Can you clarify what the direction from the council was last year? So I, I had to watch the video a couple, two or three different times to make sure I clearly understood. Mm. Um, council was very interested and vocally interested in wanting to move toward organic. Council, however, made two distinct alterations to the recommendation to uh, award the contract. One was to prohibit the use of glyphosate. The other was to prohibit the use of neonicotinoids. Mm -hmm. 
and that was it. So, so generic statement relating to synthetics was not incorporated into the motion. Was that the, the spirit of the direction? From your interpretation, and you don't have to answer it, that. I get that's an interpretive I, question. I, I would, I'll, I'll be clear. It, 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 council appeared to have wanted to move towards an organic, but there was questions about what that meant, uh -huh. and there was questions to have us return with additional information, such as what we're doing right now, so that so that the long-term decision could be made knowing all of the information. Right. I do wonder about the wisdom of giving um, you and our contractor a standard without having very firm direction. Um, but I will defer to my other council members um, as we go along here. Um, I'm wondering if you could define a couple terms of art for me. When you say um, cultural means of uh, weed abatement or control, what does that mean? So, so of course, these are things that, that, that uh, Deputy Director Santos had incorporated in there, and those are a couple of things I don't particularly okay. know. I can look up and see okay. if either of our staff. I can Google it too. Um, and do we know what a bioswale is? A bioswale is a roadside is a roadside water catchment area, with the intention that it will filter out some of the um, non-natural products that are in stormwater. And so you'll see those in areas like uh, Peterson Lane. Uh, uh, out and that southeast or south uh, northwest area that has a lot of bioswales up there. So um, I'm wondering with the non um, non if we say non neonicotinoid chemicals, you said they fully dissipate after 24 hours. Does that mean that if an animal or an insect is to come by and eat it afterward, that they ingest none of the product? And I know this is a very technical question. Probably not at your pay grade, but it's important to understanding how we made this decision. And it, and it is my understanding that that you are correct that after that with that the particular chemical component of the product will dissipate will become a non product after a 24 hour period and therefore um, if something were to come along and interact with with the the weed or the plant, mm -hmm. uh, it would see no ill effects of any residual chemicals that might still be there. Because what my wondering here is that if we were to go to a, a system where we were to use those types of products in areas that don't have a lot of interaction with people or animals um, that we can see, there's still lots of interaction with all kinds of animals that we can't see. And I know I don't know about you, but I've seen squirrels with epilepsy and all kinds of other conditions that I'm not licensed to diagnose. But the point is, is that they don't look well and, and it seems like they're interacting with the, the chemicals and, and I, I don't know which type of them they are, but I want to make sure that we're not supplanting one for another and creating an ecosystem hazard just because we don't see it or we don't touch it doesn't mean that it doesn't get out there. So so, so a couple of points. Um, one staff, having watched the video from, from August, also picked up on this particular uh, comment that came out at that point. Uh, did some research and unfortunately they're actually, we haven't been able to find any specific studies that either say that in fact that is something that occurs where uh, a squirrel will come up and interact with a particular product um, or a spray area and have an impact mm -hmm. or not. Uh, and so uh, we've been looking around, we've gone to uh, universities that, um, that deal with uh, chemical applications, we've contacted other cities and organizations and, and we haven't found any research that, that tells us a yes or a no. So I, I, I realize it's kind of a non-statement, but but well, I understand the, that my, my observations are anecdotal and that there may not be a great body of squirrel research out there. Maybe that's an opportunity for us. But, you know, um, I, I, have, I have my concerns and wonderings around that. Uh, I'm wondering, besides the visual issues around fence lines, what the actual ch problems with allowing weeds uh, to grow in those areas are? Well, so I, I mean, I use the place to play example, and where we have where we have berries growing up along the sides, the neighbors are not happy having berries growing up on the sides. It's growing from our property, and they've asked us to mitigate and control those. So, so you're hearing again that there is an aesthetic expectation in some of these locations, and again, we're looking for the measures. Mm -hmm. what, is aesthetics the qualifying right. criteria, and that's or is I'm, it or is it health and safety to, issues? To be clear here, this is not a criticism. This is curiosity, so yeah. that after we hear from the public. I can make comments that are holistic in nature. That's, that's why I wanted to say, to your point, this is exactly where we're going to struggle is, 
on a fence line, is it is it an aesthetic issue that we're responding to, or is it a health and safety? That gives us guideposts. Right. Are we so getting to like somebody getting caught in it, or are we looking at Pleasantville? Well, yeah. Right now, you're hearing or fire staff. Safety. You're you're hearing staff respond totally to an aesthetic conversation. That's what right? I'm okay. And we're looking for criteria. What is the most important part of this so we can bring back a program for you to to propose? with these types of additions so, or subtractions. So let me be clear, is it a safety problem or is it an aesthetic issue? And so something like that actually could be, a, it could be either an aesthetic issue or what they're considering as a public nuisance. So whether it's berries or whether it's poison oak or other items that are growing within our parks and- So, so let, me, let me, we could set a criteria the community of, of interest may be setting a criteria. We're, look, we're interested in what you want to do. I think it depends on the situation, and we need the avail evaluative. I think right now, the aesthetic is driving the conversation. We might have some internal conversations about safety, whether it does rise to a level of safety, because berries are frankly different than poison oak. Height is going to be a different conversation than non-height. If we can get some clarity from, from you, council member, then we can start to ha build that program and address it. So I, th I, I think the reason we're not answering is because it's going to be dependent on the situation, the location of the fence. It is not all fences are created equal, not all, all weeds are created equal, but if we can get a clarity today to say, you want us to prioritize health and safety over aesthetics, that starts to get driving to that question of what we can do in a 70% control and how we communicate, how we're gonna to respond to a particular right. and, and I'm not trying to jam you guys up, and no. I know it's been a lot of things are going on now, but it's difficult to give direction when I wasn't party to the conversations last August, and it sounds like there was a spirit from the council, but not clear direction um, all the way around. So that's where my questions are coming from. I will cede the floor and come back with direction at the end. Ms. Gomes. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to emphasize that I'm very interested in hearing from the public uh, and that uh, comments made here, questions here, uh, I would love to hear from the public if they also have information to, to provide on these questions. Um, that said, thank you for bringing this forward to us. I was aware that we were not as clear as we needed to be in the last conversation around the contract, and I'm delighted that we are able to be more clear now. Um, I'm, I'm interested in knowing sort of what the safest option standard is. Um, just saying synthetic and organic doesn't really get to what's safest. Um, so I, I'm not happy that the EPA and the state ag both continue to allow glyphosates, and I'm going to call them neonics. Um, it's easier. Uh, so that makes me want to look to a different entity for a safety standard, because they're clearly allowing something that our public won't, won't stand for. I mean, we, Sonoma County doesn't like glyphosates and neonics. So, following those standards doesn't seem appropriate to me. OMRI seems to only be organic. Is there available another way of evaluating the safety of these items or another standard that we could be applying so that we can make a determination what's the safest based upon that standard? So there are some other uh, Entities, um, for example, the Russian River Friendly Guidelines is one that uh, we've utilized as far as Santa Rosa Water um, as a, a way of um, fact-checking or uh, managing our own pro proposed IPM. Mm -hmm. um, so that is another uh, guideline that's out there. It's not a requirement or criteria or a threshold. Um, we do have certain thresholds that we're responsible for, whether it's water runoff compliance, uh, whether it's chemical com composition of, of our creeks and waterways. Uh, so those are end products that we need to try to meet. How we get there is the question that you're asking, and I think um, I don't know if there is a specific regulatory agency like OMRI for synthetic products. Um, there are proposed or there are guidelines and 
Um, there is a risk warning on each of those products, um, and the risk warning uh, may dictate the level of personal protective equipment. It may dictate the amount of uh, time it takes for that product to dissipate. Where does the risk warning come from? I'll, let me. I, and I want to say first that I appreciate that staff provided me with some of that information during the private conversations that I had with staff who couldn't be here today because of our other emergencies. Uh, give me a moment and I'll see if okay. I can get an answer for that. The, the, I have a follow-up question on that, which I apologize for not having provided in advance, that involves the time frame of the research. For example, you know, an initial exposure versus what happens to long-term exposure versus you have an exposure, but you have a much delayed consequence. So if you can let me know what, because I'm looking at, it doesn't make sense to me to just say organic yes, yes or no, or synthetic yes or no. It makes sense to me to do a comparison of what's safest. If you just give me one minute, let me Thank confer. You. All right, the good news is when you've got your certified applicators in the room, they can they have some answers. Thank so, you for having answers for <laughs> us today. And, and if I stray, Tim will step up and go into more detail. Um, so the warning labels on each of the products are identified by the, by the EPA, um, and the manufacturers provide the level of toxicity within or the level of components within the product, and then it's regulated there. Um, and it's toxicity to humans? It's it's not going to be just toxicity to humans, but it's going to take into consideration both the product's interaction with what you're trying to eradicate, uh, as well as the impact to the applicator itself. Here, I want you to. Thank you, sir. Would you say your name again and get closer to that mic? Well, my, my name is Tim Finnegan. I'm the crew supervisor of the Parks Department. Thank you, Tim. So um, none of the tests are done on humans. It's done on uh, rodents, animals. And given the, the health of that animal, the weight, and so forth, then they try to um, put it into terms as far as that toxicity. Toxic uh, they're making a guess from animal toxicity to what the human toxicity is but the measure is for human toxicity. No, because they okay. don't try it on humans. They no, try it on I understand animals. they're not yeah. doing human testing. Right. What I'm asking is when it says this is safer than that, they mean this is safer than that for humans. From the test results that they have done. From test results from on animals. On animals, okay. correct. Yeah, when you put together an MSDS for a right. for a product uh, at herbicide, it's going to be for human interaction. Right. And, and so that's set up and... So we don't know, we may, we may have something that's safer than, than something else for humans as the, well as the test can tell us, but we don't know, for example, if it's safer for bees or not. Well, there are some studies, for example, on the neonicotinoids. We know that that has a stronger impact on bees than some of the other pesticides right. that might be out there. So there have been studies for certain animals and certain for certain products. I don't um, think we're questioning at all, just to be clear, I'm not questioning at all the ban on glyphosates or neonics. But my question is, how do I decide whether a particular synthetic is safer than a particular organic. And, and in some of the uh, material safety statements, what's that called? M it's four letters. The MSDS. In, in some of the MSDSs, it looks like some of the synthetics are safer than some of the organics. And I'm trying to evaluate that result. Uh, I don't want to say all synthetics are okay, I want to say only use synthetics when they are safer than the alternative organic. And I'm trying to understand what safer means. So, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put out uh, a quick 
a quick response and then we may have to bring some more details back um, as we come in the future. Um, there are some differences between not only just in the synthetic world, but also in the organic world and then between the two. As we mentioned early on, organics tend to be burn oriented style um, chemicals and synthetics um, are not. They, they have a different chemical process that they utilize whatever the application or the, the end product that you're trying to eliminate uh, and, and they're, you know, whether there's more nitrogen or, or, or other chemicals in that and that'll, the chemical balance will change. What we know is that some of those organics are more hazardous to humans, especially from the applicator standpoint. They have to be more cognizant of the personal protective equipment because it will result in burns to their body, whereas some of the synthetics don't require as significant of personal protective equipment to do the applications. And through the certification process, our professional applicators understand by reading the labels what level of protection they need to take and in turn, they do their best to, to utilize the material descriptions as to how to protect the public and other uh, animals from interacting with that product. Thank you. I would be interested in hearing back how we make a statement like, use the safest option. And I'd like to understand the time frame of the safety and the extent, uh, how, we do, how we make that judgment. Um, because I, I'm hesitant to say absolutely no X when Y might not be better, but Y might be better if you have a professional applicator who knows what they're doing in the long run. Um, I'm gonna move on, but I, I'm looking forward to hearing comments on that. Um, I'm not hearing alternate planning, planting as a strategy for shouldering out weeds. You sort of mentioned the turf. I've seen roses used, I've seen ivy used, I've seen other ground cover choices. Um, at what point do we investigate what other ground cover choices we should be making instead of the ground cover or non-ground cover we're using? And so that may be one of the strategies that we, that we come back and discuss is the potential to do ground cover. Now, there is an investment that then needs to happen yes. in order to make that, and then there is a management protocol for each of those products as well. And so, so it's, there is no, there is no easy option. I, trust me, if it's come to <laughs> us, we know it isn't easy. <laughs> so I, I understand that, but I am feeling that it is missing in the presentation and would very much like more detail on alternate ground cover methods to use to come back to us. Happy to. Um, particularly in medians and places where we're thinking of using things that are less pleasant to our community. Um, I'm also interested in having more details on what we would need if we wanted to increase mechanical means. So I know that we recently removed some groundskeeper positions from our budget. Uh, over my personal objections because I think groundkeepers give us lots of benefits including eyes on the parks, but one of the benefits would be mechanical means as well. So I see a, a bone, a double payoff for having more people in the park pulling weeds. So with the concern that the current contract's expiring at the end of this week, we have done some evaluation on what it would take for our staff to pick up at least the minimum level of effort necessary um, to maintain a safe world, uh, to maintain a safe uh, uh, park space or roadway space. And so we do have that, uh, that data that we'd be happy to share. Um, with you if you so desire. I would like to see it, thank you. Bef before I would make a statement about level, I would want a matrix of locations so that I could say 70% might be needed at the ballpark, but I might be happy with 0% at some other location. So um, in asking a question back to you in this regard, it's uh, with over a thousand acres of property that we have to manage, um, generic matrix, meaning... General categorizing. General categories, very good. If you feel that there is a specific location that needs to be pulled out separately, I would be willing to, to entertain that. But I think we can't just say, 
we want 70% or we want 25% without having at least some generic idea that we're talking about different locations. So I'm gonna urge council to think of that as a long-term goal because we have short-term goals and we'd be happy to entertain that, but I'm not sure how we're gonna get organized to do address the thousand spaces. We need to start down this pathway because it's absent of that. Happy, yeah. happy to get into that conversation, but that's a whole, that's what this team is starting to do about right. re-looking at these processes, but it, we won't have that delivered in the next quarter. I just want to be I realistic. Hear you. But we already are talking about ball fields, places where children and dogs are, medians and back ons. You know, we already have this conversation going, but we don't have it written in one place so that we can clearly say yes, 70, 50, 25. And we're gonna, we're gonna strive okay. to get there in general categories, but, but it is gonna st still need some general statements so we can start and then refine from there. We're not gonna be able to get to specific to each park. We're gonna need some commitment to the category level. Okay. And that's what staff will bring back. Um, is it possible for us, I noticed that Healdsburg uses TOT. Is it possible for us, based upon the agreements that we have, for us to use TOT monies for, for this, particularly if we need to expand mechanical means? Is that something we are able to do or are we locked in? We can analyze that, but right now, again, with- That's a question I would yep, ask. Yep. Um, can we look at page nine? And uh, this is probably more comment. Many, we used the word pristine when we showed this, at least at one point someone used the word pristine. And I think that we have a culture change coming where we have to see that and see toxic instead of seeing pristine. And I think one of the things that we're going to need to do is to educate the public that that isn't beautiful, that's toxic. And I'm wondering if we are also including some kind of public education program for that conversation. So this is how we establish this public education program is setting the guidelines. As I said, that is artificial. That includes, that's why I think, that's why it includes synthetic. And so you're hearing that conversation. That's where staff is struggling. That is some of the community's expectation is pristine and you're hearing that creep into our vocabulary. If you want to change that, this is, this is where we start to, to drive to that change of what's acceptable, what's our percentage that we're trying to achieve instead of pristine. Thank you. I have some comments, but I will reserve them for after the public has made theirs. Mr. Oliveris, do you have questions? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Jason, you, during your presentation, you shared with us some examples ranging from 100% down to 0%. Uh, and so wh wherever we land, uh, I'm, I, will that be a, a goal or a standard? Meaning we, and, and referring to page nine, slide nine, for example, beautiful park. So uh, because if we chose 75%, does it mean we're gonna let that go to 75%? We're, we're trying to maintain what we have, right? Uh, but at the same time, trying to build everything else that's below over time up to that minimum standard that we're trying to find. So the minimum doesn't mean that everything's going to be looking like that. That's just the minimum. We're trying not to let things go below that. That's correct. Right. Okay. It, that would that, be our performance metric is to try to maintain each of the locations designated to that performance metric that council describes for me as the target. Right. And, and, and again, having the, having that threshold, if you will, there will be some variations because I, I, I get it with ballparks. It's, it's a place where you, there's, there's, a, there's a game going on there. There's certain expectations about an appropriate field, soccer, all these things are important. Uh, the other question is, what is the correlation between uh, weeds and trash? Because <laughs> uh, again, from my perspective in an urban area where I see a lot of tall weeds, et cetera, that's where I see the trash, right? So, and, and that goes to the fence line, the sidewalks and all this, where we have this height we build up. Is that a tendency that we see is that's where the trash buildup occurs? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have, I, I've, I've got no study that describes for me a direct correlation between them. I certainly feel like I understand the statement that you're making is the less kempt the location is, the more likely it is for other uh, products 
to show up in that space. Um, but I, I couldn't say with any uh, study or um, empirical evaluation that that there's a, a dir actual direct correlation. Yeah, and, and I know we see. I know Dean probably sees it on his regular rounds as far as those correlations. And, and in some places where we have a, an excess amount of high weeds, it's not just the trash, then it's the couch and everything else that starts to accumulate in certain areas. Uh, but, but again, I, I think there is a correlation there because from my experience walking, that that's where I find the trash is hidden in the weeds. And my point is that it makes it more difficult to pick up the trash when it's embedded in weeds and uh, buries everything else. So uh, I have other comments, but I'll wait till the comment period. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> and I'd also be curious to see if uh, areas that have fewer weeds don't catch as much trash before it gets into the waterways. So it might, who, who knows? Yeah, there, there's uh, an implied in the, the conversation, or in, at least in the way that the presentation has been laid out so far, uh, that the $550,000 is the amount that we're going to go with. Obviously, we haven't set our budget going forward. Uh, one, what does the process look like going forward in getting a new contract? Is that a full RFP, or is it uh, a reauthorization for the 12th time? And two, Will there be a room in the next budget conversation for us to talk about compensation level? So I, I can assure you that the 550 is not the target moving forward. It is well below any expected target, regardless of the level of performance that we're that we're going to be moving towards. Um, the feedback from the current contractor is an absolutely unsustainable um, funding level for the level of service that is implied in the contract. Uh, and um, so uh, they, are, they were happy to uh, see the contract come to an end and rebid with a new contract. Um, the uh, Landscaping program has already been released for, for a proposal. We've received uh, three different proposals. Um, we'll be describing that in more detail on the first. Um, within the proposals, there are a series of options that exist within there, and the question that the reason we're here is just try to understand what type of options we ultimately come and present to council. Uh, and so, um, we're at that point in the game where we've got contractors that have already given us their pricing lists. We've asked them to develop performance metrics and how they're going to describe and self-manage the products that they uh, claim that they can obtain. Um, and then uh, we will make a final selection and make recommendations. And there may be more than one recommendation that comes to council. There may be an alternate A and an alternate B, depending upon the specifics of the feedback we see today. Um, but that will be the, the discussion that we're going to have on October the 1st. Um, I would hate to delay that. Um, however, given some of the council questions and if additional questions come up, we may have to push that date off. Um, our intent, if nothing else, would be to have a baseline contract that would get the uh, turf managed because we do have uh, clubs and other activities out there that rent the fields for specific athletic purposes and without the ability to manage and maintain those, we're violating our agreement with, with those customers. Um, so that is an area that, that you will likely hear from us as uh, on the first as we really believe we need to do at minimum this and we can come back with further discussion for others. So, uh, so that's, this, that's kind of the process that we have right now and, and why we're looking at trying to understand what that specific performance metric is that council's comfortable with. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. I look at this the same way as uh, say public safety or other vital city services, which is uh, we can put as many resources as we want into it to try to have the best that we can for our city. But we generally talk about what is an acceptable standard and how are we going to meet that standard. And that may or may not include at the end of this a conversation about it accept it's acceptable to us to use synthetics in the medians versus not acceptable to us in the parks. And I'd like to be able to have that room to have that conversation within the RFP. Can you give us a ballpark of uh, how much more we are looking at on the next uh, contract 
with if we go mostly mechanical versus if we allow some use of synthetics? So the feedback that we're receiving is, um, for example, an organics only program, 50% um, weed control is about the best that we're gonna be able to achieve with that at a cost of about $2.2 million or $2.3 million. So about a 400% uh, increase from our current contract amount. Um, uh, synthetic, use product is slightly less, although not substantially less, which was a little surprising to us. Um, but nonetheless, uh, because of the cost and the cost and service level um, challenges that we have under our current contract, everything just looked really big uh, as we were starting to hear back from other agencies and, and um, prospective bidders. So, um, we're looking at somewhere between about $1.8 million and $2.2, $2.3 million, with the lower number being a synthetic only, the higher number being a, a an organics only, and any type of combination would somewhere fit between. Okay, and that goes back to also that Measure M conversation uh, as well, if we know that the, even just maintaining what we have, it's gonna be this additional cost one, one way or the other. Uh, I wanna make sure we keep a pin on that. Um, but just remember that that from an organic standpoint, it was at 50% weeds. Um, the synthetic was closer to 70% weeds. Any combination, you're going to start start at the 50% and incrementally work your way up, depending upon the acreage that you use synthetics with. 70% control, nah, not 70% 70 70 weed. 70% uh, weed control. Yes, uh, sorry, we, I've talked about it both ways, so I get yes. Have we also evaluated for certain other high risk areas like the medians, uh, potential liability to the city or worker impact as it is a more difficult situation for our employees to be working in? From an employee standpoint, uh, we, we mention it as an area of concern. However, you know, we, we have professional staff that do this on a daily basis, and so our practices and procedures are already in place to be able to manage that. Uh, certainly, the more time you put an employee out on the street, whether it's a city employee or a contract employee, the level of risk increases um, because you're having them adjacent to live traffic for longer periods of time. Uh, so shorter periods are always better. In that regard, that's from an employee risk standpoint, not necessarily from an IPM or a, um, a community risk standpoint. Okay, and then just as a suggestion, uh, and I haven't read it myself, but I do hear that Marin County's IPM is pretty good as well. So you might take a look at that. Happy to, thank you. Thanks Jason. The only question I have, I'm still a little confused about the budget process. So when did we learn of this or how did you, um, proposed the budget that we adopted in June for the entire fiscal year. We had not opened bids at that point, and so we kept status quo and assumed that we would be making some level of adjustment to the budget as we moved forward. Um, it's, we believe that the budget implication is a little larger than we had originally anticipated. So, so we, um, we should have had this conversation with council a, a while ago. That's all I can I can say, uh, Mr. Mayor, is that this, this conversation should have happened this past spring around the conversation we're having today about expectation levels. Thus, without expectation levels, we ran into a, an assumption about performance metrics. When we started to get into the performance metric conversation, that radically started to alter um, what was coming back in the contract process. So, so again, um, all I can say is this should have been a conversation that took place earlier this spring. So then I would anticipate during mid-year budget adjustments that we annually have that this, whatever we come up with after you hear feedback from the council will be included in that mid-year budget adjustment? Um, there and in the formal budget adjustment, you know, again, we're gonna have to look at this, we, but we have to understand what the expectation yeah. is to, to, to make these kinds of decisions about where and how we bring back the appropriate budget level. Okay, thank you. Um, sure. I wanted to ask a follow-up question from one of my colleagues' questions. With regard to our employees or contract employees, have we engaged or dis, uh, with our risk management department with regard to any of these conversations? 
Andy, is that an appropriate? It seems to me we go to risk management for a number of uh, employee wellness program, for example, I think came out of risk management. I'm just wondering if they're engaged in this. We, we always engage risk management in these conversations. Thank you. Okay, we, we have one card on this item, Megan Kahn. Mayor Schwendelman, members of council, uh, thank you so much for having this discussion today and thank you for staff, to staff and especially Jason Nutt for stepping in. Um, I know it's a really complicated subject. Uh, I have been working on this topic for the last four years um, and so I am always happy to provide my uh, scientific expert opinions on uh, matters if anyone has any questions. Um, just to answer a few questions uh, that came from council, um, there are differences between chronic and acute effects of pesticides. So if you only look at acute effects, um, you know, if you get an organic pesticide on your hand versus a synthetic one, maybe the organic one, it burns, so you may see an immediate effect. However, that pesticide will not give you a long-term chronic illness like cancer or reproductive effects or endocrine disruption. So when staff is talking about which product is safer, they're really only looking at acute effects and not the long-term chronic safety of the product. So please keep that in mind when you look through the staff report. Um, as far as the question on whether there's an entity that looks at both organic and synthetic pesticides and determines which is safer, there really is not. Um, and that's because the synthetic pesticides are the only ones that are associated with all of the long-term chronic health issues. Um, the organic pesticides are not. Um, the synthetic pesticides are also, the products themselves are 95 to 98% trade secret ingredients, and those are not regulated at all. And there's lots of speculation that the ingredients in there are more toxic than the active ingredients themselves. So when you're using a synthetic product, you, you really really need to be careful. There's just a lot of unknowns. Um, when you're looking at the safety studies, often the safest quote unquote products are the ones that are the newest. And that's because we only have industry studies to look at. We don't have the peer reviewed independent studies. That's why we know that glyphosate is not safe because we've had decades and decades of research that shows us that it's not. Um, but for some of the newer products like Lifeline, we only can rely on the, uh, the industry studies, which often just say that they're, they're completely safe. Um, the materials do not dissipate. The synthetic pesticides do not dissipate in 24 hours. Um, if you look at the back of most of the product labels, that it will say several days to months. Um, and if you look at some of the independent studies, it often can be a year or more. Uh, we're finding glyphosate and all sorts of things like wine and consumer products. So it's very obvious that the stuff is not breaking down quickly. Um, again, the organic products, uh, they're mostly vinegar or essential oils based. And so they do become um, safe for people to interact with very quickly. Uh, when I'm looking through the staff report, I see that all of the problem areas that were discussed are all wood chipped areas. They're not lawn or turf areas. Um, and we need to remember that a lot of these areas were planted in wood chips because we were trying to save water. Um, and so I think we don't really have a weed problem. The problem is really that the landscaped areas in Santa Rosa weren't designed properly and realistically given nature. Uh, nature always fills in a blank space. And so that's what's happening in Santa Rosa right now. Um, I have more comments to make, but I will send you all an email later. Thank you again. Thank you. All right, Jason, can you reframe the question? Because I heard you want feedback about metrics from council. What other specific thing before I ask each of our council members to give you the feedback you're looking for? Yes, yeah, so I think the key component uh, that I'm hoping to see back is what, what do we want our landscape, our parks, uh, our roadside areas to look like? What is that? that metric that we're trying to shoot for. Um, I gave you some ideas about the percentage of weed control. Granted, weed control is a, is a single component of landscape management. Um, I dare say it's probably one of the most visible um, for some individuals. Uh, again, it's, and, and to some extent, that's a matter of taste of a particular individual. But at some point, we as an organization have to establish a commonality among all of our products uh, or all of our, our um, uh, properties. And so that's what I'm looking for is feedback from you as far as what we believe the appropriate level of, of landscape management is. Um, and if you have a, a strong opinion one way or the other for the use of uh, synthetic level products versus organic products, those would be the two primary questions that I have at this point in time. 
All right, thank you. And so again, the feedback you received today will come back to the council in the form of probably this RFP or the, the contract for park maintenance. We will take this information and formulate, uh, we'll, we'll finalize the council item for October the 1st, uh, and it will have uh, either a single recommended alternative, depending on how clear uh, the council is, or a couple of alternatives that give you different options uh, depending upon uh, the feedback that we receive. Great, thanks. Okay, let's start now on this end. Mr. Olivares, would you like to give your feedback? Thank you, Mayor. It's, it's difficult to give uh, a number right now as far as a threshold without knowing everything as far as the conditions of all our parks, right? But I know we want to get there, so I, I would look forward to a recommendation of where we want to be um, so we can work from there. Uh, you, know, we, we, you gave us some various um, suggestions. I don't believe that anything less than 70% would be acceptable. Uh, but if we're, gonna, if we're gonna say that, well, why not 75, right? So I think looking at some kind of recommendation based on our capacity and what would it take to get to certain levels as far as resources, right? I think that would be important for us to consider. Um, the other thing I would look uh, forward to is to share with us a little bit more related to trends beyond what you shared with us already with a couple of the communities that are kind of in the area. What's, 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 what's happening within the industry? What, what are, where are we moving towards as an industry? Uh, again, we're not going to get Disneyland, okay, and that should be our gold standard for this. Uh, but I also think that we need to look at this beyond just the typical weed control. It also, there's so many other factors, for example, who we are as a destination uh, and what we want to represent to people coming to visit and spend money here in Santa Rosa, which will in turn provide more resources to do what we want to do. So it's not just about the weed, there's so many other pieces of it, you know, being a destination for outdoor sports, for example, that happens by having nice fields to play on that are, uh, you know, legit as far as the rules go. Um, the other thing is, um, um, public notification about this coming our way. I think the public needs to weigh in on this about their their neighborhood parks, community parks, whatever it may be, is they need to know that this is happening. Uh, and then the other thing as we've come to some final decisions down the road is to provide, uh, I, I would ask that we provide appropriate signage at the parks as far as what kinds of things are being used to control weeds in this park and what is, a, what is our goal as a community to maintain our parks. I think it'll hopefully it'll help educate the community on a regular basis to say, you know, this is your park, this is what we're trying to do, we're trying to maintain it, and for your information, this is what we use as far as weed control, the types of methods that we use. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Combs? Thank you. So for me, long-term safety comes first. Um, I don't feel that I can answer with regard to a percent because we don't have, I would prefer to be specific about properties. Um, I, I don't feel the need to have anything greater than 70% anywhere but it may be that there are some properties that will need that kind of attention. Um, if we need that kind of attention, I would want to seek out what our alternatives are. Um, but I can imagine sites where if we frequently mow, that'd be enough. So that would be a 0% site with lots of mowing. Um, so for me, again, safety first. Um, I want to explore, us to explore the option of using TOT so that we can do more mechanical means and more appropriate ground cover using those resources. Um, in general, I would like to see us look at more alternative plantings, ground cover, and mechanical processes. Uh, we clearly, I agree with my colleagues, need public outreach and engagement. Um, I'm familiar with Bennett Valley Vision, which does a really good job of helping us out on back-ons along certain parts and roadways. I think uh, garden clubs and other neighborhood groups can be used more effectively than we're using them if we can provide explanations of why and outreach. Um, and I also think we need to outreach to the public with regard to understanding why we're doing what we're doing and why that slide isn't what we're have as a goal, at least not, not me. Um, I'm gonna tell a brief family story. Um, this is a story when, that balances the discussion about acute effects versus uh, long-term effects. Um, my grandfather had an apple orchard and raised bees. They go together. 
And I can remember conversations about whether it was a five spray year or a seven spray year on the apples. Um, we did everything with the apples. We so, had apples, we made applesauce, we made apple cider with the stuff you wouldn't want to know about. Um, and uh, as a family, uh, we're exposed regularly to whatever the spray was that my grandfather chose. My grandfather, my uncle, and my mother were all very active in the orchards. All three of them, in late life, had Parkinson's. We initially looked to see if there was something genetic and kept being told, no, no, it's something else, and traced it back to repeated exposure to the sprays that were being used in the orchard. There is no conversation in my family about acute effects. Nobody said, oh, we sprayed and it made our hands raw. Those stories did not come down. But the Parkinson's ultimately killed my grandfather, my uncle, and my mother. So I have a lot of concern about the chronic effects of synthetics and will have a very difficult time being persuaded that it is safe to use any synthetic anywhere based on what happened in my own family with regard to chronic exposure. Um, and and I'm, I want to be clear that I am concerned about the safety of our employees. But I think with appropriate measures, they cannot burn their hands, but it's very hard to avoid cancers and Parkinson's. So thank you. Ms. Fleming. Thank you. I do appreciate that you're coming to us looking for guidelines and, um, and the presentation was great and I know that there's other extenuating circumstances that has kept Ms. Santos and that you guys did a, a, a really great job in, in lieu of her presence. A couple of issues come up for me with this and none of them are intended to be a obstructionist, but the one is that having this hearing at 10.30 in the morning is not a great opportunity to get a robust public engagement in one of our most publicly utilized services outside of water consumption in the city of Santa Rosa and road use. I don't know what what is a more public good than our, our parks and our public spaces. So um, that we only had one public comment card is concerning to me and, and has me um, challenged to give direction. The other thing is that, uh, you know, we do, and I've heard my colleagues say this, we do have a potential culture shift on, and we have to balance that. You know, we're not Pleasantville, we're not Disneyland, but we do want to make sure that our spaces are usable and that they don't impede uh, the use of them and the attraction to for both our residents and for our visitors. That having been said, I haven't seen any data that would allow me to give you really clear direction. And I'm, I'm really sorry. What I can say is that we should have robust public engagement. We should have clear explanation to the public of what we do. We should not belabor the decision too much. We should have, you know, it broken down by, let's say, medians and roadways, public use parks, you know, a few different categories. It doesn't have to mean that every of our thousand different parcels fits into one of them, but if you can bring me three to five various categories, that would be extremely helpful. The other thing is that I cannot direct you to use synthetics without good research. I don't believe that people were using glyphosates or neonicotinoids thinking that they were going to make people or animals or ecosystems collapse. So that having been said, I'm going to stick with the original council direction in August to go to all organic. I'm fine with less than 100 percent. I'm fine with a much lower percent of um, weed abatement, um, whether it's 50 or 70 percent, as long as it's not disproportionately um, unabated in lower income areas and doesn't give our children who most need access to these parks, um, you know, a, a less enjoyable or safe experience. And finally, safety for both our employees, our contractors is really important, but also broader safety issues will, um, in terms of not just the safety of the products, but the safety of the use and any potential fire risks, which was not touched on, of having unabated weeds, which is something that I'd like to hear about in the future. So again, apologies for not being very clear with you on the exact number, but let's say for me, 
it's whatever we need to do to get more information and not use synthetics. I'm okay with weeds while we figure this out. I'm not okay with poisoning our environment while we figure it out. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Tibbetts. 70% uh, weed control is okay. No synthetics, use only organics. And um, we are gonna hear about it from the public. I hear about this from a lot, the aesthetics, it's a big issue. Uh, I, I expect that to ramp up and we as a council should expect to hear more about that. Uh, I would just encourage you looking forward with the additional supplemental measure M funds that we're gonna have to strongly consider more mechanical use of uh, weed abatement through seasonal employment opportunities and hopefully for people experiencing homelessness. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Mr. Vice Mayor. So Jason, just a quick, as a point of clarification, when you said 50% is the best we could get with the organics, do you mean in, in totality or do you mean at the current funding level or the current anticipated funding level? Based on the conversations that we've had with other agencies and with um, service providers or contractors, what we've learned is that 50% is one of the best possible outcomes for the use of only organics. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't achieve higher as we found with the contractor that's working with water, they're using all mechanical means. What it does mean is the increased personal labor costs is gonna go up. So, so the, the price is gonna increase substantially, um, potentially as much as you know, 20 or 30%, so um, by, by trying to use more labor. So those are just things that, that uh, we've heard, is that 50% is is, seems to be the target when you talk organics, but if, you need, if we need higher, it'll increase the amount of, of labor that has to go in. All right, thank you. Yeah, for me, there's uh, sort of a, an interesting juxtaposition here where I think everybody at the dais wants to make sure that our parks and our public spaces are usable. And for some folks, that means aesthetically, we need to maintain probably about the 70% or better. And for others, it means that we need to make sure that we are uh, not using synthetic herbicides and not putting their children at risk. So it is an interesting conversation. I'd be interested in seeing, come back uh, to the council, a conversation that, to show us what you think it would take for us to do a 70% uh, or better in our neighborhood and community parks in particular uh, using uh, the organics and also what you think it would cost using synthetics. Uh, I think, was it about 3.1 million for Measure M funds? Uh, we receive about 1.9 million annually from Measure M. Okay. Yep, and so uh, I think that that'll also be wrapped up into that conversation as well. That we had this uh, initial conversation where we said it might be that those funds are best utilized improving the conditions at our current parks and not necessarily building new ones. Uh, and I think that that's gonna be a, a very real conversation if we're talking about how we meet the 70% weed control uh, while also still using the organic herbicides. Um, I am, uh, along with Council Member Combs, I am interested in breaking this up into different areas. I think that the conversation about how we treat our parks is gonna be much different than how we treat our medians, uh, which are a higher risk for our employees as well. So I'm uh, interested in the 70% in those buckets, but then also let's break it out and have specific categories for us to discuss parks, schools, medians, uh, those sorts of things. Mr. Mayor, before you go, can I, I left something off when I was talking about trends, just very quickly. When I was talking about trends, uh, the other piece was the research, but more in the research as it, it applies to um, weed control itself, where, where it's going, uh, things that are being tested out there. What, cause this will not be the last time we have a conversation like this. So I assume research continues in developing new ways and means of controlling uh, weeds. And it may, may not be chemical, organic, or otherwise, but Maybe if you, whatever you have, share that with us. So we have a better understanding of where where is the industry moving in some of these areas. We'll we'll look into that and bring that back. So thank you again for this, Jason. So um, what I'm interested, in, actually, the, the ninety percent level. It, it, it sounds hard for me. Yeah, we want to be seventy percent. To me, um, we can strive for better. As I mentioned with the Measure M conversations, I would love for us to be known. The city of Santa Rosa is known for the quality of our parks, and I agree with some of my colleagues. Maybe the medians are a different item to discuss, 
uh, but for our parks, I really want us to be known for that. And so if that's 90%, and again, I'm not interested at all in any synthetic materials, so how would we achieve 90%? And I would need to see what would that cost be versus if we decide the 70% metric, what would that cost be? Because it's rather difficult now to say, okay, if that's the, the goal that we're all striving for, we want to be known for the best parks in Northern California. If that's at 90% level, there is a cost there. And again, I, as I mentioned with the Measure M discussions, believe that's where we should be using the majority of those funds to make sure the quality of our parks is that raises that level. But again, it, what I'm hearing you say, 1.9 million, especially if we want to rebuild the parks damaged by the fire, there's probably not enough at least this year, but that would be, I think, that goal I want to get. I'm not comfortable with a 50% level, or quite frankly, even a 70%. I think we can do better than that. So with that, Thank did you. you get the information or do you need any clarification I, on what you I, heard? I believe I have enough information to be able to formulate uh, our discussion on the first. Great, thank you very thank much. You. Okay, we're gonna adjourn, adjourn, adjourn this meeting and we'll take a brief 10 minute recess as we transition to our regular council meeting.
Are we there? We're there. We'll call the regular uh, city council meeting on September 24th to order. Madam City Clerk, we get a roll call, please. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of council member Tibbetts. Okay, we'll move on to item uh, 3.1. Mr. McGowan. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, item 3.1 is a study session review of proposed building and fire code adoption and presenting is Jesse Oswald, our chief building official and Ian Hartage, our assistant fire marshal. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity. Jesse Oswald, chief building official. So this is our second study session in front of the council and it is not a repeat, but an update on the process that we've uh, undertaken for, in general, our building and fire code um, adoptions coming up for uh, January of 2020. Um, the primary uh, function for today is to provide that update and fire will have uh, probably one or two specific uh, requests for direction on some of their, their code updates. So again, this may look familiar. Um, the background on the, the codes uh, in 2019, early this year, uh, the codes were adopted in California and then in July, they were actually published for California. And those codes are what we are focusing on for the local jurisdiction to make amendments to, uh, to adopt for our, that they account for our local conditions. So that's, that's the focus of our work today. So again, this is a familiar slide. Uh, throughout the year, uh, my colleagues and I have engaged with the Sonoma County Fire Protection uh, Prevention Officers and another organization, it's called um, the uh, Code Officials uh, Group. And we've had several meetings discussing codes to try and create uh, uniformity throughout the region as much as possible per each jurisdiction. Uh, much of the, the code language that is in base code uh, used to exist in numerous uh, amendments that local uh, agencies adopted. So the codes are uh, continually catching up with uh, what local agencies uh, wish to adopt. Again, the collaborative effort uh, started with th those groups that I mentioned and uh, some of the early conversations we had uh, surrounded the CW CWWP program that is gonna be coming forth with the fire districts. So now we have more information that fire is gonna discuss on some of the efforts we can use locally in our wildland urban interface areas. And Ian's gonna take over from here. Thank you, members of the council. I'm Ian Hardy, Assistant Fire Marshal, Santa Rosa Fire. Um, <clears throat> so we, we glossed over some of the goals that we were looking to achieve with our adoption um, this coming cycle based on experiences, code updates, um, local um, conditions. So one of the items that we're improving on is two points of access for future developments. Um, we used to have a threshold of 50 dwelling units required two points. We've since lowered that to 30 so that we get multiple points of access. This is in line with the state fire marshal is recommending for developments. Um, limiting specific flammable and hazardous vegetation. This is part in part a proposal that we have in the code adoption, but will be finalized through the CWPP and the hazard mitigation plan that comes out of that process um, with a, a separate vegetation management ordinance. Um, so the part that's going into the code adoption with the building standards is this vegetation restrictions within three to five feet of structures. We're you know, working with the North Bay FPOs, Marin County, who's been uh, kind of spearheading the development of this language. Uh, we're referring to it as an ignition free zone. For buildings that are sprinklered, this zone is three feet surrounding the building. For buildings that are not sprinklered, that's a five foot ignition free zone around. Um, we'll skip over the 7A because I'll finish on that. Uh, limitations on types of construction materials in the WUI. So in the WUI, some of the things that we experienced in our firestones was uh, cast off of building materials uh, due to the high winds and the convection um, uh, uplifts. And so what we're trying to do here is limit the number, uh, the 
amount of material that can be cast off of buildings, and that is by prohibiting wood shake and shingle roofs and sidings within the WUI area. Um, so the multi-prong approach to this protection, community-wide protection, is to also require minimum Class A roofings outside of the WUI area. So that if our reduced number of cast off materials does get cast off, we have a level protection higher than what we would normally have outside the WUI area with the Class A roof. Um, I wanna go, go back to that. Just wanna finish up there on the 7A upgrade because this is where our question will come to you for your input back to us. And so uh, previously, 7A only applied to new buildings being constructed. 7A is the construction requirements for buildings within the WUI area. Um, reaching out to my FPO friends far and wide in the state, we have a large number of agencies that are already doing what we're proposing to do here, which is any additions or alterations in the WUI area would be made be, to be compliant with 7A. So you add a 200 square foot addition to your house, that 200 square foot addition would be compliant with 7A, with siding, windows, and such, so that that portion of the house is protected. It's really only one way to capture our built environment into this home hardened, you know, construction, and that is one bite at a time. And so as people pull permits and do alterations to their homes in the WUI area, they would be required to comply with Chapter 7A requirements. We're, we're, we're there, that's the language we have already, you know, have developed in the ordinance and ready to present to you uh, come October 22nd. The direction we're looking at is, do you feel that's enough? If you don't, we have a second level of proposal for your consideration, which goes in line with a practice we already have and we see throughout the code in various areas. One of which is, for example, within the WUI area, if you change out more than 50% of your roof within a 12 month period of time, you're required to bring that roof up to current code, that whole roof, okay? So you don't do the whole thing, but at a certain point you hit a trigger, it's going to make you do the whole thing. So our, we have historically had a requirement for substantial improvements or remodels that trigger sprinklers into the buildings. This is our existing sprinkler ordinance. We do it in residential commercial projects across the board. We have put a proposal together that would trigger full building compliance with 7A if you trigger a substantial improvement, meaning you're improving more than 50% of the building, which would then say you now have to do the rest of the building in, in that uh, project or in that permit. Everybody knows building two 7A has an additional increase in cost associated with it. Depending on the scope of work, that scope of work could incur up to a 30% additional cost in, you know, in that construction. So we're not sure that's where we need to go. That is the direction we're looking from you as to whether you think Additions and alterations one bite at a time as we go along is sufficient for our community or if this significant improvement trigger, which we would be one of the first agencies in the Northern California area to do something like this, that comes with a cost impact. Um, so that's, that's the question back to the council on that. We can go to the next one now. And that, that'll bring us back to uh, Chief Building Official as well. So with that, we did discuss that this may be a, like, a likely pausing point to discuss the fire code aspects and the, the home hardening prior to getting into the remainder of the codes, which really are gonna be uh, some information you've seen on the uh, additional emergency housing measures that we've discussed before and then the REACH code. So if it pleases the council, we'd like to discuss the, the fire elements and then move forward past that. Great. Council, questions about that first part of this presentation? Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, so if you could go back and talk a little bit about that 7A section 
just a little bit. So currently, as folks rebuild their homes, they're having to rebuild their homes up to the 7A code. Is that correct? Correct. All of our rebuild homes that are pulling building permits to rebuild are being rebuilt to 7A. So we are going to have a large swath of the community up there that is built to the home hardening criteria that wasn't up there before. Do we have any idea? Uh, so when was 7A passed? 2008 was the first year it was enforced here in the state of California. So in our WUI, do we know how many homes currently were built before that was passed that also survived the fire? That survived? Well, I can tell you up in the Fountain Grove area, within our WUI area, we were approximately 2% of the homes that were built to 7A criteria between 2008 to 2017. Sorry, let me, let me rephrase because uh, it, it seems like we're talking about a very narrow amount of homes that are both in the wild and urban interface, were built prior to 7A passing, and are not, were not impacted by the wildfire. So how many homes are we actually talking about that would fall into this section where if they were to, to uh, fix over 50% of their home, they'd have to come up to, to full compliance? We have 12,000 in the room. Approximately 12,000 homes. So within the entire WUI area, which is roughly 30, 35% of our community, we have worked with GIS and we're just about 12,000 homes within those areas. So with respect to your question, we see very few homes that would meet that criteria as far as permitting goes, where they're going to exceed 50% of their square footage or a cost estimate for a project within these areas. So with discussions with the chief building official, we anticipate this to be a very low number that we would see move forward for review. But it is an opportunity for us that we've heard from council, we would like to take steps to address this built environment because that's gonna be our only opportunity because we are dealing with predominantly a built environment within our community located within this area of homes that do not comply with the wild and urban interface requirements for building construction. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we wanna take a, um, if I could just do a quick recess. Um, so let's just break for about five minutes and then we'll come right back.
Okay, well, we're going to reconvene the meeting. Madam City Attorney, could you uh, update all of us on, uh, about some sure. status changes? Sure. Um, there are two council members that own property within the WUI area. Um, what is being discussed is uh, new regulations that are will be applicable only within the WUI area. Um, therefore, those two uh, members, uh, council members, uh, have a financial, potential financial interest in how the regulations get shaped. Um, there, we were looking at the numbers. The public generally exception does not appear to apply. Um, there appears to be less than a quarter percent, 25% uh, of the um, homes in properties in Santa Rosa are within the WUI area. And therefore, uh, I do recommend that both Councilmember Fleming and Councilmember Tibbetts um, recuse themselves from the discussion on the WUI regulations. Thank you for that clarification. So if you two would like to, and for the members of the public, the way we're gonna uh, do this presentation, so we'll stop here, we've received the presentation on this. I'll solicit any other questions from council. Then I will have two public comment periods. The first public comment period will be on that first part of the presentation. So if you do wanna make comments on what you have heard from that portion of the presentation, you can make a public comment. Then we'll give our feedback to staff. Once we're done with that part of the presentation, then we'll invite the two council members back to finish your presentation. You'll have another opportunity uh, to do public comment on that portion of the presentation and then the entire council will give feedback to staff. Does that make sense for all council members? Yep. And as the doors close, so uh, council, are there any additional uh, questions over that portion of the presentation, Ms. Combs? Thank you and thank you for bringing this forward to us. I appreciate it. Uh, have a strong interest in how we do our codes. Um, I have a question about the two points of access. I appreciate you decreasing the number from 50 to 30. I think that's a, a wise decision. I have a question about, um, I'm thinking about some of the roadways where both points of access would essentially lead to the same road. Um, and so I'm asking how is it that you're making the determination about the two points of access being separate uh, and providing the, uh, sufficient evacuation. So with the two points of access, when two points of access are required, there is a remoteness requirement for those two points of access. And that would be uh, one half the overall distance that the area is served. Now those two access may come back to the same roadway, but that roadway is then also supposed to have two points to it. So. For example, and you're probably thinking of Fountain Grove Parkway. I am. It comes back to it, but Fountain Grove is a main arterial roadway um, and has the ability to move a fair amount of vehicles. All of this subdivision development does get a traffic study, you know, report done to it to validate the capabilities of the roadways. So the fact that we're requiring multiple points of access sooner than we ever have before is going to help disperse that impact onto any singular roadway. So if the two points of access go to a road that then only has one point of access to Fountain Grove, is that an acceptable answer, a solution? No. Okay, so it has to- Correct. To fully, the whole route, fully Correct. two points of access. Thank you, I appreciate that. I remember the building exiting is half the diagonal distance, so I'm guessing very, it's a similar Very similar concept. Okay. Um, and I think we're talking about how to make 7A in some way retroactive, in some way, to get at the existing buildings that have shake roofing material or siding within our WUI. Do we have that in our existing WUI? Yes. We? Okay, and um, the choices that I'm hearing are, uh, the nibbling choice, little little bites, and the other choice I'm hearing is if it's significant, then the whole building. Correct. I've also heard a third option that 
I was told was in use, but do not have an example in front of me of when the property is sold, that it has to be modified at time of sale. Um, is that is that something that you've seen at all? And uh, did you explore that at all? Or, or simply not look at it or eliminate it for a particular reason? We, we didn't in this process because this process is a building standard adoption and the, just the sale of a property doesn't invoke any building standard requirements. Okay. Um, okay, and I, I, I'll listen to the public, but I, I have a, an inclination. <laughs> um, I'm looking at the, and I'm not sure if this is the point or if it's the previous, the next conversation. I'm looking at the Fire Hazard Planning General Plan Technical Advice Series uh, from May of 2015. And I think I, I told you I'd be looking at this. And there is a recommendation here, thank you, there is a recommendation here uh, to establish certain policies, and I don't know if these policies would go under this section or not. Um, for example, one of the policies specifies ensuring access and availability of water supply in case of wildfire. And I know that we ensure water supply and capacity for typical fires. Um, there's a difference, though, if we're doing it in case of wildfire. Would that be in this section since it would apply to the WUI? The, the state already incorporates um, multiple water supply standards. So we have the, the CFC requirements that we adopt through Appendix B and C through Chapter 5. And in that, they also reference NFPA 1142, which is specific to wildfire um, protection. And then there's the Title 14 fire safe standards, which also have water supply requirements in them. All of which our local ordinance already requires higher water supplies than both Title 14, NFPA 1142, and Title 24 water supply requirements. But I think we experienced that we didn't have enough water. So I'm wondering if we, if we need to be looking at whether we're constructing in an area where we, even with those standards, don't, don't, aren't able. I think the, as the codes apply to specific projects as they come in, we have water supply requirements that are up to three times as much as the state or any other regulation we require. We hear your concerns, but I think what you're discussing is not a building standard requirement, but a master water plan requirement. Okay. Outside of the scope of this adoption. Okay then I will indicate to staff that I have a strong interest in a master water plan requirement uh, that matches our needs for wildfire because the state building codes and fire codes uh, water requirements have not been sufficient to meet our needs. Um, I also note that there is a policy recommendation in this document that is avoid approving, avoid where feasible approving new development in areas subject to wildfire risk and uh, I'm interested in having staff bring back to us uh, planning document policies that recognize that we need to take an, ag uh, an aggressive approach to not increasing um, the hazard in this area. And I appreciate that that might not be part of 7A. Correct, and I think that that discussion will come up and we are starting the general plan process which will address land use okay. citywide, that, that conversation will It really happen. concerns me that we should mitigate before we harden. I understand hardening, but I think we need to mitigate first. Uh, and I'm not seeing the mitigation coming forward. Let me check one more thing if you don't mind giving me a section. Um, this, this document also recommends looking at the emergency response time as a um, uh, a method for calling for more stringent mitigation measures. In other words, if something is very close to the fire station, it may not have to build at the same hardness level as something that's much harder to get to or within outside of the five minute response time. Did we look at that at all for our WUI? We took a different approach. Per our standards of cover, we have minimum requirements uh, for our local response area, which are higher than the national standard. 
Um, and in lieu of having varying degrees of construction requirements throughout already a high risk area as identified in the WUI, we've, we've, ex we've adopted the philosophy that everything should meet the most stringent requirements within the WUI area. Okay, so whether you're close to a fire station or further away, your standard is the same, but that's because you're using the highest standard available? Correct. Okay, thank you. That's an excellent answer and I appreciate it. Any additional questions? I had one question when you talk about the 7A, um, the significant improvement trigger, and I, um, I think I heard you say more than 50% then might apply to the whole building. Who determines 50%? I would think um, some construction product, how do you equate that and who makes that determination that it is 50%? The determination has been typically in conjunction both building official and code official. Um, historically, we've only really looked at it using it for the trigger of retroactively installing sprinklers, which has been the under the determination of the fire code official. Um, we have standardized uh, how we look at that um, through working with the building official, utilizing uh, similar approaches within the building codes as it relates to um, American Disability Act's upgrades, you know, when you hit certain square footages, amounts, thresholds to trigger when you only have to do a portion or when you have to do the whole thing. And that's the same approach we took to the significant improvement or remodel um, triggers. So 50% is a fairly common trigger throughout the building standards for uh, bringing a building up to full code. And so within the industry, it's, again, I, I haven't done 50% improvement of my house before, so, but that is commonly yeah. understood, so. It, it's, an, it's a semi, you know, it's, it's where the, the codes have identi identified a significant remodel improvement uh, threshold. Again, the number of homes that we see hit this are very few. So the impact will be to few, but the benefit could be great. Um, and, you know, we're, we presented, you know, the additions and alterations since the first, you know, and what we were hearing was feedback that we need more. So this was just a proposal to put in front of you for consideration. It's not necessarily our recommendation. It's we've heard you want more and here's more. Okay, thank you. There's no additional questions. Is there anyone, any members of the public who would like to comment on this portion of the presentation? I know we've got several cards, but I think most of them are for the reach codes, not what we've just heard. Please, Deborah, please identify yourself. Is it on? There you go. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah Tavares. Um, having been over a 30 year um, developer in Southern California, and certainly also being in the WUI, um, the concern that I see with the enormity of our housing problem is the convergence of policies that are incrementally being imposed upon the public without their really realizing the enormity of the convergence that is in place right now. And I do see uh, triggering remodeling. I've been, I've seen that over the years with our construction. Um, that is going to eliminate rebuilding, remodeling people's investments into their homes. It's going to reduce the size of homes. It's going to reduce the availability of homes. And it's going to drive up the costs enormously, which will reduce housing. Also, it's going to cost homeowners with the climate action plans that have already been adopted that you're working incrementally to put teeth in to require retrofitting across the board for all existing housing. In other words, retrofitting all existing housing. And that's my biggest concern because this incremental bit by bit approach of uh, extracting tremendous amounts of monies out of homeowners and renters pockets alike. Because if homeowners are, have a rental cap and they're being imposed to reach these reach codes and all of the requirements to meet those reach codes with rental caps, and then increase costs. We've done some estimates on reaching the, the codes uh, across the board with relationship to the climate action plans. We're looking anywhere between twenty and $50,000 per home and per apartment. Uh, 
And that's enormous when you think about the fact that the most of the majority of the public is unaware of this. So I think in fairness uh, and in um, clarification and, and um, being transparent, I think you need to talk about the climate action plans that you've adopted a number of years ago and go over the intention of those plans to reduce, to meet your required goals of reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. So I think that what would occur if you were transparent fully is we would not have the number of rebuilds. We would have a far greater reduction in housing available to all levels, homeowners that can't afford to buy and tenants and uh, others that need housing. This is what is occurring and it's a drop by drop. And we see it because our team reads the plans having been builders, we're accustomed to planning and building codes and ordinances and plans. And it's not a foreign language to us. So therefore we've read them, we've been putting out information and warnings which ha have been failed to be done at your level. So I would ask that you, you listen to what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to comment on this portion of the presentation? Seeing no one else rise. Um, Ian or Jesse, would you like to reframe what feedback you want from the remaining members of the council and we'll get that feedback to you. As it relates to the 7A, you know, we've, we've presented the additional alterations from the first uh, study session to comply with 7A. This is pretty much the standard through the North Bay area where we have a lot of wooey. The only direction we're asking is, do you think that's enough? And if not, do you want more? And we provide an additional step, that's it. Great, thank you. Ms. Combs, we'll start with you. Just as a point of clarification, if it doesn't meet the 50% rule, we would still be enacting if we chose that new construction and new additions have to meet. That is correct. That's what we presented the first time around that we st okay. plan to present on the 22nd. In my, in my own opinion, I think the 50% rule is very reasonable. Um, I, I think it's uh, reaching a bit for us to, I mean, I, I feel a little bit as if we should go further uh, because I don't think we should be allowing shake roofs anywhere in the high fire hazard area, period. We, but I don't see it as politically possible to ask people to change their roofing out, for example, at time of sale. Um, so I think the 50% rule is an excellent rule and I appreciate you bringing that offer, that, that available to us. Um, I also wanna thank you for the uh, two points of access uh, because the, um, the safe egress is really important. I will look forward to hearing how we will be doing enforcement on some of these items. Thank you. Mr. Alvarez. I'm good with what uh, you brought forward to us today. Mr. Sawyer? I agree with Council Member Olivares. And Vice Mayor Rogers. Uh, and I agree with both of them as well. And it, it actually reminds me of that old adage about if you keep changing the parts on a ship, at what point does it become a new ship? And I think that's what we're trying to do with the WUI and trying to protect people as uh, homes are upgraded. And I too, I think the 7A standard is uh, sufficient at this point. Okay, so we're ready to transition to the next portion. Could uh, someone get our two council members? Or invite them back?
Mr. Oswald, please continue. Okay, uh, so the, the beginning of the next portion starts out with the emergency housing requirements that we have discussed a couple times over the last year and a half or so. And what it essentially does, the HCD, Housing and Community Development, State of California Department, provided uh, these emergency measures back in 2018 to allow local jurisdictions to utilize them and adopt them locally to provide baseline minimum criteria for emergency housing. And it, and it ranges from, it, it does include certain items like tents or um, it, sleeping under the stars, so to speak. It, it, it allows for jurisdictions to have that baseline. So we proposed on the first uh, visit we had, our first study session to adopt these and we are proposing to go ahead and adopt these and it does help the local jurisdictions to have that baseline. So that, if there's more discussion on that, I'm certainly glad to hear it, um, but it is straightforward and it does give us a, a very good tool here locally as a, in our jurisdiction. So moving on, the, the next portion gets into our reach codes. Uh, this is a highlight showing the, the overall body of work for the code adoptions and this the, are all electric reach codes uh, as we've been directed by the council uh, to pursue that adoption. Uh, we want to bring an update to that process and where we've, where we've come from the last time we met. Uh, we've also had our individual uh, climate action subcommittee meeting and the previous um, council study session. So here is, uh, these are some of the kind of highlight items that we are going to get in the base code adoption uh, as opposed to the reach code. So our base code adoption is going to include these, these fairly significant in increases in efficiencies. Uh, the lighting efficiencies, you won't find an incandescent bulb in a new house going forward. If you do, it, it would be probably a novelty uh, and, or decorative. Uh, it will be more than difficult to build any new home with anything less than two by six exterior walls. Up and, uh, up and through this current code, code cycle, you can build uh, two by four exterior wall construction, but it takes a different method to show compliance with the energy code. Uh, doors and window or windows have always been addressed with the energy code. Now it's doors, which have never been included. It's a pretty interesting aspect of it. There are some specific um, quality type inspections that will be required on all new construction. Uh, they're calling it this QII, quality insulation inspection. Believe it or not, insulation uh, improperly installed or uh, not maintained shortly after ins ins installation uh, provides some losses in energy efficiency. So they've implemented a specific inspection just for that. Um, photovoltaic solar systems as we know them will be required on all new, what we're calling low rise residential. That's a term you'll hear frequently. This low rise residential is any residential structure, three stories or below, and that includes anything you can imagine underneath that, which is the triplexes, the fourplexes, the duplexes, and an apartment building uh, that is three stories or lower. And natural gas is included in the base code. This uh, slide was presented before and it was, it's been provided by the uh, California Energy Commission which highlights some of the, the, the new upcoming base code requirements, um, higher demand efficiencies on uh, HVAC units, water heaters, again, uh, solar photovoltaic systems will be required, in, increased in indoor air uh, quality and efficiency uh, movement of air and the envelope efficiencies are significantly increased. And again, this slide is from the California Energy Commission showing from their calculation a $19,000 savings over a 30 year mortgage with an initial cost of construction of $9,500. So here is when we get into what we have have adopted locally is the, 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 the phrase of an all electric reach code. And again, from direction of council, this was the, the pathway we've chosen. Uh, we've we've um, partnered with 
uh, Bay Area um, Regional Energy Network, Sonoma Clean Power, and the Regional Climate Protection Agency to team with not only this jurisdiction, but they've done work throughout the greater Bay Area and other areas in California to bring the data forward for this code adoption. And at the bottom of the page, as you can see, we have our wonderful all electric um, page here with the city of Santa Rosa that we continue to update information on. So here is a little more extension of this REACH code. We have our base code that we discussed has fairly significant increases in efficiencies that are coming anyway. This REACH code is uh, termed REACH as we're reaching past the base code. And uh, the primary um, uh, function of this, this forum and several other forums is to, to give the opportunity for the public and the council to hear what this really means. Um, so that it, as we've discussed before, these codes, base codes are adopted and, and reviewed in this manner every three years. I can tell you this year has been more significant than most other I've heard of. And here we have a list of cities and counties that are interested, have shown interest in pursuing some form of REACH code. We don't have specifically those that may be uh, wanting to do an all electric only, but all of these, these jurisdictions are looking at some, some form of a REACH code. So Santa Rosa is certainly not uh, out in front on, the, on our own anyway. One of the primary um, requirements for adopting a code that is above the base energy code in, in the state of California is what's called a cost effectiveness study. This was performed and we do have a copy of it available on our website. It's a quite long 120 or so page document that brought forward these numbers as baseline from the, the research that the entities did, and these are what we what we would call or consider baseline averages, not specifically for every specific area uh, individually. So these are the costs that the California Energy Commission has accepted in in the cost cost effectiveness study. And part of that study is is only about dollars. This information provides what our uh, potential uh, 2016 base energy code brought us in uh, emissions savings and reductions. 2019 base code with uh, gas and electric that is proposed. Then we have the 2019 code that is proposed with some higher efficiencies then the final red line is your 2019 code with the electric only reach option. So you can see the, the change, uh, drastic change in any of these options across the board. These, again, we mentioned some of the opportunities that we've brought this out to the public and in front of the council or, and or subcommittees. Uh, there are, there's one or two other meetings that is missing here. We had a study session early on in July, I believe, and there was one more prior to the North Coast Builders Exchange uh, workshop. Uh, some of the information I'm gonna be, be providing, we didn't have time to get into a report. We had a, this meeting that was shown on last Thursday, the 19th, and I, I'll go over some of the information that we received from that, and we'll make sure that gets in the record. Proposed after this meeting, our next time to to discuss is going to be the actual first reading of the ordinance. Uh, taking the information we've learned today from the council, we will finalize our draft ordinances, work with our city attorneys, and have those prepared for that uh, October 22nd. If all goes well then, then we pursue that uh, November 19th for that final reading to get our codes adopted in the proper amount of time for January 1st, 2020. So in conclusion, I won't read the whole slide, um, we've, we've worked through this process with numerous stakeholders, um, the, the council and the subcommittees, uh, our counterparts in the industry as far as code regulatory bodies. Um, I, I can say from my perspective, first time as a building official doing this, it's been really refreshing to see the engagement of the jurisdictions. It's, it's more than I've ever 
recalled it happening and, and the jurisdictions themselves also uh, are all recognizing it when we when we do get together and discuss it. Uh, I wanna add some of the information that we did learn that I wanted to bring forward and then we'll get it into the record from that uh, uh, the 19th last Thursday meeting and, and we had a, a large amount of comments that came forward and we tried to group them and I'll, I'll just highlight some of the things we we heard and what what we know of them. Uh, there were solar concerns, uh, some specific questions as to uh, what if a house can't have solar put on it because it's shaded by a hillside or another building. Uh, the code allows for that. Uh, there's an exemption already built into the code to um, exempt solar installation. Along that solar inst installation exemption line, Governor Newsom signed uh, AB 178 about three, three weeks ago. What that essentially does, it's a very short bill. It exempts solar installations, solar photovoltaic installations in uh, declared emergency areas. In other words, our rebuilds would be exempt from installing solar panels. Um, they Actually, the bill is signed. They are now exempt from it if we had a requirement. By proxy, currently, until we find out more information, we are tentatively um, interpreting that is that all rebuilds will be exempt from all electric only. And that's been a common themed question that would the electric, uh, all electric uh, requirement be able to be exempt from the rebuild. So that's a tentative interpretation. We're hoping to get some final word from the California Energy Commission Barring that, that is the direction we, we believe this will go. Um, in that law that exempts solar uh, that was signed by the governor, sunsets on January 1st, January 1st 2023. Some other concerns that were brought forward were um, we're moving too quickly on this type of an ordinance uh, that was brought forward in the meeting. Uh, they just wanted to know how much more state level um, decision making may have been uh, discussed on this or has it been yet. Um, there were some concerns that although we're having stakeholder meetings that the, the decision's already been made and we reassured them that it hasn't. This is an, yet another opportunity to have the council hear it and, and provide us the opportunity to give you all the information necessary to make the decision. Uh, other um, issues brought forward uh, challenged the cost effectiveness study that the state has accepted. Um, individuals have provided specific examples that we'll have uh, added to the record with communications with some actual local um, cost estimates for work in, in the same area. Um, their question about incentivizing as opposed to mandating. And if we want, we have um, Rachel Kuykendall here from Sonoma Clean Power to talk about some potentials for incentives. And we'll give that opportunity as well. Health and safety concerns, uh, there were several brought up as in support of the uh, adoption of the all electric only, the burning of natural natural gas in homes produces the hydrocarbons in the air. So that wanted, uh, some folks wanted that to be very clear that they had concerns with that. Another concern was what if the electrical grid goes down and we have an all electric home? Um, another, uh, group of uh, questions and statements were essentially that there's a lack of education on what all electric means. Um, some folks um, feel that uh, we could do a better job, not just as a jurisdiction, but uh, overall for California. Uh, other, there were several statements uh, to, along the lines of, can we consider other options? And I wanted to also state, there were some statements uh, provided about uh, a couple about an environmental uh, analysis, CEQA compliance. Uh, we are providing a CEQA analysis that will come forward with the uh, adoption in October. And I have received, and I believe the council has also received several communications, both uh, uh, supporting and opposing the uh, adoption of the all electric only. And that is, I believe all I have. Any questions for me or Again, we do have Rachel Kuykendall from uh, Sonoma Clean Power, our technical expert on uh, the energy efficiencies. 
Great, thank you. And having attended that uh, meeting last week, I really do appreciate the openness and the dialogue that did go there because, again, it's just a lot of information and um, I like the way it was facilitated and the information that was raised during that uh, meeting. So, questions for staff? Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Jesse, wow, thank you for all the public outreach that you've done on this and I really like how you kind of brought the high level concerns to us as somebody who wasn't there and can't be there for Brown Act reasons, I appreciate that. I feel like I was. Um, plans in process, you may have already addressed this and I apologize, but I just wanna be very clear because one of the concerns I did hear a lot about was for the people within the rebuild that if they've got an architectural design that does not show conduit running from point A to B, they'd have to make that change and that could cause a delay. Is that an insignificant concern? Is that a valid concern? I mean, I, I hear that we are looking at a possibility of exemption and we're in the process of verifying that, but if we couldn't exempt, would that become problematic for rebuilding families? We have heard from the development community, the building community, that th that is one of their major concerns is they already have plans maybe nearing completion of the plans or, or actually completed and haven't submitted yet. Um, they do have that concern. So the, the, from the building community, they, they have voiced that is, is a valid uh, concern. How confident are we that we'll be able to exempt and, and is there a way to get affirmation before the second reading of the ordinance if the council were to move forward? Our goal is to have that affirmation prior to that meeting. I okay. was actually hoping to have it before today, but we haven't received it yet. Okay, um, and I guess my only other question would be for Rachel. I was curious about how Sonoma Clean Power's incentive programs have done on the whole. So uh, Advanced Energy Rebuild, we currently have about 250 folks who have filed an application, which represents 7% of currently permitted projects. We'd obviously like to bump that up and we're working on enrolling a big HOA right now. Um, we do anticipate PG&E just filed an advice letter to continue that program through next year. So rebuilds would potentially be still eligible to receive the up to $17,500. Uh, we're also working on a spinoff program that would be eligible for all new construction projects. Uh, so that's something we heard from developers and builders and we're actively working and should come up in our next board meeting. Okay, thank you. And can you, I mean, I'm sure you maybe don't know this, this might be too granular, it would be for anybody, but how, you know, of the total program funding, how much have you used or applied to these 250 applicants? So our board allocated um, about two, sorry, $2 million over three years, so $6 million total in SCP funds. Mm -hmm. uh, we've spent just about, we anticipate spending around $2 million of that. So you're, you, you're basically, uh, those 250 applicants are gonna consume that, that fund. Correct. But PG&E is looking at doing this partnership with Sonoma Clean Power again. Yes, and I think part of it is it's been a really good partnership with mm -hmm. them sort of providing the funding and us doing the, the boots on the ground um, intake of projects. Okay, um, thank you very much. Other questions, hey, Ms. Fleming? Ms. Kike, uh, Rachel, yes, hi, Ms. Kike. No. That um, works. <laughs> hi. <laughs> Um, you mentioned that you're working on a program that would incentivize future builds. Can you give us any inkling of what that might look like? I can tell you what we'll bring to the board. Obviously, um, any program is subject to board approval, uh, but we're anticipating sort of the same structure as our advanced energy rebuild program uh, with a lower incentive levels. So we're imagining $1,000 for homes that do use gas that are 20% more energy efficient than code. Uh, for all electric homes, that would be 3,500 and then offering a kicker incentive of $1,000 for homes that install battery storage. We've also heard that's obviously a very big concern with the PSPS events. Thank you, and we look forward to hearing more about the details of that program as it uh, is rolled out. Uh, the next question I have is, um, you know, you brought forward a concern that I've heard from a number of constituents around what happens uh, if the grid goes down, and perhaps not just in a PSPS event, but there's lots of situations that we could imagine. So 
you know, we can't, none of us have a crystal ball, but in the future, what are we looking for when homes are more dependent on their own production of electricity? So, um, most, it's, it's kind of an interesting question and a nuanced question because uh, all new appliances, whether they're gas or electric, the safety features and the electronic ignition, if it is a gas appliance, are electric. So this is really an issue that's gonna affect everyone regardless of how they power their home is, is how we put it. Um, we're gonna be looking a lot more into battery storage. And I think the question is um, how we provide backup power to all homes, essentially, regardless of how they're fueled. Right, because I know we're mostly talking about home hardening in this situation, but I'm imagining if I'm a homeowner with a fully electric vehicle, uh, that and which is not relying, you know, which is fully separate, and then, you know, I, maybe I don't have a generator, do I have a backup battery, how does that work? And I'm asking it in part just to have the conversation start to enter the public consciousness about that would it be a disaster or do we have plans? Are we gonna start implementing it? I don't expect you to have all the answers today. You guys certainly have a whole lot of them. Uh, this next question might be for uh, Mr. Oswald. I'm wondering when it comes to uh, the solar exemptions that are coming down from the state for new builds, uh, how would it be determined whether or not a property qualifies for that? Would it, is it a percentage of coverage is it subject to whether or not they, like if it were in a wildland urban interface, would it have to do with um, the distance, you know, should there be vegetation management? Should the trees be trimmed away? What types of things and how um, much could we compel a homeowner to get into a situation where they might then not be exempt from a, a solar exemption? There, in the base code, um, even, if we had a reach code adopted, there is inherent and it will remain in, in our base code exemptions. Really, it's, it's founded on the amount of exposure a solar photovoltaic system receives on, a, on an annual basis. And if the solar installers actually evaluate that for, to optimize um, the, the efficiency of the unit. So if a, a home was constructed near a larger building, uh, near a steep hillside, in an area that maybe they can't, wouldn't be allowed to trim all of the trees, they could qualify for that, that exemption. If the construction of the home is such that the azimuth of the angles of the roof can't be a, uh, accounted for in the installation of the panels, that would be another measure uh, that could exempt the home. If that home was then exempted from those solar panels, even for those reasons, it would automatically be potentially exempted from the all electric only requirement. Mm. And this next question is a little bit, um, it's related and it's off topic slightly, which is, um, you know, we look at something like Hansel going to solar roofs and then stopping short of producing extra energy because PG e will not purchase uh, or extra energy. What happens in situations where uh, people who have solar are producing extra energy and are there opportunities in battery storage coming down the pike either through Sonoma Clean Power or through grid hardening where we might be able to capture that rather than disincentivizing the production of, of electricity through solar panels? The technologies for storage primarily for the smaller type units, the, the residential, single family re residential, they're there, they still are in, in general fairly expensive. Um, but the technology, much like photovoltaic, from what we see on submittals, purely from a technical aspect, they are advancing. Um, Thank you for the information, I appreciate it. Ms. Gomes. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for bringing this forward to us. Uh, I have been eagerly awaiting this conversation, and I think we had a sort of major climate action uh, just a few days ago. So I, I know it's on the minds of uh, even our youngest people uh, in our community. Um, if you can look at slide 13. I just want to appreciate that you have looked at the cost savings of not having gas infrastructure and that you're showing $6,000 in cost savings for doing this. Um, I, I appreciate that 
essentially we can do the environmentally correct thing and have cost savings. That's, that's good to see. Um, I wonder if uh, Sonoma Clean Power representative, is it Rachel? Thank you for being here. Um, can, ex can let me know if there's any plan to expand incentives to include remodels, for example, I know quite a few people who might want to remodel a kitchen and a, change out a hot water heater. Yeah, so we did receive a grant um, almost two years ago now, a $10 million grant. We're throwing in an additional $3 million specifically for retrofits. And our permit, or fire permit, is currently with City of Santa Rosa uh, for opening a downtown storefront through which we'll uh, facilitate those incentives. Okay. Uh, but yes, coming uh, hopefully um, summer of next year, we'll have a downtown storefront where we'll be distributing those incentives. Okay. And so it's it won't just be new construction that's not in the WUI. Correct. It's, what I'm hearing is that there's also a trend to not make this requirement for our most recent round of new construction. Correct. Yeah, I'm kind of sorry for that. It seems to me that they would like to take the cost savings uh, that's made available. I hope that we can talk with folks who are rebuilding actively when they come in and encourage their use of the incentives plus these cost savings. Um, but I'm hearing from the governor level that we aren't going to be able to require all new construction. Thank you. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Sue, this is primarily a question for you. I know Windsor is out in front on this, having already had their first reading. <clears throat> they almost immediately received a letter from, uh, from a developer uh, threatening to sue over CEQA. I know at our subcommittee, we had a brief discussion about whether or not this ordinance adoption would be subject to a full CEQA document ahead of time. Uh, can you speak to that just a little bit? Actually, our office is currently reviewing what the options are and working very closely with uh, Jesse and his team. Okay. Mr. Ewan, you look like you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I'll say that. I think just to clarify too that the state d did do a CEQA document for the building code. So what we're looking at is what that difference is. And so there, there, there's a discussion currently going on and we're working regionally, not just um, Santa Rosa alone, but I know our attorneys are working with other cities. So we'll be prepared when we come to the first reading with um, that either resolved or have whatever we need to bring forward to make sure that you have what you need to move, move that forward. Yeah, that was actually the, the second component of this question is I see on the list of folks who are considering it, Santa Rosa, Windsor, Healdsburg, uh, I think Katati is as well. I know RCPA is discussing it. Perhaps there's a way for us all to partner to have this discussion around what it actually would mean uh, from a CEQA perspective. I think the number I heard for Windsor was $150,000 to actually defend the, the ordinance. And so if we could work as a region, I think that that'd be a little bit more effective. And, and we're certainly doing that. Great, thank you so much. Any additional questions? The one question I had, I know at the Climate Action Subcommittee, we were presented a third option, and was it the all-electric preferred ordinance or favorable? Can you explain what that option was or is? That w the all-electric preferred was an option. I honestly don't remember all the details about it, but it, it, it incentivized in some sense the, the uh, code adoption to not put gas in, but the option was still there. Because I, I think my understanding was if they did choose to put gas, yet the rest of the house has to become like 15% more efficient or something like that? I don't believe it was 50. So they're required to meet Cal Green Tier 1, which is about 15% more energy efficient. Okay. And what is the name of that option? We call is it, it preferred? We call it the all electric favored. Favored, that was, okay. I knew it was preferred or favored. Okay, uh, any additional questions for staff? All right, we have several cards on this item. Up first would be uh, Alima Silverman, followed by Kevin Conway. Hello. Um, Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and other council members. My name is Alima Silverman. I'm an architect here in Santa Rosa. 
and a member of the Climate Action, uh, Friends of the Climate Action Plan, U.S. Green Building Council, um, and the Rebuild Green Coalition. I was at the roundtable meeting last Thursday, although I didn't speak. Um, afterward, I wish I had spoken. And um, to bring a balance to what uh, most of the builders were saying about all electric, uh, with it being too hard or too expensive to do, uh, several builders spoke to the fact that their clients didn't want all electric. Uh, their clients wanted gas stoves, gas fireplaces, gas furnaces, uh, gas dryers. I myself have been a diehard gas stove person until I tried it, and I've, um, I've now been converted to, um, as soon as I can, uh, change out my stove. Um, they also think the all-electric ordinance is being shoved down their throats. That was one statement. Um, one builder asked, what's the rush? Why are you in such a hurry to pass this ordinance? And after this last week, the answer should be apparent. Millions of people around the world last, this last week marched and demonstrated. The United Nations had a special session. We are in a climate crisis. This is a climate emergency. We have to do something different. We have to reduce our greenhouse gases. So I can sympathize with the point of view of builders. My husband is a contractor. I've been an owner contractor myself, built a couple of homes. But I want to add something here to the discussion, something that was brought up at the round table by one of the last speakers, a builder named John. Education. Education is needed now for home builders and for homeowners to understand the risks of uh, having gas in your home and the benefits of having an all electric home. Yes, there will be some people who want gas in their homes, just like there's still people who smoke cigarettes, even though they know the risks. But with education and information about the risks, there will be many more homeowners that will choose to build all electric. Thank you for your time and thank you to uh, Mr. Gouin and uh, Mr. Oswald for all the work they've done on this. Right. Thank you, Kevin Conway, followed by Diane Wheeler. Good afternoon, Kevin Conway with Friends of the uh, Climate Action Plan. I just wanna speak briefly to the a few things, but one is the cost effectiveness studies on this uh, have been done, several have been done. Uh, a study funded by Southern Cal Edison found the initial cost savings are estimated to be in the range of three to $10,000. A Palo Alto study uh, totaled a cost savings of $6,000. And here in Sonoma County, uh, for fire survivors, uh, the incentives for going all electric can be as high as $17,500. And by the way, as Aline alluded to, 90% uh, of the people that switch to induction cooktop say they like it better than cooking with gas. Um, I want to also mention that Wolf Co Contracting built 14 tiny homes here in Santa Rosa for homeless veterans, and the cost savings for not running the uh, in gas infrastructure was $30,000. Uh, this was from John Morgan, who was the project manager. Uh, with the... Uh, most important, though, is that uh, methane is, uh, I mean, natural gas is 85% methane. And methane has a, a greater heat trapping effect on uh, atmosphere than carbon dioxide does. So um, with the tighter envelopes that are required in new homes, it's even more harmful as an indoor polluter. And then when people talk about the unintended consequences of all electric reach code, um, what we have to do is think about intentionally putting more methane into the atmosphere and talk about the intended catastrophic consequence of putting yet more greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. Uh, if someone told you that they were intentionally going to put something in your house that they knew was harmful to your family and to the environment, whether it's lead paint, asbestos, or methane, why would we tolerate that? 
PG&E supports this. Vice President Robert Kenny says uh, from PG&E that PG&E, this is a quote, welcomes the opportunity to avoid investments in new gas assets that might later prove underutilized as local government and the state work together to realize long-term decarbonization objectives. With all this in mind, PG&E supports local government policies that promote all electric new construction when cost effective. So I hope the council will stay the course and continue to push for an all electric reach code for our city. Thank you. Thank you. Diane Wheeler, followed by Laura Nish. Hi, <clears throat> I'm gonna read a letter. I'll submit it by email. If I don't finish, I'll stop at three minutes. Um, this is from John Sarter, uh, contractor, California. Uh, I'm writing today to share my experience as a general contractor and designer builder of 33 years in the North San Francisco Bay counties of Sonoma, Marin, San Francisco. My firm has recently switched from using a combination of gas and electric appliances to all electric. The high efficiency of new building envelopes and systems and the cost savings afforded by eliminating an entire outdated and volatile system from my projects has easily allowed the addition of enough solar generation in my projects to enable the buildings, the building of ZNE, net positive energy homes. This creates local resilience. The excess energy beyond living needs uh, beyond living needs allows for EV charging and enables the development of zero carbon living and transportation systems. The homes I'm building as a result are healthier for the owners and for the communities as they have no operational emissions from burning fossil fuels. Uh, he gives information on a recent project which will be in the um, which will be in the email with lots of statistics about that specific project called Soul Lux Alpha in San Francisco, a six story building with all kinds of wonderful things happening. I just returned from a national builders summit in Colorado where other builders shared similar projects they're developing across the USA. There was a time when using gas appliances was more efficient, cost effective and greener than all electric. However, with the recent increase of efficiencies created by induction cooking and heat pump systems for HVAC, water, heating, and drying, this is no longer the case. The electric grid also now has more renewable energy than ever before. The costs of high efficiency electric appliances are on par with gas and eliminating the entire gas system resulted in a savings of $8,800 per unit in his project. According to the recent RMI report, that's the Rocky Mountain Institute, my experience in the field verifies this. The savings goes a long way toward paying for the solar systems in order to be ZNE. Natural gas also creates unregulated emissions in the home, and the smaller home is the worse those unchecked emissions are, creating an unhealthy indoor environment. The new and continually lowering costs of solar energy storage are allowing development to become more easily self-powered and be part of the solution to climate change rather than an ongoing part of the problem. I strongly encourage the movement to all electric infrastructure for all new buildings as well as retrofits of existing buildings. He'd be happy to tour his projects with you. Thank you. Thank you. Laura Nish followed by Matt Taylor. Hi, I'm Laura Nish. I'm the Executive Director of 350 Bay Area, and this is Climate Strike Week, kicked off on Friday by mostly young people all over the world asking for us to act aggressively on climate. So I just wanted to frame my comments with saying we are working through the list of the least we can do. This is literally the least we can do, and it all starts adding up. And Santa Rosa is not at the forefront of this, we're not at the tip of the spear, but I would like to think that sustainable Sonoma jurisdictions would be at least slightly behind the tip of the spear. So just echoing a lot of other people, um, all electric homes are cheaper up front. And this is supported by numerous studies that have been uh, bandied about, including the Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, California Department of Buildings and Standards, the Air District, and the NRDC in Southern California, Edison, uh, all saying that it's less even up to $25,000 less per home. <clears throat> They're also cheaper to operate, and I, I just want to keep bringing that to the forefront. If you have solar panels on your rooftop and you have an all-electric home, then your operating costs are minimal, and you get to the point where the payback on your solar panels, which is not included in this, well, we're talking about this reach code, but is uh, once your payback is over, your, your energy is virtually free. 
So uh, the other thing is that in order for California to meet its emissions reductions goals, they will have to shut down the natural gas infrastructure for the most part. So now we're just talking about not adding to it, and then we're gonna have the much more difficult conversation, probably not here, about how to reduce that. Also, all electric homes um, are cleaner and more comfortable, according to uh, many other studies. So when you have PGD standing up and testifying for an all electric reach code in, a, in other jurisdictions saying that they think this is the right thing to do, I think that should be a very serious consideration as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Matt Taylor, followed by Deborah. Good afternoon, Mayor Schweldholm, uh, city council members and the, the staff, city staff and members of the public. My name is Matt Taylor, lead designer with Farrell Faber and Associates Architecture and Planning. Um, I'm here to re represent um, both uh, future homeowners and what would be our future clients um, as they don't have a voice here um, in this city action. Um, and I'm here also to discuss some relevant info regarding this all electric reach code. Um, since the fire in 2017, our firm has designed over 300 homes here locally, uh, a major portion of those in an effort with the rebuild. And of those homes, about 95% of them have um, gas ranges and about 97% of them that we've designed have gas fireplaces. Some of them also have exterior outdoor kitchens, barbecues and that sort of thing that they like to have plumbed in with the natural gas. The couple of things I wanted to mention today was um, the state exemption that Jesse had mentioned and encouraging the, the city council to um, look into that exempting the fire rebuild properties as they once had, uh, many of them once had those um, natural gas appliances and to exempt them now on January 20, uh, 2020, uh, I, I believe is not fair for them. Um, so something to consider there. Um, one other thing is the possibility of phasing in or, or providing incentives to these homeowners, um, future homeowners to, uh, when they're building a home uh, to encourage them to go all electric without requiring them to go all electric. Um, some of the things that we're seeing people are more willing to give on is uh, maybe a gas water heater, exchanging that out for all electric, looking at electric heat pump, um, mechanical heating in the homes, and also even electric dryers over giving up their gas uh, fireplace and or cooktop. So a couple things to consider there. And I, I do want to thank the city uh, staff uh, for all of your work on this and, and encouragement and working with the local building community as well. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah, followed by Brian Ling. Thank you very much. Uh, Deborah Tavares with StopTheCrime.net. I'd first like to encourage everyone to go to our website, StopTheCrime.net, go to our menu, and then to our video YouTube channel where I was an invited guest speaker in London several months ago. I cover much of what the original intent with the smart meter grid deployment was globally, as well as the smart meter water grid that is being deployed globally as well. Sadly, uh, our kids are being traumatized in schools. Uh, they're not being taught what John F. Kennedy was telling us when he gave that monumental speech uh, just shortly before he was assassinated about the monolithic and ruthless conspiracy, nor has anyone read the report from Iron Mountain. I cannot underscore reading the report from Iron Mountain more highly. What we see is a predatory system run by Rothschild which is also PG&E as well, who is a convicted felon and has breached all of the requirements under their conviction as a felon. They've also been financing and working with Russia and other countries all over the world on a new corporation and delivery system called Solaren, S-O-L-A-R-E-N. This is a new delivery system of energy from satellites back to space. Now I know that you're really amplifying photovoltaic and energy backup storage. Uh, sadly, the battery systems are silicon 
uh, they're not silicon salt, which they should be. They're lithium ion batteries that explode. This becomes a weapon. This is also the type of battery that's used now in the e-bikes, um, lithium ion batteries. So when we're talking about storage, and particularly in the WUI areas, we do not want to have to report to the fire captains where the lithium ion batteries are because they do explode. It takes a tremendous amount of additional time to put these kinds of shrapnel exploded batteries out. So I am in, in the WUI area. I can tell you that we've been told by the fire departments we are on our own. And I can see that we're on our own because uh, we don't have the two points of access. We don't even have really a good one point of access. And when I went and saw Paradise and I saw the inability to evacuate, I see that it is going to be a, a crowded evacuation situation with all the motorhomes that are parked all over the county when they uh, literally clog up our road systems that have minimal access Thank points you. to begin with. StopTheCrime.net, the report Brian from Iron Ling, Mountain. Brian Ling, followed by John Sutter. Thank you, Mayor and Council people. Uh, Brian Ling, Executive Director of the Sonoma County Alliance. A uh, couple things come to mind in the last hour or so. Uh, when we looked at WUI slide five, top, top uh, wasn't the title, but the first word, more restrictive amendments, those three words. Um, earlier speaker talked about uh, the negative impacts of our continual incremental additional requirements to build. Um, REACH requirements we're talking about now, by definition, go beyond the existing California building codes. The WUI we've talked about, the electric REACH we're talk, talking about right now, the, the rental inspection program next, the anti-discrimination tonight, uh, all items that are adding to the cost to build, remodel, and or operate a rental. Um, all disincentives to future development in this, this area. Uh, both before and after the fires, the one thing we all agree on is it costs way too much to own a home in Sonoma County and Santa Rosa. And we all agree there aren't enough homes. We also acknowledge that we already have the most rigorous, time-consuming, expensive process to achieve entitlements of permitting. Until staff can find a way to reduce the burdens of this process, we, Sonoma County Alliance, are asking the council not to reach beyond current and future state laws, which already are the most restrictive in the nation. We need more homes, not more regulations that lead to reasons not to build them. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, John Sutter. Hello. Hi. I'm a uh, remodeling contractor. I've been remodeling in Sonoma County since 1979. I, I hate to admit it. Um, about 15 years ago, I stumbled into a PG&E um, energy class taught by one of my gurus, a gentleman named Rick Chitwood. And he showed me how stupidly we've been building for many years very, very careless about how airtight our structures are. It's like building a refrigerator without putting a gasket on the door. You know, how well is that refrigerator gonna run? Um, so I took more classes. I eventually became a Building Performance Institute building analyst, and I shifted the operation of my business to uh, energy efficiency. I got tired of debating whether we wanted pink tile or turquoise tile, and whether uh, linoleum is better than bamboo. I wanted to, wanted to do something that I considered more meaningful, which is um, reduce the carbon emissions of our county. So uh, about four years ago, um, we made the full commitment to doing zero net energy retrofits. So that's essentially snugging up the uh, building enclosure and then um, providing energy efficient appliances 
and then putting solar on the building to uh, zero out the utility bill and greatly reduce the carbon emissions. And I've come to realize um, the last couple of years, the future is all electric. We have to, as soon as possible, stop bringing methane out of the ground and burning it and leaking about 5% of it before it even gets into our houses. Um, so we've completed uh, about 14 uh, almost all electric conversions. Uh, probably the biggest problem is convincing clients. You know, for years and years and years, we hated electric cooking. I hated it. You couldn't have given me an electric stove. But uh, the old resistance stove and the new induction stove are completely different creatures. Uh, Julia Child cooked on an induction stove. Uh, Anthony Bourdain cooks on an, cooked, used to, past tense, on an induction stove. Um, the, uh, I just got off a cruise ship. All their uh, stoves are induction. Um, so, and you know, change is scary. I remember how scared I was when I put the first solar on, how scared I was when I installed the first heat pump water heater and the first mini split conditioning system. I'm happy to say I have not had one customer out of 13 complain about any of the all electric we've installed. Thank you, Jim. Those are all the cards we have here. Um, Jesse, could you reframe what you'd like to hear, what feedback you want to hear from council? Primarily, we received the, the direction we wanted for the fire code elements. Today, the remainder of the presentation was more an update. And if the council so chooses to change any direction, that's your prerogative. But we have been provided the direction already to pursue the all electric reach code. Okay, we'll see if we have anything to add. Um, Ms. Fleming, we'll start. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And again, I want to uh, congratulate and appreciate our team for the robust engagement. I was not able to attend um, because I'm not on the climate subcommittee, but I did see that we had a packed chamber. I also was able to attend the builders roundtable, and I was able to attend the climate strike here in Santa Rosa. And I think that any good decision comes from a lot of listening. And I do want to say to the builders who are concerned about this that I really do hear you and that your concerns are not um, falling on deaf ears. It's just that uh, when I turn on the gas in my home and I look at my five-year-old and I, and I think about the toxins that are leaking into the air, I can't in good conscience support that going forward. I know that change is hard, but I can't imagine what year we all got gas in our homes. It wasn't that long ago. And with an induction cooktop that I use regularly, um, it is faster and easier, and it does require a bit of a learning curve. But I think that in 50 years, if, if we're part of the solution, that people won't be missing their gas stoves, they'll be grateful that we had a planet that we could live on and that we uh, took proactive action to ensure that, that our species is able to inhabit our area. And I think that, that they will look at Santa Rosa as part of the solution rather than part of the problem. I also want to be clear that we're not looking at you know massive changes here. We're looking at a few different appliances that are in homes, I think four appliances. We're not looking at totally remodeling all homes for everything. Um, additionally, the, the one thing that I didn't hear brought up is the fire safety aspect of this. I've heard from firefighters that after um, a lot of the fires were put out during our Tubbs fire that there continued to be gas lines that were sparking, that were uh, flaring, and that this continued to provide us with additional challenges. And my concern would be that why would we make a decision to allow for for this type of infrastructure when we have clear evidence that it poses a safety risk for our residents as well as our firefighters and first responders? First responders. So with that, um, I'm in support of the ordinance um, going forward, and um, I just want to appreciate our team for doing a lot of outreach and listening. Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I actually have a question for you, Jesse. So when it comes to these building codes, if you're going in to submit to do a remodel down the road and you do greater than 50% uh, remodel to the existing home, the people would have to meet the REACH code compliance? No, they would not. Okay. These codes are actually for new construction. Okay. 
Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm, you know, I, I support moving forward on this, uh, just looking at the data and, you know, and a lot of times we as council members have to rely on the data provided to us and trust that it's accurate and gathered from uh, a variety of different sources. And I think that we have done a good job of doing that here today. But looking at the data, the potential cost savings that exist for the occupant of the home down the road, combined with the fact that we're looking at 2 million metric tons less than the 2019 code efficiency home, to me is pretty compelling. So I'd like to bring that information, keep this conversation going uh, and continue to move forward. But I will say that I will have a keen eye for an exemption for uh, rebuilding uh, families. I think that's, to me, that's going to be very important because one thing that this council said that I think that we need to stay true to is the fact that uh, we did not want, we wanted people to be able to move back into their, their lives as, you know, as they were Saturday night. And I, and I just want council to continue to, I think, maintain that vision uh, going forward. Mr. Alvarez. Nothing to add, Mayor. I look forward to this coming back to us. Thank you. Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I'm one of those um, that's very, I'm, I'm concerned with the, um, a major change like this. Um, I am looking forward to it coming back to us again. I'm, I am concerned about the rebuilding or the, the victims of the fire and making it more difficult for them to rebuild. So I'm look, I would be looking for a, a carve out for them. Um, I'm one of those that, that has become accustomed to natural gas. And I removed my um, electric stove when I moved into my house um, and put in uh, a gas stove. But I also see the writing on the wall. I, I understand the, the, the future is um, something that needs to be considered. Uh, our, our environment uh, cannot be degraded um, where we can avoid that. And I, I feel for the, for the builders, I feel for this kind of major change in, in, in how they are um, going to conduct their business. And, and I also feel for, the, for, the, um, for those that are concerned with an all-electric home and are faced with uh, not having that choice unless they buy a home that already exists. So I'm, I'm, it's, it's hard for me to, to, um, to be excited about it. Um, but I understand uh, the the need to move forward with the um, with the reach code. Um, it's a um, I, I am I am often challenged by um, people losing their options, and um, this does uh, create one of those environments where they are losing that option, um, at, at least in a new home uh, in Santa Rosa. Uh, so I look forward to it coming back. Um, Look forward to more, more conversation. I'm a little, um, uh, the all electric favored concept is something I'd like to hear a little bit more about. Um, and um, so we'll just see what happens when it comes back. Thank you. Ms. Combs. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for bringing this forward to us. I, I very much appreciate the work you've done on it. Um, I'm having trouble viewing saving people over $6,000 plus additional incentives uh, in the rebuild area as uh, some kind of loss to them. Uh, it, it seems to me that that's a population that in particular needs to, un should understand the need to reduce uh, greenhouse gas effects, climate effects, should be motivated. Um, so I'm surprised that it's a population that isn't motivated to remove methane from the atmosphere. Uh, I hope that we can post this uh, cost savings and make sure every permit has, you know, you could save these costs. I personally would not separate this group out. Um, I think all new construction should, should meet this standard. Um, when I moved into my new house, I swapped out the gas stove for an induction stove. Uh, and it has taken me some time to, to get used to it, but just about all my old pans worked anyways. A lot of the concerns I hear people say are, uh, it's, it's actually been a pleasure to use. Um, I am also, uh, like my colleague, Mr. Sawyer, interested in hearing more about the all electric forward and uh, would be inclined to go that direction um, if, if we had a fuller understanding of that, that direction. Um, Thank you again for, for bringing this forward. Mr. Vice Mayor. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And first and foremost, I absolutely agree on uh, folks rebuilding their home within the resiliency overlay. It makes uh, a ton of sense for us to make it as easy for them to get back into this community as they can. So that's absolutely not a problem. I, I did want to point out, you know, last Friday we did have millions of kids marching around the world who what they were calling for was a little bit subtle. And what they were calling for was for those of us who are in a position to be able to do so to take steps that are of minor inconvenience to us to ensure a future for them. And to me, this isn't even a, a difficult discussion. I've heard three concerns about it. I've heard cost, I've heard convenience, and I've heard catastrophe. Well, when it comes to cost, it's cheaper. So let's set that aside. When it comes to convenience, okay, I understand people like to cook on their gas stoves. I totally understand that. But two thirds of the homes in California were built before you had any type of energy efficiency. 29% of Santa Rosa's emissions come from inefficient buildings and houses, and we're not even asking to take back your gas stove. We're asking you to make a commitment to the future of somebody who might move. And I see Lisa up there in the audience. In Prop 13, that doesn't happen very often. So on a new home that somebody is constructing that you could hypothetically move into, it is the barest of minimums of what we can do to lower our building inefficiency climate impact by up to 80%. That's not a small number, and it's, a, as I said, a really minor inconvenience on a future hypothetical that we get to that point. The third was around catastrophe, and I understand the questions about uh, pg and public safety power shutoffs. None of the policies that we do are done in a vacuum, and we're going to have to address the impacts of that, whether we do the, re the reach codes or not. As we heard from Sonoma Clean Power, you still, even with, you, with your gas uh, infrastructure, still have challenges when the power goes down. And in fact, having the solar panels on the home, which is not our requirement, but is a requirement coming, that'll be coupled with the all electric, actually makes the homes more, efficient, more uh, resilient as well. And I'd suggest to folks, take that $6,000 saving, invest in a battery, and you're on your own little microgrid in the event that you do have a public safety power shutoff. It makes a lot of sense for our community. We'll be bringing back to the council probably about the same time as the REACH codes, a discussion about declaring a climate emergency and talking about the impact that climate change is having on our future. I would be uh, amazed if the council passed that ordinance while also not taking the step of addressing uh, our building infrastructure as well with the REACH codes. I'm fully supportive of it. If you couldn't tell, uh, I look forward to the discussion coming back. So thanks for this presentation. Some of the, um, my comments are what you probably heard during the uh, climate action presentation. Um, at that vote, I, that's the direction I thought we needed to go. Um, and the reason, there, there, there's something I haven't heard too much of, but it's the choice. I heard it at the Builders Roundtable, where some, even look at my household, you know, we chose to go electric, we're choosing to go solar, and it's my choice, and we're changing some of the, 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 the way my wife and I have run our house and the way we've cooked. Right, And as we're doing these changes, I think that really has a lot to say that we're gonna take a look at the next step because one of the speakers earlier today mentioned, okay, well, what about the hot water heater? What about your cars? You know, the, the, the number one contributor to GHG is our transportation. If we can get people to start thinking in a different way, and I think this is the right direction, um, but I would like to see a little bit more definition coming back to us when it does come back, the all electric favor, just I, I think that is a viable option because yes, that would give the choice to the um, buyers and the builders that if you do put gas there, you're gonna have to make it up on other parts of the construction. And that's why I thought that was really um, a great way to get us where we need to be going, but at a rate that I think more people will be acceptable to change in, which will lead to many other things. Um, and for me, it's got absolute with the resilient city uh, overlay. Um, there needs to be some exemption there, uh, again, living in that area. The, um, it, it's not just a thing about cost, getting their lives back together. And some people would say, well, if they haven't rebuilt in two years, what's going on? The trauma that this community, when you've lost their house, to throw another um, challenge on them, it's, um, 
walking in their shoes, I, I'm not willing to do that to those folks that have been devastated by the fire. So I, I heard you say, Jesse, it sounds like they'd be exempt. I would not be comfortable going forward with this without that exemption 100% in place. I just don't think um, that would be right to do to those members of our community who have experienced such a, uh, so much more of an incredible disaster than those of us that our houses survive, but it, it really, I don't wanna do anything else that's gonna further traumatize that rebuild effort. So with that, do you have any other clarifying questions or anything else for council? I don't need anything else, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, do we need time to set up for the next study session? Are we ready to go? Okay, and which city manager, assistant city manager is gonna be? Mr. McGlynn, item 3.2. Item 3.2, study session on fee-based rental inspection program. Carmelita Howard, Deputy Director of Housing and Community Services, presenting. Good afternoon, City Council members. This is Dave Gwine, Director of Housing and Community Services, joined by Carmelita Howard, our deputy, and together we're gonna to walk you through a proposed rental inspection study session. And I think we skipped this slide. Go next. Yep, good purpose. What we wanted to do is, first of all, confirm if the council is interested in advancing a program. In order to do so, we're gonna go through some program details that you have to select from. We also will provide the feedback on a proposed model that we received from stakeholders and ask if, for consideration of the existing code enforcement and neighborhood revitalization program models as your current tools. So the process today would be if the council is interested in moving forward with developing a rental program, we would use this input session to provide feedback, consider those components within a program design that would come back to you on November 19th with an ordinance. It would consider things such as your program structure, the implementation plan, the fees, and other components based on your feedback. I'm, I'm struck by this as the, a dated slide presentation, um, but, excuse me. I was just gonna comment, that's not what we've got. It's a different slide presentation. I'm sorry, say that again. Can we take a brief recess and I will reset the slides? Why don't we take a brief recess? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, are we ready to reconvene? Okay, thank you. After a reset, we'll start with an overview of our presentation today. We're gonna to unpack a lot of information to try and facilitate your decision regarding advancing a new business model called a rental inspection program. So we start with the purpose. We wanna go through some background of other times the council may have heard rental inspection program. We wanna outline a process for you to consider. We wanna show you what we think is the estimated number of rental units here in Santa Rosa, especially since the annexation of Roseland. We want to re review your existing programs for housing inspections. That's basically the voucher program, code enforcement, and neighborhood revitalization. We will talk about the cities we surveyed for be best practices, and then we'll review what we call rental inspection component choices if you want to build the program, along with some stakeholder feedback. So first, the purpose is to confirm if you want to advance a rental inspection program, and if so, we would be working to bring that back in an ordinance fashion in the November 19th timeframe. Like I mentioned, we're gonna review our existing rental services and we seek feedback today and ongoing until the ordinance may be in front of you on the best way to proceed. So first with some background, um, a rental inspection program is designed to proactively inspect rental units in a jurisdiction. Your current program that proactively inspects units is your neighborhood revitalization program and your housing choice voucher program. Um, in October 2015, some city departments reorganized and code enforcement joined housing and community services. And it was shortly thereafter that we held a study session on options to improve code enforcement, surveying other cities for best practices. And that was the time we, we first mentioned that perhaps that we should be considering a rental inspection program as a part of that. The city manager approved a study and off we went and that you're gonna to hear today some of the cities we surveyed from that three year time span. But also during this time, the council began discussing rent control and just cause eviction policies. And so we are working in two environments. First of all, the rent stabilization, just cause eviction, seeking feedback on a rental inspection program from pretty much the primary stakeholders. And both the California Apartment Association and North Bay Associated Realtors at that time, again three years ago, expressed that they would be in favor of a rental inspection program in lieu of the other policy initiatives. So then in 2017, a program outline for rental inspection was developed. We started meeting with council members one-on-one -on -one with stakeholders, but then again, the um, rent stabilization factor was, was our primary focus, and the, the idea has since been deferred due, due to wildfire recovery. So this is really the first time in this chamber that you've had a chance to talk about a rental inspection program. So our suggested process is if the council is interested in moving forward with the program is get input today, uh, get some questions answered. We'll continue to get stakeholder feedback, hear your ideas of what components in a program you want to have, and if so, we'll be back on November 19th with the ordinance and the program design based on these features you see. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Carmelita to walk us through the next few slides uh, regarding uh, rental the rental inspection program. So um, this is, um, we got the information from GIS through our IT department that there are approximately about 35,000 rental units in the city. This is 47% uh, uh, of the housing stock. 53% uh, um, are uh, owner occupied. And included here are the single family dwellings there's 15,178. And these numbers that we included here, the single family dwellings, it is one component of the um, rental inspection program that maybe we would like to be able to self-certify right away as, during the start of the um, inspection program. And then based on um, an opinion from CAA and recommendation, they are, they are recommending that we 
uh, inspect units that are three or more, and there are 13,789 of those kind of units. These are the existing rental inspection programs that we have right now in the city. We have the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Um, this is a HUD program and it, um, it has a minimum um, requirements for health and safety and um, they do a move-in inspection when, um, a new, um, when a client moves to a new unit and also a annual inspection. I mean, not, an inspection is completed every other year for the regular units. And then we have um, code enforcement program. They use the IPMC, which is the International Property Management Code that has been adopted by the city for uh, property maintenance. So for um, fiscal year 1819, we had uh, 214 complaints based on substandard housing. And the neighborhood revitalization, um, a program in the city it has uh, inspects approximately a thousand units annually, and 700 of those units had violations related to substandard housing. These were the cities surveyed, and as you can see, Berkeley uh, does all rentals. Um, Concord, the, just the multifamily units that is recommended by CAA, City of Sacramento uh, and Richmond um, uh, also do all rentals and S San Luis Obispo has stopped their rental inspection. Um, and also these are the exemptions for some, some exempt units that will build uh, five uh, years or less and, um, and some others that are New within the you know five years are also owner occupied units inspected by another agency and mobile homes. Uh, mobile homes are inspected by the state, so we, we don't do inspections of mobile homes here. So the uh, inspection standards, they there's the IPMC, the um, California Housing Code, uh, uniform. Um, uh, housing Code, and then also the HQS that is done for Section 8 clients. So the first thing we need to do if a rental inspection is a recommendation from council will be to do outreach in the whole city. Um, you know, we've discussed this with the California Apartment Association, NORBAR, and also the tenant groups, and they're willing to work with us to make sure that um, the whole city is educated of what this new component uh, um, that, you know, that what this uh, rental inspection is. And then also the other goal is to use the NRP model in outreach. And the uh, NRP model uses a community outreach uh, specialist to make sure that uh, when um, we go to uh, neighborhoods, um, uh, you know, especially in the NRP model, um, neighborhoods that they feel like they could trust somebody who can discuss with them what the plans are. And another thing we're thinking of is as part of the education is to teach them what are the um, resources and requirements that we do here in the city and also like how can you be a good neighbor? So those are some of the goals that we want and then maybe uh, using the NRP model, we can offer also services that maybe are needed in some neighborhoods that are not available to them right now. So another component that council has a choice will be what kind of housing do we want to inspect? Multifamily, those are the apartment buildings. Are we going to include single family, shared housing, um, granny units, AD, or any other units that you would prefer us to be, that you prefer to be part of the inspection? And also one of the components will be uh, frequency of inspections. Do we, um, Sacramento model inspects units once every seven years, some other, um, jurisdictions um, in, in do uh, you perform inspections one every five years. Or we can also allow units to be exempt if they are able to self-certify, or if the unit passes inspection, we can just put them in a self-certification program for a number of years. 
So um, here is the self-certification. It's kind of like rewarding the good um, property owners. And so um, should compliant owners uh, with no violations, you know, they, then they can self-certify. Um, the Sacramento model, um, all single family units are allowed to self-certify right away. And the self-certification is done with their tenants. So they both sign the form. And then uh, 10 or 20% of those units um, you know, can be inspected annually at random. So we make sure that those who self-certify did it correctly. And then for registration, um, should we require all property owners to register their units and include a fee in the registration? And also, should there be penalties for owners who do not register? And also, these are the exemptions that um, we, you know, we might want to include, um, include as part of our component choices. So um, doing um, exempt newly constructed rental units within 10 years or five years. What kind of unit type do we want to inspect? Should we also in, um, include in the program units that are assisted by the Housing Choice Voucher Program, and especially if we decide to use the um, HQS inspection that's already being done by um, our technicians, then uh, we might want to inspect the Housing Choice Voucher Program from the rental inspection as a, um, you know, as a tool to attract landlords to the program. And then, of course, mobile home parks are res the responsibility of the state, so we will be exempting those. So these are the inspection standards. So if we use a, um, if we use the HQS that's done by the Housing Choice Voucher Program, we will be able to use um, technicians right away. So it doesn't look like we are looking for code violations uh, and the decision, you know, one of the decision points will be if we find, if a technician finds um, violations in the, in the unit that are egregious, for example, you know, hanging wires, um, they don't have enough smoke alarms or, um, you know, mold, then it can be referred to code enforcement. And in, when it goes to cold enforcement, there might be penalties um, included um, if they do not follow what they sh they're supposed to do within a certain period of time. And or we can use the IPMS that's already being used by the NRP program and the city. So the inspection process, we will notify the owner 30 days in advance of the inspection. The owner is responsible to secure tenant consent to access the unit. Um, and we will also allow owners to request one rescheduling at no cost um, seven days in advance so that um, you know, we don't lose the time of the um, inspector. The inspection must be rescheduled within 30 days from when we sent the letter. And then the city notifies the owner within 10 days of finding if it pass inspection or if we will provide a violation list. The property owner is given 30 days to repair and if repairs are not complete, property will be subject to annual inspection. And property owner must be present during inspection with the tenant. Currently, if I can yes. ask you to break, um, we're gonna have to take a brief recess Sorry, so why don't you save this spot where you're at and we'll uh, come back in about five, 10 minutes.
Okay, we're gonna reconvene the meeting. Sorry for the delay, but um, one of the potential consequences when you try to do an all-inclusive policy, sometimes uh, the situations with individual council members change. So, um, Madam City Attorney, would you explain our current situation? Uh, yes, uh, unfortunately, uh, as we were, began the reviewing the various components, uh, it became, uh, clear that there are five different council members that could possibly have a conflict depending on how decisions are made. And the element that is uh, causing uh, the issue is uh, what exemptions are gonna be included in the policy. So what does the policy encompass, whether it encompasses all rentals, not single family homes, only rentals above four units, um, that decision impacts potentially five different members of the council in different ways. Um, so we have decided, uh, I don't know if you wanna talk about what the procedure is, um, but that we will come back uh, with a structure in which we'll be able to address that issue with some portion of the council and all of the remaining elements of the program could then be discussed and considered by the entirety of the city council. Yes, so due to those conflicts and with the, the way the presentation is currently um, designed, there's no way that we could have a quorum of the council listen to any of the information. So we will not be taking any public comment. So staff will be coming back on a date specific. So we, we are going to uh, continue this item until uh, October 22nd. And between now and October 22nd, staff working in the city attorney's office will reconfigure their presentation so we would at least be able to have a quorum of city council members present. From council perspective, do you have any questions? Go ahead, Mr. Toews. Thank you, Mayor. I'll try to make this brief, but uh, Madam City Attorney, yes. is there any procedure or process to where a council that is regularly restricted on, on particularly a lot of these rental issues can seek special permission of the Fair Political Practices Commission through fact-finding and individual, because this is happening the, to, to so many of us so much and it's getting ridiculous. Sure, there, there um, actually are provisions within the FPPC's regulations and the um, uh, Fair Political Practices Act that allow for this situation where you cannot reach a quorum because you have uh, too many conflicts. And there are mechanisms under those regulations by which um, uh, council members can be randomly selected to continue participation. Mm -hmm. um, that is not some, that's not a process that we would like to do on the fly here today. Um, so we wanna be able to come back to you when we have a clear path we have the decision-making uh, process clear as well. So both the, the, a clear path to, to um, the selection of which council members will be able to participate because we'll only bring it up to a quorum, we'll not go uh, beyond that. And uh, then how we're structuring the components of the, your consideration of the components of the program so that we can get that piece out of the way first and then the entire a council will be able to participate thereafter. Well, I appreciate that that path forward that you've created for us. I do because uh, you, you know we do want to participate, yes. and I and I think that um, you know the the random thing is nice, but it's not nice if we're trying to be a transparent public. Or excuse me, or transparent with the public, yes. where people want to kind of talk to us about the issue and have a sense of where we stand or what our concerns are. Um, so thanks for for sure. cutting this out. But if there is anyway this council could send a letter and you know bring consistency to a lot of these decisions around these issues uh, i think we should pursue that certainly thank you and and um between now and uh october 22nd we'll certainly explore 
all options that may be possible to have as many council members participate, uh, if not the entirety of the council. We'll explore all options, but I'm, I'm not aware of a path at this point uh, to do so. Okay, so we'll not be taking public comment and we will be continuing this item until October 22nd. So we will recess this meeting until uh, four o'clock this afternoon.
Okay, we're gonna reconvene the September 24th City Council meeting. We're on to item four. Uh, Madam City Clerk, we have the announcement of the roll call. Thank you, Mayor. Let the record show that all members of the council are present. Okay, we have uh, no closed session today, no proclamations. Mr. McGlynn, do we have a staff briefing? No staff briefing today. Thank you. Oh, and my mistake, I would also like to introduce Tyler Ledlow sitting behind me. He's a resident of South Park, and he has taken advantage of the opportunity to sit along with the council members to see what it's like uh, from this side of the dais. So, welcome. Uh, with that, City Manager, do you have a report today for us? Y yes, I do. Um, I want to give a little update on uh, the public safety power shutoff watch um, we find ourselves under. Yesterday, the city activated the Emergency Operations Center due to a potential power safety uh, shutoff and declared a local emergency in the city of Santa Rosa. As of this morning, staff learned that PG&E has reduced the footprint of potential impact and the number of customers that may be impacted by the shutoff. Early this afternoon, um, more information, well, later on this afternoon, more information will hopefully become available uh, as there is a, a 1730 uh, update scheduled from PG&E. The National Weather Service has also issued a red flag warning for upper elevations over 1,000 feet in Sonoma County through 11 a.m. Wednesday and a heat advisory from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. today and tomorrow. Due to the forecasted uh, high heat and potential power safety shutoff uh, ahead of us, the city is opening a cooling center today and tomorrow at the Finley Center. The hours of operation are 11, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. each day. Residents in potential outage areas should prepare for the possibility of losing power, um, conceivably as early as 8 p.m. with a re-energization beginning the following day. If de-energization occurs, PG&E anticipates it will take 12 to 24 hours to completely restore power to the city once PG&E makes the determination to restore that power. For PG&E updates and to identify service areas that may be affected by a potential power outage, residents should visit www.pgne.com backslash PSPS and check individual addresses on PNG's interactive potential outage map. Staff continues to prepare the public for a potential power safety shutoff and is monitoring the situation through ongoing communication with PG&E in the county. Um, beginning this morning, the city deployed field teams and stood up a, call, a, a center to uh, call and make contact with care facilities in known and also with folks that are known vulnerable populations that are, reside in the impacted areas. As the situation evolves, staff will continue to provide updates to the community through a variety of channels, including srcity.org backslash emergency, our social media channels, email, and through communications with media partners. Great, thank you for that report. Madam City Attorney, do you have a report? Uh, just, I do not have a report this afternoon, but I did want to clarify um, with respect to the closed session, just so the public would not be confused. There was a closed session item that was listed on our agenda for our special meeting earlier this morning um, at 10 o'clock. That closed session was canceled due to a change of circumstances. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. All right, item nine, statements of abstention by council members. Mr. Tibbetts. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, unfortunately, tonight I'm going to have to uh, abstain from the Benna Valley and Sam Jones Hall roof, uh, given that I think both of the city and the organization I work for are drawing from the same funding pool. But also, uh, I'm going to have to abstain from uh, the Section 8 housing uh, source of discrimination ordinance tonight. And I just want to communicate to the advocates that um, I'm personally pretty de disappointed about that. It's something that um, I had talked about when I was campaigning for this seat three years ago. Um, and I have provided uh, the information from the Fair Political Practices Commission to you, and I'm happy to share that with anybody else in this audience. Um, I'll be also asking for further clarification from them through additional fact-finding to be able to p participate in issues like this coming forward in the future. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Mayor. So to confirm, that's item 14.1, which is the anti-discrimination ordinance, and then item 14. 
14.2 for the Sam Jones Hall. And, and point three. And 14.3. Okay. Are there any other abstentions? Okay, thank you. Uh, mayor's council members reports. Who would like to start? Mr. Vice Mayor. Just really quick, thank you to staff. Uh, we had about 50 people in this room uh, last Tuesday night, uh, maybe last Wednesday night, <clears throat> for the final screening of last October, uh, the documentary that was put together that really chronicles uh, the night of the fire, what was happening with city staff and, and the subsequent response. If you haven't had a chance to see it, uh, it is on our website uh, and should be up and, and streamable for you. It really is a fantastic film and thank you to everybody who shared your personal stories and for folks who came out to, to check it out. Okay. Any other reports? Ms. Combs. Thank you. Um, I have a concern that we have an existing council policy that requires a council seat to be actually vacant before replacement of the council member who's given notice can be uh, begun. Um, and uh, that also means that the current council member in the vote f can't vote for their replacement. It would be, uh, I would like to have us agendize uh, this is the first step in that process, uh, looking to revise that policy that once uh, notice is given, the council be able to move forward with replacement uh, because then you don't have a gap in with only six council members at some times because the individual uh, council member uh, was elected and should have a vote in who represents their base. And uh, it also becomes a significant problem for district seated people when the individuals who select the person from that district f are all people who are not from that district. So I think that we have a problem with the way our, uh, our, po our policy for um, vacating seats is, and I'd like to ask that we uh, agendize a conversation on that at the next meeting. I'll second that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other reports? Ms. Fleming? Yeah, I uh, mentioned this earlier before we were in our regular council meeting that I had the opportunity to go to a builder's round table where we discussed our all electric or um, electric preference options and um, it was robust and we had builders who were in support and not in support and um, it was great that our staff did that outreach to uh, elicit the input from our building community. Uh, additionally, I had the opportunity to go to the climate strike here and I would be surprised if it wasn't the largest uh, demonstration by youth ever in the population of the world. So it was quite an honor to be able to witness it. Great, anything else from anyone? Seeing none. All right, on to the approval of the minutes. Uh, August 27th, were there any adjustments to those minutes from anyone. Seeing none, we'll accept those. Mr. McGlynn, consent item. Item 12.1, motion. Contract award, Coffee Neighborhood Park. Item 12.2, resolution. Second amendment to the professional services agreement with Haggerty Consulting, Inc. Item 12.3, resolution. First amendment to general services agreement number F001021 with E at ECS Imaging Incorporated. Okay. Council, any questions on the consent calendar? Seeing none, do we have any cards on the consent calendar? Seeing none, Mr. Rogers. All right, Mr. Mayor, I will move items 12.1 through 12.3 and waive further reading of the text. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Your votes, please. And that passes unanimously, thank you. We're not yet to five o'clock, so we won't have the public comment yet. Uh, item, you'll be exiting, thank you. Item 14.1, Mr. McGlynn. Item 14.1, report an ordinance of the City Council of the Santa Rosa amending the Santa Rosa City Code, adding a new chapter, 10-46, Housing Anti-Discrimination Code, 
David Gwine and Rebecca Lane presenting. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the City Council. We're back after an extended outreach effort to present this item to you again. Want to go through the purpose of the ordinance, summarize the conversations we've had with many stakeholders on this topic, review the fundamentals of the Housing Choice Voucher Program, because if you recall last month there was some comments made about the prog program that may be misleading or misunderstood. We want to also compare the, our local ordinance with Senate Bill 329. You may know that that passed and is on the governor's desk. He has until October 13th to sign that and close with our recommendation. So the purpose of the ordinance is really just to address affordable housing crisis by increasing the housing opportunities for families using rental assistance and have further fair housing for those families using rental assistance. Here's an example of our extended outreach with the time we've had. We met with some of these groups, some of them multiple times, and we even held a facilitated meeting with different viewpoints to see if we could find some common ground, and we'll go through some of that right in a minute. Here's a summary of the stakeholder feedback. If you were representing property owners, the industry, uh, realtor industry, you would, this message is very clear and strong that Santa Rosa does not need to pass a local ordinance, especially with the expected passage of SB 329. There was also um, the feedback of using a promotion campaign to really promote the program in ways we never have before because it was so misunderstood. There was discussions about incentives, yet there wasn't consensus on what an incentive should be. So for example, a leasing bonus, some members of the Apartment Owners Association said that creates a red flag for me. Why do I need a bonus to lease to a, a voucher holder? There's also discussions of a risk mitigation pool. Some were in favor of it, others were saying, well that implies there's a risk if you lease to a voucher holder. And we had to use that opportunity to clarify that whether you are a voucher holder or a non-voucher holder, you're still paying your full security deposit to the property owner. There was, um, feedback that this, if you pass this ordinance, it should only apply to units of three or more units. Um, and uh, if you were representing tentatives, you wanted to allow for third party discrimination claims. And that basically came from Fair Housing in Northern California where they do uh, discrimination investigations all the time, race, creed, color, sex, and they include source of income. And if they found discrimination of that, they wanted the opportunity to pursue uh, uh, correcting that matter. They wanted to apply to all units. They strongly urged the council to adopt a, your own ordinance. And they also provided feedback that if there was a violation, they'd like to see strong penalties for that. And where we showed common ground was again, the marketing and outreach of the program, promoting it in ways we've never imagined before. And we have some ideas to do that regardless of your action tonight and the feedback for enhanced customer service for owners and renters. Some of that was based on how long it takes to lease, and I'm sorry, to inspect a unit and things of that nature, and Rebecca will be going through that as we go through the program. Okay, thank you, Dave. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Schwedhelm and members of the City Council. My name is Rebecca Lane, and I'm the manager of the Housing Choice Voucher Program for the City of Santa Rosa. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here today to answer questions that arose at the August 13th meeting and provide information to council, to the public, and to our stakeholders regarding the fundamental mechanics of the program, which is where I will begin my presentation. So the Housing Choice Voucher Program is the federal government's largest affordable rental housing program. The program was enacted in 1974 and is an efficient, cost-effective alternative to government-owned housing. The program is often referred to as Section 8 because its authorization appeared in Section 8 of the United States Housing Act of 1937. And there are a variety of programs under the Section 8 umbrella of which the Housing Choice Voucher Program is the most well-known. 
The program is funded by the Department of Housing and Urban Development and administered by local public housing authorities. In Santa Rosa, the Santa Rosa Housing Authority is staffed out of the Department of Housing and Community Services and overseen by the Housing Authority Board of Commissioners. The program in Santa Rosa maintains a seven to 10 year waiting list because there are simply not enough vouchers to fill the demand. Once a tenant has reached the top of this waiting list and is determined eligible for the program, they are issued a voucher to search for housing in the private rental market. The family identifies housing that meets their particular needs and ultimately will pay 30% of their monthly adjusted income towards the rent, with the housing authority paying the balance of the rent directly to the owner. There are minimum requirements that must be met in order for this transaction to complete successfully. First, the rent must be reasonable when compared to similar units in the neighborhood or comparable neighborhoods. The rent must also be aligned with the average rents for the overall area because that's how the program is budgeted. Once a family finds a property that's within the budget range that they've been provided and has completed the owner's application and tenant screening process, the owner completes a request for tenancy approval provided by the tenant. This request triggers the Housing Authority's analysis of the rent reasonableness on the unit and the scheduling of the Housing Quality Standards Inspection. These standards are to basic health and habitability and can include local variances, such as our requirement that a gas water heater has, uh, is equipped with seismic reinforcement straps. As soon as the unit passes inspection, the tenant is free to move in. The owner will then sign their rental agreement with the tenant, as well as the housing, housing assistance payments contract with the housing authority. The HAP contract largely allows owners to treat their, uh, how, their voucher holder tenancy in the same way as all other tenants, with a couple of exceptions. The Housing Authority must review and approve any, appro any proposed rent increases based on rent reasonableness, and that requires a 60-day notice to complete the process. Also in California, if the owner wishes to terminate a month-to-month -month rental agreement for a voucher holder without identifying cause, the tenant is entitled to a 90-day notice. I believe it's also important, as we're discussing the mechanics of this program, to talk about the households we're serving through this critically important resource. By federal regulation, eligible families are at or below 50% of the area median income, and we must target the majority of our assistance to families at or below 30% of the area median income. In Santa Rosa, that's $32,400 for a family of four. Currently, of the families we serve, the majority, 93%, are elderly, disabled, or have children in their household. 73% of families have Social Security, SSI, or pension as their main source of income. 29% are working. The average amount that families contribute to the rent is $441 in Santa Rosa. Program-wide, the per-household contribution from the Housing Authority is $1,028. Families on this program have completed a comprehensive income and asset verification, criminal background screening, and attend a mandatory orientation to the rules and regulations of the program. They complete at least annual recertifications of their income eligibility and annually recommit to following the rules of the program, which include, but are not limited to, following all the provisions in the rental agreement, such as paying the family portion of rent, refraining from disturbing the peaceful enjoyment of the property, refraining from damaging the unit beyond normal wear and tear, and providing information necessary to determine eligibility for the program. One of the questions that came up on August 13th was how many participants on the, participants on the program violate these rules and expectations? While we track the number of families on the program who leave the program, we do not generally need to track the why behind uh, someone's leaving the program. But for the purposes of answering these critical questions and sharing the information requested with the public, we analyzed the terminations from the last fiscal year and determined what you see here. 40% of families voluntarily withdrew from the program. This includes people who made personal decisions to leave, such as an elderly family who moved into a residential care facility. 
In the last fiscal year, we also saw a number of lower wage workers who left Sonoma County or the state and chose not to take their voucher with them. 28% of the program attrition is from the death of the house, head of household when there are no eligible household members remaining. 14% of families left the program because of an increase in household earnings. A family is considered over income for the program when 30% of their monthly adjusted income equals the entire rent. 11% of families left the program due to a violation of the program rules. Because this information was of particular interest, we did dig into this category a bit further. The 11% of voucher violations you see here are things like not completing an annual recertification or moving a person into the household without prior permission from the housing authority. In many cases, these families' choices did not negatively impact the owner because the change in the participant's circumstances corresponded with a voluntary move from the unit. To answer the questions we received from council and owner representatives during our outreach, we separated out the number of families who were terminated from the program because they were evicted, which was 6% in the last fiscal year. 1% of terminations from the program, which was two households, were due to damage beyond normal wear and tear. We take these violations seriously and believe that this data demonstrates that when the evidence is clear, the Housing Authority does act to terminate assistance for those who violate the regulations. If we failed to do that, we know it would harm our relationship with landlords, which is critically important to the success of the Housing Choice Voucher Program. The information on this slide is an attempt to answer a variety of questions that focused on the same issue, which was barriers to participation by owners. We pulled the information from the records of 361 move-ins that were completed in the last fiscal year to analyze these key points. These household moves could be families who were called from the Santa Rosa waiting list and receiving assistance for the first time, it could, or uh, families who are transferring from other jurisdictions, or families who are already residing in Santa Rosa and moving to new units within Santa Rosa. I'll start from the bottom of this slide and work my way up to explain these numbers. The days to lease represents the number of days between when the owner requested that the lease begin and when the lease actually began, and that number is 3.6 days. What this means is that if an owner requested that the lease begin on October 1st, we were generally able to execute the contract by October 3rd or 4th. We believe this data point helps answer the question about the potential for lost rent. The majority of the time, the reason for the delay was because the housing authority does not overlap payments between units. For example, if a tenant gives a 30-day notice to a landlord and finds a new unit in two weeks, the program fulfills the obligation to the owner of the unit the tenant is moving out of before it can begin the payment to the new owner. When we isolated the prohibition against overlapping payments, the delay in the days to lease dropped to two days. As we move forward, we will be tracking this type of information and study our processes to determine how we can bring this number down even further or through a loss mitigation fund, help, help offset this type of loss for owners. It is also important to note that in 41% 40, of the cases, we were able to execute the contract on the day it was requested. The middle of the chart represents the number of days on average that it took our staff to inspect the property which was about five days in fiscal year 2018-2019. Again, there are many variables that influence the scheduling of inspections, and it's important to remember that scheduling the inspection doesn't necessarily correlate with lost rent, which is why we also analyze the days to lease. Most owners who have participated in the program know the inspection requirements, but if the owner is new to the program and the unit is ready, we will work with the owner to inspect earlier than would otherwise be necessary to provide additional assurance that the property will pass inspection prior to the requested move-in date. The top bar of this chart represents the number of days between the move-in date and the date when the owner received the first rent payment from the Housing Authority. This number is high, it's about 15 days, and we want to improve on this as much as the owners that we talk to. Property owners obviously want to receive the payment when a tenant moves in. Likewise, it is in the Housing Authority's best interest to make these payments as soon as possible because we are not paid the administrative fees to run the program until families are leased. 
Retroactive payments also introduce challenges to financial reporting. However, as stewards of federal funds, we are obligated to collect and verify certain information from owners who will be receiving these dollars. The most common reason that we are not able to pay, make our payment closer to the move-in date, is because we have not received a signed contract, our copy of the rental agreement, or been able to verify that the person or entity that is requesting to receive the payment is authorized to receive it. Again, we hope to continue these conversations that have been started with owners and find ways that we can reduce this number and make the payment process more efficient. Circling back now to the proposed ordinance that brought us here today, we want to focus on the state legislation that is pending with Governor Gavin Newsom and identify the differences between the state and local proposals. As a reminder about the timeline, when Council first heard the proposal for the local ordinance on August 13th, Senate Bill 329 had not yet been approved by both houses of the California State Legislature. Several local jurisdictions in California had also moved to adopt local ordinances that paralleled the intent of SB 329 during the 2019 legislative session, including the city of San Jose, which heard and passed a local source of income ordinance protection covering voucher holders on August 13th. Both SB 329 and the proposed local ordinance do the same thing. They make it unlawful to discriminate in rental housing based on source of income and define source of income as any lawful source of income or rental assistance from any federal, state, or local public assistance. The intent of the state legislation and the local ordinance is the same, which is to prohibit discrimination based on means of payment. Where the local ordinance and SB 329 differ are areas where we worked with local owner and tenant interest groups in finding ways to address their concerns about the proposal. The first is the scope of the ordinance. The proposed local ordinance includes a more narrow definition of an aggrieved person who can bring a complaint. The proposed local ordinance also includes specific definition of reasonable occupancy, a change which was made at the request of owners who were concerned that if the ordinance lacked this clarity, it could lead to confusion for owners, applicants, and the city. The state level legislation does not include any reference to an occupancy standard. Finally, the third key difference between the state and local proposals is with regard to enforcement. If the city adopts a local ordinance, then the city may bring an action on behalf of an aggrieved person. Under either a local ordinance or SB 329, the aggrieved person has a private right of action. At this time, the Department of Housing and Community Services recommends that the City Council consider introducing an ordinance adding Chapter 1046 to the Santa Rosa City Code prohibiting rental housing discrimination based on source of income, including Section 8 housing choice vouchers and other subsidies. Alternatively, we acknowledge that the City Council could also allow SB 329 to apply, which provides for similar source of income protections. This concludes our formal presentation, and Dave and I are both here to answer any questions that you might have. Great, thank you for that presentation and answering all the questions that were brought up our last time. So with that, Council, any questions for staff? Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so I asked uh, both of these questions in our last study session. I'm still looking for kind of a clear answer on it. As a renter, how do I know if I've been discriminated against under this program? Well, uh, the city attorney may be better able to answer that question, but the, um, I think the consensus is among all of our conversations and in other jurisdictions that are moving forward with this is that, yes, discrimination is hard to prove. That's correct. It's um, very fact-based. Um, so you'd be looking at, obviously, if there's an advertisement that, that indicates uh, no Section 8, that kind of uh, behavior or that kind of advertising, also uh, any uh, things said um, in the interactions between the landlord and the potential tenant. Um, we would also be looking at patterns um, of practice, um, but it is gonna be very fact-based and not necessarily easy to prove. And have we had a discussion uh, around metrics 
of if two, if, if John and I both apply for the same unit, how does the landlord make the determination on who they're giving the unit to if we're both qualified? Uh, have we talked about metrics around that? Uh, we don't. And it's me, by the way, that's more qualified than John. <laughs> <laughs> the landlord still has um, the ability to, the landlord has to consider the two applications equally, but can still look at other factors. So credit history, um, um, things like that. If you've had issues in prior rentals, if you've been evicted before for bad behavior. Um, so it can look at those other elements, but simply can't base it on where your income is coming from. Okay, thank you. Other question, Mr. Sawyer? Now your side of the story. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Um, regarding this, the same basic topic as selecting a, a tenant, um, is it true that, that if there were two, let's say two, two applicants and they were looking, one of them has a, a voucher, um, but also, but the second tenant had um, a, uh, they were co-joining their income uh, sources. One had a, um, has been at their job for 10 years. Um, they happen to have a, a voucher. The other person, <laughs> yes, 10 years, um, as opposed to 50, but that's, that's beside the point. Um, the other person has only been at the job for six months. Um, but is but is showing their their income as part of the, the that which will make it possible for them to move into the into the unit. Um, what under those circumstances, and you are, one person is more more um, what viable than the other, and you say no, um, the no is is that is that a, is that no reasonable because you can't ver because the other person has only been employed for six months at their current job. I mean, well, it really, what I'm concerned about is it puts the landlord in a, in a difficult position if it's not crystal clear, as it currently is, whether or not they want to, to rent to, a, to an applicant. Um, the landlord still may, uh, again, look at creditworthiness, employment history, other standards of, um, uh, of kind of, of I was going to say credit worthiness. Credit worthiness is probably not the right word, but you can look at other factors in terms of deciding um, which tenant you're going to accept. Um, but uh, you simply can't base it on the fact that the source of income is of uh, a program that's of governmental or nonprofit um, housing assistance. Right. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, and if if they were to uh, if the if the applicant were to feel that they were discriminated against and they went to a third party and said I feel like I've been discriminated against, what's the process um, that that third party would would fact find to decide whether they were going to to um, file suit? So the, I'm the sorry. third party suit in, in our with our yes. ordinance, the third party um, could file on behalf of the applicant. Um, what was the what would be the process by which the third party would um, acquire the information necessary to decide whether they would go forward with a suit, a subpoena? And let me, I mean, what's the process? Um, I don't know if you can answer that. The I don't I don't know that there would be any uh, discovery formal discovery process under our our ordinance if you filed, you do have a private right of action. It's only the aggrieved person individually um, that has the, um, the right to the private right of action under the ordinance. Um, for an injunction, though, that could be done. If you filed suit under either, either provision, then you would, you would have discovery rights uh, through, the, through the courts. Um, let, me, let me clarify, too, your earlier question, and this does say, um, nothing in this chapter shall be construed to prohibit a requirement for a grantor, guarantor or co-signer co based on amount of income or credit worthiness. Um, so the, those are the, you know, those are some of the elements that can be, can be considered. So what is the, what is the purpose 
uh, when there was when the, the when it was added. Um, I'm going back to the purpose. Um, hold on, just one second. Is it that far down? Maybe, maybe I can just state it. So, in our um, yes, so. If we the, the third party the third party action is what I'm looking for an explanation of what was the purpose of the third party um, action why that was so important to be added to our to our ordinance which is not in the state um, and how would they go forward as a third party with that third party um, what would what would be the process for them going forward and which is what I assume would be a suit against the landlord for discrimination. I'll, I'll begin trying to answer that one and maybe get some help from the city attorney. Is that was a request that came from Northern California Fair Housing Group because they investigate all kinds of a discrimination and they claim that they have discovered some income discrimination source of income based on people holding vouchers. And they wanted the ability to work with that person to pursue whatever legal remedies were available to them. So what would that process look like? So they go so that the aggrieved, um, a uh, tenant goes to the organization and says, "I believe I've been discriminated against." They they have a conversation. They state their they state their case and say, I, "I believe this is a discrimination." What is then the next? What is the next step for um, that organization to bring suit against the landlord? What's the what's the, the discovery process? That that would be um, really up to the the ordinance itself does not describe the process by which the. Uh, third party entity um, would take on the representation of uh, an aggrieved person uh, or the process they would go forward. It simply gives the um, those third parties the ability to file a civil uh, action for an injunction against the discrimination. So um, as, as uh, Dave mentioned, it is specifically um, was requested and is, is looking to organizations that help low-income uh, tenants uh, in their search for housing and in their search for um, fair treatment. And I will, I will say too that in the audience, and I believe people who are planning to be uh, submitting comments on this item are from Fair Housing of Northern California, Sonoma County Legal Aid. We have uh, representatives here in the audience who might be able to uh, speak to that and incorporate that in their comments. Um, but. The, uh, the the difference that um, we were that we made in the local ordinance is to more narrowly define the aggrieved person as the individual that's directly subject to the discrimination, and that's different than the state uh, ordinance or the state law. Thank you. And if I may add one one other element that under the state law, um, the uh, California Fair Employment and the Housing Act uh, is uh, enforced also through the uh, Department of Fair Employment and Housing and so uh, could be seen to be playing that role uh, as a state agency assisting uh, individuals and families that feel that they have been potentially discriminated against and they will do an investigation and uh, take the matter to court. Uh, through a settlement process and then and then to court if necessary. Um, we don't have a, a um, our ordinance does um, allow the city to enforce the provisions of the chapter and it does allow in terms of an injunction for the city attorney to get involved, but we don't have the same structure that um, that the that the state has for enforcement of this of the state uh, anti-discrimination ordinance, which is a very well, uh, well-established you know, state agency that has those procedures uh, um, in place. Thank you. Other questions? Ms. Fleming. Thank you. Um, this question, I believe, is for the city attorney. Um, I'm curious to know, in my understanding of how this comes to me and how I explain this to you know, a family member with rentals about why they shouldn't be worried about it, I'm wondering if it's similar to when you engage in hiring practices where we it is illegal to discriminate against individuals, however, it is really difficult to prove it. And I'm wondering if this bears a similarity in practice where 
uh, the onus, and I think you might have said this, but I want to hear it again, that the onus is on the applicant and not the, the provider or the landlord in this situation to prove that they are being discriminated against. Uh, that's correct, that in any action under our ordinance, it, it would be the burden of either the grieved person or the third party organization or the or the city uh, to prove the discrimination. And again, it would be very fact-based um, and again, not not uh, not easy to establish. Um, this question might be for you. I'm curious to know if there are any um, restrictions, I don't see any in the ordinance, but um, any restrictions or limitations or exemptions on the size of the complex or single family dwelling or duplex that might be in question? You're talking about in terms of the applicability of the ordinance? Yeah, does the, the ordinance apply to units regardless of the size of the co complex if there is more than one? It does. I'll read you uh, the current um, uh, proposed ordinance on uh, in Chapter uh, 1046040 under exceptions. Uh, exception D says nothing in this chapter shall be construed to apply to refusal to rent or lease a portion of an owner occupied single family house to a person as a roomer or boarder living within the household, provided that no more than one roomer or boarder is to live within the household and that the owner complies with uh, the other section of the chapter which prohibits discriminatory notices, statements, and advertisements. So this language is is identical to what's in the state um, ordinance, and it means basically that it applies to all units with the exception of an owner renting out a room in their household. So and those if the, I'm an owner and mm -hmm. I occupy my unit, I have discretion, full discretion. As you would in other me. fair housing considerations, such as uh, r renting only to a person of, of one gender. Or okay. Um, thank you. I'm curious to know, this is another question for the attorney, does the city um, have the legal jurisdiction to differ from the state um, if SB 329 were to pass? Do we have the legal jurisdiction to be more broad and who we allow to bring a claim? Uh, yes, we can be um, more liberal in our provisions, but we cannot allow for discriminations that would be uh, prohibited under the state law. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Ms. Collins. Thank you. And thank you very much for your clear uh, presentation. I, I, I don't remember seeing you much before, but I, it's very impressive, thank you. Um, is it possible for an inspection to be scheduled by the landlord prior to there being a vacancy so that if they anticipate a vacancy, they don't have the length of time delay that they're concerned about? Uh, it is possible. Um, it introduces a little bit of complexity uh, around um, uh, our right to enter the unit uh, when another tenant is occupying it. If the tenant agrees. If the tenant agrees, um, it would be possible and, again, uh, slightly more complicated than the inspection occurring when the unit is move-in ready uh, because then uh, the other side of that would be that it, the tenant can't move in right away. We'd have to wait and make sure um, that the, the prior tenant moved out before we can make payments on the unit. There also introduces the possibility that something, some damage could occur, something could happen to the unit during the move-out process. They break a window as they're, you know, trying to move the couch, and uh, and that would then cause the unit to fail. So it's possible, and we have done uh, what we sort of refer to as preliminary inspections or pre-inspections. Uh, many other jurisdictions do the same thing. It, it's possible and will need to be developed in a way that we can ensure that we're still meeting the federal requirements of inspecting the unit and ensuring that it meets HQS standards on the day that the family moves in. Okay, thank you. And on slide 16, it talks about occupancy and enforcement. First, let me ask the question about enforcement because it almost sounded like um, I was hearing from colleagues concern that a third party could independently make an action without there being an aggrieved person. Um, it, under the ADA, sometimes a third party can act, 
uh, without being personally an aggrieved person. For example, you can observe something have happened and take an action under the Americans with Disabilities Act, I think. That's not allowed here, is that right? The, the third party has to be essentially hired by the city, the state, or an aggrieved person. I'm just, I, I thought that was the case and I'm making sure. Um, the wording, that, uh, again, f uh, the third party can get involved only in the case of an injunction and not, not as a uh, general civil action for damages. It's only for injunction. Okay. And the wording is, um, by any person or entity who will fairly and adequately represent the interest of the protected class. Okay. That's interesting. Thank you. Um, we have other non-discriminate, we, we hire, uh, we hire an agency, we've hired more than one agency in the past, but currently I think we have one agency that does um, fair housing testing and, and uh, assistance, legal assistance for us. Um, my understanding is that we have other non-discrimination ordinances. Um, discrimination against families with children is a housing discrimination. Um, persons of color, disability, uh, those are all non-discrimination ordinances that exist now. Are those ordinances also difficult to enforce? I mean, are the, is there a reason we would think that source of income is more difficult or difficult in some way other than those other kinds of dis, uh, non-discrimination clauses that we're looking at? So I believe you're referring to the existing uh, federal or state Fair housing, protections, right? right. Um, but so as a city, we hire through a, a, a fair housing entity in yes. order to ensure that we are providing. Right, right. We right. have a contract with we currently do. Fair Housing Advocates of Northern California. Yes, they do testing here. They also uh, right. work uh, for referrals that we send them, or that independently from Santa Rosa contact right. that agency. And they're following the other protected classes. Yes. Because what we're doing is talking about within the city of Santa Rosa adding a protected class. Right. So one of the arguments I'm hearing is this is hard to enforce. And I'm asking, okay, we've got other non-discrimination ordinances. Aren't they also somewhat hard to enforce? I believe personally it's still worth having them that we still want to have ordinances for non-discrimination against families, which has happened continues to happen. Non-discrimination against persons of color happens. Non-discrimination that's age-related happens. Um, it, it seems to me those, though, are all also very difficult to prove. Um, so we would we have an entity that does testing. So is there, a, is there a specific element to the discrimination on the basis of voucher that makes it somehow more relevant that it's hard? Surely somebody understands what I have just asked. I, th I think so. <laughs> I have to acknowledge the, if you could repeat the, the end of it, more relevant than the other discrimination? Yeah, I mean, it, it, more difficult that it, it keeps being brought up, oh, it's hard to enforce this. Duh. <laughs> so it's hard to enforce. Lots of things are hard to enforce, including other anti-discrimination ordinances. Is there an element here that you think makes it even harder than the other anti-discrimination ordinances? Because I don't see it. I'm not aware of anything that would make this particular form of discrimination more difficult to prove than many other forms of discrimination. Um, and you know that may be something that uh, our organizations that work in this field on a daily basis um, you know, may have a, a may have a clearer answer, but yeah. I think from our perspective, we don't see anything that makes this more particularly more difficult than other than many other forms many of discrimination. Many of the methods that we would use for other discrimination cases mm -hmm. would be similar to the method we would use in this, if 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 I'm understanding correctly. That would be correct. Okay, and. Um, so it, is it possible for us to 
maybe not in this particular ordinance, but as we move forward uh, to consider a loss or risk mitigation pool. I, don't we already have one for uh, if we're working with homeless folks? It's, it's possible, yes. Uh, what we find from other communities is they don't speak to incentives in an ordinance, but it's a parallel discussion at e and or could occur before an ordinance is adopted or afterwards. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we need a loss or risk mitigation pool, but if it provides comfort to others, I'm willing to consider it. Any other questions? The ones I had <clears throat> similar to this and I asked last time, it is my understanding that this council, both last fiscal year and this fiscal year, we did pass the Housing First <clears throat> Fund, which was risk mitigation, landlord incentive, and rapid rehousing. What's the status of those funds and could they not apply to this ordinance? So yeah, you're jumping over to our homeless services program and you're absolutely right. The city council funds rapid rehousing through our contractor Catholic Charities. And of that amount, $534,000, we set aside $100,000 as a risk mitigation pool to property owners who lease to formerly homeless individuals or families. Uh, to date, we have not had to access that risk mitigation pool. Uh, most of the rapid rehousing funding has been expended, especially because we use that resource to help displace tenants at the Nueva Vista fire a few months ago. And staff is preparing to come back to council. You, you've authorized another round of funding in your budget for, for that contract execution. Because we haven't accessed that risk mitigation pool, it would be the recommendation of staff that the full amount for this year be going to rapid rehousing dollars. Help with rent, in other words. So the decision to help with the apartments, that was a staff decision, correct? That was a staff decision, yes, when we informed the council that the property owner was dropping the relocation benefits in the moment, a week after the shelter. So we had to step in and help prevent some folks from becoming homeless. So is there any reason that funding could not be used? Because it's the same, both of these efforts are out of your department, correct? Yeah, if it was the desire of the council to create an incentive, there's several suggestions. One is we could expand access to the current risk mitigation pool to property owners who are accepting a voucher as well as homeless. I guess for me, it was like just knowing that the apartment fire, perfect appropriate use. If this is something else that we need to do to support, I mean, obviously this is an issue in our community or we wouldn't be talking about the anti-discrimination ordinance. I would want, and if there are some ways that the staff is thinking, let's incentivize it for those that may have um, this belief about who a Section 8 holder is and isn't, it might be a way to encourage additional participation. And I would completely want you to be exploring those options because if we're using it for one population, why wouldn't we use it for all the populations? We're trying to get people housed, regardless whether they're formerly homeless, they lost their apartment in a fire, or they've never accepted Section 8 vouchers. So, sure, if that was the direction of the council, we, when we come back with the rapid rehousing uh, contract for this year, we could speak to that. And so, well, with the funding, because my understanding in June of this last year, we authorized another $534,000. So, what's the status of that funds right now? That's the, Mayor, that's the contract I'm recommending that we come forward to, for execution with Catholic Charities. In June, we were looking at whether we should seek proposals for other operators to operate rapid rehousing, but now we see that they've expended the funds and we would be recommending that we resource Catholic Charities for another year with this. And would, because I, I think I asked this last time also, because that was, that was my understanding, those three buckets of way you could do it. So you had mentioned 100K was set aside for risk mitigation. It would be helpful for me to understand and see how those dollars have been spent you know, again, that return on investment because of these rapid rehousing dollars, we've housed X number of people. And I know we just got that updated report about, you know, last year we housed 301 folks. It'd be great to know, did that source, you know, the rapid rehousing dollars that this council approved successfully housed folks? Same thing with this land, if we choose to go with this landlord incentive, how effective is that? Is that enough to get more people participating in the Section 8 program? Okay, any additional questions? Go ahead, Ms. Fleming. 
Thank you. I do have one additional question, which is I'm wondering if you can give a really brief overview of the elements of the HQS the inspection program, about how long it takes and what an inspector is looking for. Sure. Uh, so the Housing Quality Standards Inspection is that those are the HUD standards for the program. Uh, it's a it's a pretty basic health and habitability inspection. So we're looking for safety issues, uh, broken windows, for example, uh, would have to be repaired. Um, uh, we're not looking at cosmetic issues. What we tell the tenants when we're going through our orientation is that if there's a, a, you know, a small stain on the carpet, we're not gonna care about that so much. You should care about that because you wanna protect your security deposit. But what we're looking for is gonna be a tripping hazard, a hole in the carpet that might present a danger to someone. So it is a basic health and habitability inspection and the um, elements of the inspection are the same across the program across the country, the forms and all of the standards are available online at any time. Thank you. And I did have one question for the city attorney. Is the way our, the ordinance is currently drafted, is it enforceable given the current state of case law in California? Uh, yes, it is. There have been uh, cases uh, recently that have affirmed very similar ordinances. Great, thank you. Okay, we have several cards on this item. So first up would be Sharon King, followed by Keith Becker. Thank you, Mayor, City Council. My name is Sharon King. I am the, pre, uh, the property manager at the Salvation Army Silver Crest Residence, 1053rd Street, Santa Rosa. And I'm here to share my experience with offering housing to housing voucher holders. Silver Crest is a 186 unit apartment community offering affordable and subsidized housing for senior households age 62 and above. 36 units are subsidized through the Housing Choice and BASH voucher programs. 144 units are project-based Section 8. The remaining six units are staff housing and market rate units. The arguments against renting to voucher holders, according to a recent article in the Press Democrat are, it represents an onerous contractual relationship with a government agency. Housing authority inspections cause delay in unit turnover and irresponsible tenants, you know, those people. My experience. This is my experience. The contract. The contractual relationship is really no more than a lease. At least, at least renewal time once a year, I receive a letter from the housing authority telling me what I will receive from subsidy and what I will receive from the tenant. Very rarely I receive a letter mid-year because the tenant situation has changed and um, causing a change in subsidy. The housing authority is allowed to uh, if I want to change the amount of rent, I give the housing authority 60 days notice and they pay according to their policies. About delayed inspections, I have never had to wait more than 10 days. When I get a 30 day notice to vacate, I let the housing authority know it's coming down the pike and I never have a delay. About voucher holders, we accept applications from all Section 8 voucher holders uh, but they must be eligible to live at Silvercrest in order to be put on our waiting list. This means in addition to age and income restrictions, they must have seven years of positive housing verifications, no violent criminal conditions, uh, convictions, no current use of illegal drugs, and no evictions in the last three years. We have a strict and robust tenant selection plan, which we apply to everyone without discrimination. We have an appeal process, which we apply to everyone without discrimination. We have, uh, and the appeal process has a third party look at the, uh, review the uh, application. Just because an applicant has a voucher, we don't automatically offer an apartment, nor does the housing authority require it. If we decide to terminate a lease due to residents' bad behavior, we advise the housing authority and they do what they do. There's no difference in the behavior of Silvercrest tenants between those who do and those who do not hold vouchers. Thank you. Thank you. Keith Becker, followed by Jeanette McFall.
Good evening. My surprise, surprise, attorneys are disagreeing with each other. Um, and um, our attorney does disagree with the concept that this is in compliance with state law because there is a question of whether it is compliant with established case law. That's item number one. Item number two is the concern that the passage of this ordinance could have foreseeable detrimental consequences that are not figured through in the way this has been written. Lastly, this is never about the applicants or the tenants. Um, in terms of an owner's property and private rights, the idea that this ordinance or any ordinance is going to tell an owner that they are forced to engage with a governmental agency is unfair and improper to property owners. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, Jeanette McFall followed by uh, Marlena Martarano. Hopefully you got a copy of the bundle of rights that I asked to be handed to each of you. Um, my name is Jeanette McFall. I'm a realtor. Part of the oath of my license is I swear to protect property rights. Forcing property owners to not consider source of income for rental property infringes on property rights. Real estate ownership carries with it a complex set of rights, and the bundle of rights concept has been traditionally been the way those rights are described. The bundle includes the following, the right of possession, the right of control, the right of inclusion, the right of enjoyment, the right of disposition. Any council member who chooses to ignore the bundle of rights does not belong on the city council. The property owners are also your constituents. Property owners fund the city of Santa Rosa. Please study the bundle of rights. A close study of the addition of source of income to housing anti-discrimination code clearly reveals conflicts with the bundle of rights. The word discrimination is used over eight times whereas. Webster defines discrimination as a distinction that is unfair in favor of the other side. It is the city of Santa Rosa who is proposing we discriminate against non-Section 8 renters by granting a preference to Section 8 renters, unfair in favor of the other side. The ordinance would prohibit landlords from considering source of income, including Section 8 vouchers and other rent subsidies. What other? Too vague. What else does the umbrella of source of income cover besides Section 8? Are used interchangeably throughout, yet by definition are not interchangeable. Source of income absent consideration of source could include found money, money borrowed from a stranger, gift money, two-party out-of-town checks. The list goes on an unreliable, untimely, and unverifiable source of income could result in adverse effects, saddled solely by the property owner. <clears throat> I argue that Section 8 is not income. It is a grant. It must, you must be low income to qualify for this taxpayer-funded gift. This gift is limited by what can be squeezed from the property owner whose bundles of rights are being squashed. The amount of this fund will decrease as property devalues inevitably as a result of this mandate. The supply could shrink as owners choose not to rent out to avoid the risk. Already, supply is already scarce, whereas, from the loss of approximately 5,000 homes from the fire. Instead, issue housing unit permits, streamline the rebuild for these folks that are trying to rebuild their homes faster. See Sunday's paper. It looks like the Santa Rosa officials <laughs> won over by a unique pitch to boost stock. Thank you for your time. Marlena, followed by Chad Bola. I'll make this for a short person. Push the button on the song. Okay, I'm just going to read this quickly, just have my three minutes. Uh, hello, Mayor Schwedholm, council members. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. My name is Marlena Martorano, and I'm a voucher recipient. When I first received my voucher, I was thrilled. Who wouldn't be? I knew discrimination in the workplace, but the discrimination in attaining housing took it to a whole new level, and it hasn't stopped there. September 15, 2015, council delayed a vote for an anti-discrimination ordinance. June 4, 2015, PD ran an article about a disabled man, his wife, and nine-year-old daughter's difficulty in using their voucher. He had had a heart attack and was on dialysis. 
95 horrible comments. In August 16th, 2018, similar article, a 75-year-old working woman having difficulty <coughs> finding a landlord willing to accept her voucher. 73 count comments. My voucher status was mentioned in a May 2017 article, 96 comments, I got the most. 94, 73, and 96 comments. Things such as were called feral humans, drug addicts, mental hoarders, prostitutes, gang bangers. Personal attacks on me when all I had done was put my own housing on the line and made myself publicly vulnerable for my fellow suffering renters. Actually feared for my personal safety. I really did. And words have consequences. To publicly advertise against a specific economic group, no Section 8, is a very poor reflection of what we've become. We need to start turning back the rhetoric, protecting the most vulnerable. We cannot continue to normalize this discrimination. We need not so much to know what is right and wrong, but to be reminded. That's what some of us are here today doing. And some of us believe we are holy. You are holy. Don't damage your holiness. For when one can harden one's heart, where empathy cannot be reached, it's because it no longer exists. We help ourselves as much as our vulnerable citizens, perhaps more so by passing this ordinance. Thank you so much for your time and listening. Thank you. Chad Bola, followed by Patty Goodwin. <clears throat> Mayor, council members, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. So uh, my name is Chad Bola. I am a tenant organizer with North Bay Organizing Project and also a member of the newly formed Sonoma County Tenants Union. And in my day-to-day -day work, I listen to tenant after tenant in crisis, fearful of being displaced. So we're here today to vote on the source of income anti-discrimination ordinance. Uh, I, I'd like to make an effort to, to simplify it a little bit. Uh, to me, the gist of this ordinance is that if it passes, landlords will not be able to openly advertise their discrimination against voucher holders. Let that sink in for a second. They can still discriminate, just not openly. So it's not a lot to ask for, in my opinion. We hear every day that we are in a housing crisis. We hear it from, we hear it everywhere we go, that California is in a housing crisis, right? If it is true that we are in a crisis, and it's true that there's 17 million, some 17 million renters in California, if it's true that we're in a crisis, then I suggest that we respond with urgency. Post focusing first on our most vulnerable residents, just as we would in any crisis situation. The passing of this ordinance will at the very least relieve some of the stress that families experience when facing the daunting experience of searching for secure housing in the midst of a statewide affordable housing crisis. Which is not a crisis for everyone, I recognize that. It's not a crisis for everyone and perhaps that's, that's why the road towards secure housing is a long one. So I urge you, uh, I urge you council members to, uh, to vote yes and pass this ordinance today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Patty Goodwin followed by Peter Chernoff. Hi there, my name is Patty Goodwin. We currently have 145 residents on housing voucher programs. A large number of them are excellent tenants, but when we have issues with a voucher tenant, they can become very problematic. I'd love to take more, but with the current program, it's burdensome. In the 1980s, early 1990s, the Section 8 voucher program was a great program for landlords. The city housing staff were exceptional in working with the voucher tenants as well as us landlords. For years now, it's been tough. We've experienced so many issues and the staff time needed to deal with problem voucher tenants has proven to be extensive compared to the non-voucher tenant problems. Tenants would rather move out than deal with the stress of a bad neighbor or fear of retaliation if they put their complaint in writing. 
The biggest hardship is placed on the good resident of our communities, the stress on our on-site management team uh, with problem tenants is also an, another big issue. Managers want to know that they have the support they need and not constantly threaten with litigation. They have tough jobs and it has been increasingly harder to keep good management teams because of the continual stress of layers of new laws, <clears throat> negative press and lack of support. Landlords don't ask good residents or tenants to move, voucher or otherwise. Landlords want to keep all the good tenants as long as possible. They become part of a community and they look out for and respect each other. Please focus on helping to make this program appealing to landlords. Appealing to me would be defined as a well-staffed voucher housing uh, team, because I'm, I'm wondering if we just even have enough staff available. Um, who work with landlords and residents on housekeeping, nuisance issues, and mutual respect. Two, we want an education program to instill the importance of being a good tenant, good neighbor, and appreciative of the program. Uh, maybe involve current successful housing voucher residents and landlords in education, educating new voucher recipients. Uh, a mediation program that is really a, a neutral third party that works with landlords and tenants. We used to have a local mediation organization scrims that really listened to landlords and the tenants and they were really successful at finding compromises everyone could agree on. I know of a lot of landlords that would support funding for a good mediation program. If the program was a partnership, landlords would participate. To coerce landlords and subject us to lawsuits would be a disservice to the rental property owners and especially other tenants. Thank you for your time and service to our community. Thank you. Peter Chernoff, followed by Caroline Peavy. Nice to see everybody. It's a beautiful day. Santa Rosa, it's beautiful. And to be beautiful is to be spiritually dutiful. I'm going to share, begin by saying I have great respect for all law enforcement and veterans that cherish the U.S. Constitution. For we're under martial law, dominated by military industrial complex, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, usurious bankers, and minions of bar association lawyers that run all three branches of government. That's called tyranny. Our right is to strike this system into submission. And as King once said, one man wrongfully incarcerated, so are we all. Leonard Peltier's been down 44 years. And I say any sentient is wrongfully incarcerated, so are we all. As is the U.S. Constitution, all sentient slaughterhouse bound, and the earth under the oil industry. I am Peter. I am here commanding action and truth. Now to blow the lid off mammon's roof. Welcome to the reservation, Russell Means. Highly recommended to view Russell Russell's welcome to the reservation. And so taking into account our current station, fires, plagues, earthquakes, and more, the vials poured out as found in Revelation. Have we been given even a clue as I speak from my heart to the hearts of you? Unto great spirit have we been true? Russell means start in the last Mohicans as the last. Biblically speaking, the last shall be first. That's how it's been cast. John Trudell spoke to be careful in this place as the demons will eat your spirit. Just who runs this world? Is it the one who now does sear it? As Leonard's been down 44 years, the whole world walks a true trial of tears. As King famously stated, one man wrongfully incarcerated, so be we all. The mother of all boycotts, yes, she be thee call. Those who genocided America's Indigenous also killed most all the buffalo. So who among you supports this ongoing slaughterhouse status quo? Are you among those complaining and gnashing your teeth? So who do you serve? Who be you asking for direction and relief? Bob Dylan, you gotta serve somebody, be it the devil or the living Lord, for only the living Lord has the authority to be laying down the sword. I am Peter, I am the brother from the East. The 40-day prophetic economic strike and all corruptions be ceased. I choose to serve Almighty. Veterans rocket red glare, bombs bursting in air, proving now that they could never heist. 
the true power and authority of Christ, as American warriors be now commanded to cease the freeze frame and freeze frame this system till every knee unto the earth be remanded, and the U.S. Constitution is free, and so too the children and the animals and the likes of you and me. Thank I you, say you, Caroline you here, Petey, followed by done. Al Liner. Caroline Petey. Members, I'm Carolyn Petey with Fair Housing Advocates of Northern California. We provide fair housing counseling, education, investigation, and enforcement services to the residents of Santa Rosa and Sonoma County. We submitted written comments both on August 13th and September 17th laying out our thoughts about the proposed ordinance. I believe this ordinance is one step to addressing Santa Rosa's housing crisis, preventing displacement of existing residents, and preserving affordable housing in the city of Santa Rosa as part of its comprehensive housing strategy. We wholeheartedly support such a fair housing ordinance and believe it's a crucial step to preserving affordable housing for the most vulnerable populations in the city who are protected under federal and state fair housing laws. We receive calls from Santa Rosa clients who allege discrimination in housing, but express fear in raising their concerns or permitting us to intervene for fear of retaliation. It's particularly true for individuals using housing subsidies because they are aware of the difficulties faced in locating new housing in Santa Rosa, particularly finding a landlord who's willing to accept their subsidy. Earlier this year, we conducted a systemic audit looking at the prevalence of race and source of income discrimination using housing choice vouchers. Our agency only tested properties whose advertisements did not make any re reference to Section 8. However, despite that fact we, uh, that we tested properties with seemingly neutral policies uh, toward housing choice vouchers, only two of the 10 paired investigations in the county included housing providers willing to consider vouchers. Eight of 10 housing providers responded they were unwilling to consider them, and their comments ranged from, we don't take Section 8, never done it before, and don't want to have to deal with the government, to no Section 8, but I don't know why, to we don't take Section 8 because we looked into it but discovered the complex doesn't qualify. On applicability, we strongly urge the city to have broad coverage that includes all rental properties with the exception of owner-occupied single-family homes where the owner is renting a room in the house to one individual, which is the only exemption from state fair housing law coverage. Uh, <clears throat> broad applicability will have the greatest effect uh, on Santa Rosa res re residents and is consistent with the majority of similar ordinances enacted in recent years. On third party actions, if aggrieved parties who can bring complaints are limited to the individual applicant who has alleged discrimination, this precludes the num small number of nonprofit fair housing organizations who conduct testing to bring any enforcement action. Enforcement of this ordinance will be limited and necessary poli policy changes un unlikely to occur. And renters with, I, I just want to say, we've been hearing discrimination is generally very difficult to prove, and someone who alleges discrimination may have no evidence that a violation has occurred aside from their word, which would not be sufficient evidence in court to bring a successful claim. And renters with vouchers are under extreme pressure to find housing quickly so as not to lose their subsidies. When they're told by landlords no Section 8, many do not have the time or the will to litigate, especially if the unit is already rented to someone you. else. Thank you. Thank Outliner, you for your time. Followed by Kevin Konasek. Is this on? I guess it is. <laughs> Say again? No, no I'm outliner. outliner first. Outliner. <laughs> then, then Kevin. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, encourage, really highly encourage the, uh, the city council to take up your staff's recommendation and pass this ordinance. Your staff recommended that. Please take that into consideration. I would also like to address something that Councilman uh, Sawyer seemed concerned with, and that is the third party. Um, you know, as, as a tenant, and being a tenant for the last 48 years, um, I have had no third party on my side unless I go and get an attorney or go to fair housing. On the other hand, landlords do have a third party, and it's called law enforcement. The law protects the landlords. If they want me to leave, my landlord wants me to leave, they can get the police to come in and remove me. I don't get, I don't have that luxury. Also, there seems to be a financial concern, and I understand that, I completely understand that, that landlords have a financial concern. 
they want to be able to, and the, the governor just signed a bill, that they can raise the rent 5% a year plus the cost of inflation, which is about 2%. So they can raise up to 7% a year. As a disabled veteran, I personally cannot afford that. I'm living, I live on a fixed income. By the way, I also want to say, I've heard many landlords talk about how great they are to their tenants, and I'm sure they are. I have no doubt about that, that there are some really, really, really good landlords out there. Nevertheless, they get to raise the rent at least 5% a year every year, every single year. That, that doesn't take into concern my financial burden. I understand that the landlords have a financial burden, but, but a renter's burden is never taken into consideration. All we're asking you to do is take up just a little bit our side. The other thing I want to say, there's 48% uh, of Sonoma County residents are renters, 48%. That's almost half. First of all, that's a lot of votes. Second of all, if, if this doesn't pass, if we keep discriminating against poor people, you're going to have a lot more homeless. Not a few more homeless, a lot more homeless. Anyhow, once again, please, please, please pass this bill. Take up your staff's recommendation and pass this bill. Thank you so much. Thank you. Kevin Conasek, followed by Sylvia Gallego. Mr. Mayor, members of the uh, council, thank you very much. I, I, Michelle Zaromsky and I have a law firm here in Santa Rosa. We do real property law, including uh, landlord-tenant law. We're not taking a position on this one way or the other, but it's just informational here. Um, and we do what litigation, you know, that's trial law. We do uh, transactional law, that's stuff before you say avoid trial stuff. And I'm just telling you, um, Ms. Gallagher, I think we're going to have a problem with this thing, with the Sabi uh, Sterling case. And you know what I'm talking about. So we're going to advise our clients to that. We have a great relationship uh, with Rebecca and Dave in the house, and we deal with them all the time. But it's, it's something, Section 8, we recommend to our clients all the time, our landlord clients. We say, go for Section 8. But what they're telling us, and I think if you list, listen to Patty Goodwin, she said, well, if it's so great, why is, why is, why are everybody saying, no, I don't want to do it? And, and, and Rebecca, what I'm going to say is, we need to administer this a little better. It needs to be a little stricter. You know, because that was the idea. It was a conservative idea with Jack Kemp did this. It's a great idea, but we need to administer a little bit. Transactional side. I will tell you, we have clients have tens of millions of dollars who want to invest in Sonoma County, and with the state rent control and this SB 329, they're pulling out. They're pulling out. Read the Press Democrat uh, editorial. You guys are advocates to our representatives in Sacramento. Please tell them this is counterproductive. It's all counterproductive. If we want housing, I've seen all these nice people here holding up their signs. They want housing, housing's a right, all this stuff and everything. But you're not going to get housing if you don't have investors to do housing. Kevin, just respond to your, you're talking to the council, please continue. No, that's it. That, I, I think that's it. But I just, I just think my comment is I think we're being counterproductive. I know we don't agree. Some of us don't agree on this council, but I'm just I'm just saying, if you want housing, what you're doing here with the rent control and this thing, you're not going to get it because my clients from Denver, from New York, from elsewhere, they're all pulling out. So that's it. Just a little piece of advice. Great. Thank, Thank you, you. Sylvia Gallego, followed by Jamie Mitchell. Is Sylvia in the house? Oh, guess no. Jamie Mitchell, followed by Anita LaFollette. Hi, I'm Jamie Mitchell. Um, Sylvia Gallego decided not to speak. Um, thank you for your time this afternoon. It's a really important issue for everyone. Um, and I guess I just want to approach it 
from a different perspective uh, than if we're talking about investors pulling out and this and that. Uh, there's more than just the profit motive. There's people that need help. And, um, you know, having been a resident of Sonoma County and Santa Rosa largely for 40 years, um, I've seen a lot of different anti-discrimination um, resolutions, policies, whatever you want to say, that uh, wouldn't get passed and wouldn't get passed and wouldn't get passed. Um, you know, uh, gay rights, you know, different kinds of things. Some of the things uh, in housing that Julie Combs has um, uh, spoke about in her time. And I understand that um, as, a, as a, a former business person, I'm retired now, that landlords need to make a profit, a reasonable profit. Um, and I don't think anybody is against that. But when almost half of the people are renting in Sonoma County, and a lot of those people can barely afford the rent, um, something's out of whack. And we know that's happening in pretty much every city in the country that has any kind of a more thriving economic um, temperature. So I want to urge you to pass this because it's really the very least that we can do. And I know that uh, your staff wouldn't have recommended it um, if, the, and if they thought that it wasn't, you know, the right thing to do and that it didn't protect some of the very, uh, the ones of us who have the very least protections. Um, and I don't think we need to be as afraid if we're the landlord uh, or if we're a developer um, of being able to make a fair profit. Obviously, that hasn't been a problem in housing in Sonoma County. The problem is on the other end. Um, I also had a Section 8, uh, Section 8 tenant in my home, uh, and it was someone I knew, and they did the inspection very quickly, the agency. Um, you know, we knew what we had to do. There were, there were no problems, and there were no problems when it was time for, you know, this tenant to move on. Um, and so I just would urge you to do the right thing here and not give in to um, all the overly cautious statements and fear-mongering. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, if you want to hold up, Anita, um, I'll call first uh, Irma Garcia, who needs some translation services first, and because our translator has some time challenges. So Irma Garcia, followed by Anita LaFollette. Thank you, all of you, for having an interpreter. Pero no solo eso, sino por también respetar los seis minutos. Uh, but not all of that also, uh, to, to have the respect for the six minutes. Cuando ustedes hacen esto, eh, para mí es um, que me abres las puertas, que soy bienvenida. When you do this, I feel like you do open the door for me, you welcome me. Pero no solo para mí, sino toda la comunidad inmigrante e indocumentada que tenemos en el condado de Sonoma. Not just me, but all the immigrant community and indocu undocumented that we have here in uh, the Sonoma County. Mi nombre es Irma García. Soy parte de Immigrant Defense Task Force. Uh, my name is In Irma García, and I'm part of a Immigrant Defense Task Force. Immigrant Defense Task Force. Immigrant Defense Task Force. Thank you. And BOP. No tengo palabras para decirles lo avergonzada que me siento ahorita en esta reunión. I have no words to tell you that I'm very shameful here at this uh, meeting. No puedo creer todos ustedes que representan este condado no cuiden a sus ciudadanos. I cannot believe that all of you that represent all the citizens cannot care of all your citizens. ¿Qué se espera de nosotros los inmigrantes indocumentados? What do you expect from us, the undocumented immigrants? Por dos años, durante los juegos, ustedes no tienen ni idea de cómo vive nuestra comunidad inmigrante indocumentada. For two years during the fires, you have no idea how the undocumented community lives. 
Pero creo que sus ciudadanos y ustedes están peor que nosotros. But I think that your own citizens are in a worse place than us. Siento mucha tristeza por todos ustedes. I feel sad for all of you. Nuestra comunidad inmigrante indocumentada no les pide nada. Solamente quiere respeto, dignidad y un lugar donde vivir. Our undocumented uh, immigrant community, I'm not, we're not asking for anything from you, just asking for respect and a decent place to live. Pero de la manera que tratan a sus ciudadanos, creo que mejor voy a ocupar ese lugar que tú tienes. But the way you're treating your own citizens, I think I would have to occupy the place where you are. Pero como no aceptan inmigrantes indocumentados, tal vez tendré que quedarme aquí. But since you don't uh, accept undocumented immigrants, I guess I'm going to have to stay here. Por eso es mejor quedarse callados. That's why sometimes it's better to be quiet. Pero no es justo y no es la solución. But it's not just, it's not the solution. Es tiempo de tomar responsabilidad. It's about time to take responsibility. Es tiempo de cuidar a tus ciudadanos. It's time to take care of your own citizens. Y nuestra comunidad inmigrante indocumentada está aquí para ayudar. And our undocumented immigrant community, we're here to help. Falta dinero. ¿Qué es más importante, el dinero o tus ciudadanos? There is a lack of money. What's more important, money or your own citizens? ¿Qué estás haciendo ahí sentado? Es tiempo de cambiar el sistema. What are you doing just sitting there? It is time to change the system. Es tiempo de tomar responsabilidades. It is time to become responsible. Si realmente tomamos esto en serio, podemos hacer mucho dinero juntos. If we take this seriously, we all together can make lots of money. ¿Están de acuerdo conmigo? Do you agree with me? Raise your hands if you are agree with me. Todos juntos podemos hacer cambios. We all together can make that change. Es tiempo, no dejemos más. This is the time. Let's not wait. Y este minuto que me queda. And this minute that is left. Necesito estar en silencio. I need to take it in silence. Porque mi corazón de verdad. No sé en quién confiar. Because in my heart. I don't know who to trust. Thank you, Anita LaFollette, followed by Paul Carroll. I wanted to uh, talk about, you said that we're to define an aggrieved person as one that's uh, discriminated against. And um, I think this issue is really about our inability to, in fact, enforce the discrimination that's already been going on. Discrimination is a human rights violation. We've heard from people here today who have evidence of it. Maybe you could go to the source and just follow through on a couple of discriminations that you've heard about and get to the bottom of 
what that would mean for our community to actually no longer discriminate. Fair housing is not in our town. I think it's the offices in San Francisco. So you could have gotten a better review even if you had asked CDC to come in and tell us how they're doing with those vouchers. I understand there's 50% given out. That means that's only 250 left. And there's 3,000 people on the street that are homeless. So it's kind of a spit in the dark, isn't it? Um, what good are you gonna do to take up all of our time? As a matter of fact, it seems to me that we have a leadership committee and a TAC committee. The people on the TAC committee are very informed about homelessness and housing situations also. They can probably tell you the numbers of people who really do have vouchers and the numbers of people who are really discriminated against. And then you'd get some real information to make your decision on instead of trying to leave it up to us who you're not gonna listen to anyway. So I suggest that you do some research. Actually, you're on the leadership committee, aren't you? Mr. Swedham? Yeah. You are on the leadership committee and I think Ms. Combs is on one too. So you are have you have a lot of people around you that know the answers to a lot of these questions. But discrimination has been going on for a long time. You're not going to solve the housing program by following through on this. It's a shot in the dark. Thanks for your time. Paul Carroll, followed by Daniel Weinsvig. Mayor Schwelthelm and members of council. Um, the, the, you know, a lot of the property owners here don't want anything to infringe upon their rights. Um, the concept of putting any kind of strictures on pro property didn't really start until probably the 1970s. And it came about because a lot of people who own property were doing things that impacted society. You know, like the Love ca Canal, like the toxic bloom on Sebastopol Road, the toxic bloom under the building on Airway Drive that Hewlett Packard left to us. Um, those are the key kind of things that property owners thought they had the right to do. And, I, and what occurred was politicians, like you, got the political will to put controls on what people could do with their property. And what you need to do now is have the political will to take this small step, and it is a small step, because right now, a property owner would probably take a client or you know, a potential tenant who's paying 50% of their income towards rent rather than a voucher tenant who would be paying 30% of their income towards rent because they have this bugaboo about dealing with the government. Um, and it's a bugaboo. And some of it's partisan. So you have to have the political will. The other aspect is you're not asking the landlords to take less rent. You're just asking them to not discriminate against people who have vouchers and other sources of income, you know, like SSDI and various uh, other things that, that matter. So, you know, again, this is not that big a lift. It's not gonna throw, you know, property owners under the bus. It's not gonna stop development because, you know, the whole rent control issue that they talk about doesn't apply to new construction. So it's, you know, it's not a real valid arg argument. And this isn't a real value arg, you know, it's not a real arg argument as well. So please move forward with this so that 
more voucher people might be able to get housed and at least get screened as tenants. It's not gonna make, make them get the place, but at least the people will be screened. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel Weinzweig, followed by Mike Mullins. Daniel still here. Looks like he's left. Mike Mullins, followed by Irene Nichols. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon, council members. Um, my name is Mike Mullins. I'm representing Legal Aid of Sonoma County today. Ms. Rubinoff uh, asked me to express her desire to be here, but she was unable to be here. Uh, we serve every year about 600 low-income clients who have disabilities and many with Section 8 vouchers who find it very difficult to obtain housing with those vouchers. I'm probably stating the obvious, so I'm going to digress from my prepared remarks and try to answer Council Member Combs' question, which I believe, if I'm correct, was whether or not the discrimination under this proposed ordinance would be more difficult to prove than discrimination under other ordinances. And the answer is no, it would not be more difficult, in my opinion. However, we must be clear that discrimination of any sort is not easy to prove. Rarely do you have the smoking gun of the person who says, oh no, you're Section 8, or no, no, you're colored, and I simply won't rent to you. It is difficult to prove. And a lawsuit under the strictures of this ordinance would not be easily brought, nor would it not be done without forethought and consideration. Litigation is expensive, as I'm sure Mr. Konasek would tell you. And therefore, we don't want to do it willy-nilly, if you will. But it is a tool, a tool to be used. Frankly, I think most business persons represented by the people I've heard here are as I, I believe business persons are, which is risk averse. And that means you don't want to take a chance on discriminating under this particular ordinance. And therefore, perhaps, perhaps more people could use their Section 8 vouchers. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Irene Nichols, followed by Kate Gropeltazar. Uh, this is not a shot in the dark. This ordinance will help people like me who have been on Section 8 since a health crisis. Before that, I was earning income, paying rent, teaching in your school system, and then I applied and eight years later I got my voucher. I've used it for just several years. It has been extremely easy and all the landlords have loved it, the few I could find to accept it. But I can't get my foot in the door. I had to leave the fall of the fires because my voucher was running out and I couldn't find housing here. I've been back since May 28th, four months, I can't get my foot in the door. This is me with my voucher. Another landlord. Another landlord. Another landlord. All of them. They want cash. They don't want to pay the government. I've been given something by the federal government that the local government is tying my hands with. I am so grateful for it. I do need it now in my life, but I can't use it. Craigslist and everywhere, no Section 8 allowed. I just want that phrase to be gone so I can get my foot in the door. I know they could still discriminate against me, but let me get my foot in the door. These are, these are the new homeless people on the street and in one month my voucher will end and I will be on the street too. Ex-school teacher, plenty of income to pay until a health crisis. Section 8 has been wonderful. I can't use it. I don't want to go leave like I did when the fires came and go to another county just because I could find a great rental and fortunately a landlady who would take it. But I had no friends there, no activities. It's not my home there. I have one month left. 
There's a lot of reasons they say no to us. They will still discriminate against me. Perhaps they'll take someone else. But let me get rid of that phrase I read, no section eight taken. I've watched those ads stay on Craigslist. I could have been in there. I have great references. It's sure discrimination. I don't know what I'm gonna do in a month. I don't even look in the city. I look in the county. My voucher is for the county. I wish the county would pass a law, but I'm here today because I know all these other potential tenants on the city voucher need support from you. And eventually, hopefully, the county would pass something too. Thank you. Thank you. Kate Grobel-Tazar, followed by Lisa Badenfort. I'm Kate Grobel-Tazar. Um, I own my home. I own two other properties. I volunteer on two HOA boards. As many of you know, nowadays, well, it seems to me that if I want to buy a house that I can afford in Sonoma County, it needs to be mass produced because to buy a house that isn't mass produced is probably a third as much money again of the same size. So I have bought my homes in HOAs and on the board that I serve, uh, on, on both of them, um, what I constantly hear from the neighborhood is there's people who are renting out their houses and they're renting them out to so many people that it's making it hard for us to park our cars. It's making it hard for us to have reasonable quiet during certain hours. And it's hard for the board and HOA board in that context to keep the neighborhood nice. I couldn't disagree with anything that I have heard other people here saying about discrimination and human rights I don't disagree with any of that. But I also feel like as a homeowner and also as a landlord of two, two small properties, that it's hard to keep those properties, which I care about, it's expensive to keep them nice. My tenants love me because I'm willing to go into debt to reside the house. And I can promise you that the rent that I get doesn't cover that. I'm willing to put in a new driveway. I, one of my buildings is quite old and that's the building that I'm thinking of. And this is a complicated issue and landlords are not mean people. I'm a very nice person and I've worked hard to be where I am. And I feel like the rights on both sides of this equation need to be protected. That's all I'm saying. I don't disagree that these people have concerns that are valid, but I think that the landlords do too. And it made my heart bleed to listen to the previous speaker. I'm almost like I almost started crying listening to her. But you know, I'm also somebody who has um, an interest and who the community expects me as a landlord to try to keep the neighborhoods nice. And I can't do that for nothing. I can't do that for free. I'm not opposed to Section 8 vouchers if, if the money were there. I've never had an applicant who was a Section 8. I've never turned anyone away. I've never been in that situation. But I think that it needs to be clear that the landlord matters too. Thank you. Lisa Badenfort, followed by Alex Coffin. Good evening. Thank you, Lisa Badenfort. Public Affairs Director, North Bay Association of Realtors, representing 3,600 real estate professionals, homeowners, property managers, and housing providers in Sonoma County. Thank you for your ongoing attention to housing availability and affordability and for engaging the owners over these past weeks. The task before you is not simple, and we appreciate the engagement. This proposal does, however, return to you with very little change. And as you consider next steps, we hope that you can help address questions in a couple of primary areas. Many of you who have actually already inquired about them and recognized. Um, 
how can owners clearly and confidently select amongst tenants given the almost unlimited circumstances that they consider? It does remain murky and it feels risky, especially when we have a very tense tenant landlord relationship in the city of Santa Rosa. How can the city help monitor and safeguard owners from unwarranted litigation? Please revisit any program that you develop here today or in the future um, to look at trends in litigation that might come. A lot of it is, is assumption and fears and what is the reality, data is our friend. There is a loss of income, even if it's 15 days, if it's three months, if it's, two, if it's 15 days, it isn't nothing. I think that there's an assumption that anybody who owns property can easily shoulder an extra $200 a month, an extra $400 a month. At 15 days, for a fair market rent three bedroom unit, it's $1,320 of no rent. Just to put that out there. Throughout this process, staff has acknowledged the need for landlord education and engagement to address, to address the concerns that are very clear that, that still remain with ordinance such as these. The arguments are the same. In other jurisdictions who have passed ordinances that look like this, the, partner, the landlord partnership programs that result from them look similar because the concerns, not based on tenants and the morality and the value of human beings, but of the real consequences and costs that accompany this kind of public policy. Unfortunately, approaching this issue with a murky policy and enhanced lit litigation exposure will not take us to the tenant provider relationship we all are looking for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alex Kaufman, followed by Adrian Lobby. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Alex Kaufman with the California Apartment Association. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and speak to you on this item again. Um, I first would like to acknowledge staff and their effort in reaching out to stakeholders. Uh, during a last meeting, one of our main concerns was the lack of outreach and um, I assure you that that was done this time around. We got to know them quite well. Um, you know, as I'm standing here listening, um, what it really comes down to is this idea that it's all about profit. And quite frankly, it's not really about profit. What this ordinance does, it, it mandates acceptance and participation in the program without quite frankly providing the resources that it really needs to be successful. You heard from a couple of our members today who actually participate in the program. They have serious concerns, legitimate concerns. And I think both sides have issues that need to be resolved. Um, but to say that it's all about profit, it's not really helpful. Um, as Lisa mentioned, this ordinance came back and while to be truthful, it did address some of our concerns, the majority of it is quite similar to what you saw last month. It still lacks what I think um, are really important incentives and risk mitigation measures. I do think that you've, you've heard some reasons to have those programs. I understand that it, that might be outside of today's discussion, but I do encourage you, should you move forward to really consider coming back and having a serious discussion of what that may look like. Some of the fears may be addressed if you have a robust program that will help landlords to, that will that will participate. <clears throat> to my last point really has to do with SB 329. And as we're sitting here discussing this today, this bill is on the governor's desk. And I'm not sure there's anyone in here that thinks it's not going to get signed. There will be a baseline protection from the state that is going to reach Santa Rosa. And I think if you really want to assess how how this ordinance or this bill will impact the city, you, you can still do that. Assess it in six months, assess it in 12 months, bring it back, look at what's working, look at what's not working. There could be an opportunity to have an honest discussion and say, well, these are some serious concerns that the state did not see. Let's address that. I think I'm running out of time here. Um, looking forward to working with the city, Whichever way this decision goes tonight, I think this is a 
relationship that is going to have to continue to improve. Uh, there are currently many policies in play at the state level that have significant impact on housing supply, and I think we should take that into account. Thank you. Thank you. Adrian Lobby, followed by Judith I am. My name is Adrian Lobby. I'm a uh, co-founder of Homeless Action. I was looking for an apartment, and I called, and the person on the other end of the line said, are you calling for your father? Are you, are you calling for your husband? No, I, we don't rent to single mothers. We don't rent to single women. You have to call for your son. You have to live with your son if you want to live here. Or then I was calling for an apartment, and they said, no, we don't rent to Jews. And then they said, we don't rent to Negroes. And I went through the centuries and I went through the countries and I found all the ways that people find to be mean to each other based on some perception. Oh, I had a tenant who was poor. They were terrible tenants. So then I decided I won't rent to any more poor people. This is just discrimination. And I, I'm really sh rather shocked at the number of landlords who are willing to come up and say, yep, I do it. I discriminate. I take some experiences I had and I lay them on top of a bunch of people. And I advertise for it. I put it in Craigslist. I put it in the Press Democrat when I advertise for my rentals. This is kind of embarrassing, really. We're not asking, this ordinance is not asking people to join anything, to accept particular people. It's just saying, don't discriminate. Look at people's references, talk to them, decide whether you want to rent to them or not. But don't, in fact, you can't discriminate on the grounds of where their income is coming from. I maybe wouldn't be here tonight, except that we have homeless action meetings and people regularly come, like somebody, some of the people you've heard tonight, who say, I have a voucher. This could make such a difference for me and I'm gonna to have to turn it in because I can't find a house. And whether this is a homeless person or someone who is home but paying 60, 70% of their income for rent, it's just heartbreaking over and over again a wide variety of people, people who is obvious would be good tenants. So I just want to urge you, our organization wants to urge you, pass this ordinance. Thank you. Judith, I am followed by Thomas Ells. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council people, fellow citizens. I have been both a homeowner in Sonoma County and a renter. And there is no doubt in my mind which is easier. Despite what it takes to keep a property and possible renters in it nice and in, in a good way, it is nothing compared to what it takes to find a rental that suits you or that suits me. The supply and demand has gotten outrageous. The prices and the affordability are daily in the news. The crisis has been mentioned by previous speakers. So what your task is here tonight is whether to support one side or the other. Political will needs to be with the people who need it the most. It's a pretty low bar because we've established that discrimination is challenging to, uh, to come to a judgment on. I, I want to finally just say that the HUD numbers were in the tens of thousands. I believe it was about 23,000 people were on that list, all now gone and down to 500. And I'm, I, I understand that of the 500, actually, there will be only 300 vouchers granted. So the discrepancy is almost laughable, 300 versus 23,000 people. And we're asking for support for 300 people. 
surely that should be granted without much more airtime or deliberation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thomas, Thomas Ells. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and for addressing this issue with the council. I just wanted to remind everyone again, we're talking about discrimination and this is discrimination I think that uh, Adrian mentioned quite rightly is uh, the landlords are acknowledging that they are doing. Uh, and I wanted to remind you that Kathleen Kane was here the last time we were talking about this and, and she talked about the income discrimination, uh, aid to families with dependent children and all those kinds of things that were income that were corrected by the law. And those are corrected. You cannot discriminate against those kinds of income, an income that comes from another source of a, of a, of a divorcee, for instance, that comes in uh, alimony and those kinds of income. They cannot be discriminated against and they have to rent to that person who would have otherwise been rented to. I mean, they have not discriminated against that person for some other reason. Um, and what we're talking about here is that just the definition of what income is because the Section 8 doesn't count as income itself. If it counted as income, then then you couldn't discriminate against it. It would already be uh, against the law to discriminate against that. And I hope that you do add the Section 8 as a definition of income here. You would have to do that, I think. Uh, otherwise, they could say, if you just said you can't discriminate against Section 8 income, it's not income, so they couldn't be discriminating against it because it's not income. So you have to deal with that definitionally there. I want to point out that there's Normally, within the market, as we know, we've talked about it here before, 5% normal vacancy rate. 5%, that would be that would be a full 10 weeks, I think. Is that right? No, it would be a full, it would be, uh, excuse me, 10% uh, would be five weeks. It would be at least two and a half weeks of vacancy uh, in a normal renting period, at least two and a half weeks of normal vacancy and, and I think people are saying they can't stand that. Well, the reason they don't want that is because they want to price the properties without any normal vacancy rate in it, which would increase the amount of income that you could count towards, towards the price or value of the property, and they don't want to do that. Uh, and when we return to normal vacancy, they'll complain about that. No, you can't have those houses because we can't have a normal vacancy rate of 5%. And I wanted to point out also that uh, for the uh, the risk mitigation pool that you have for the for the rapid rehousing is that if you were to align those two programs, if you would, for this and that, there's so many more people that have the large amount of vouchers is that uh, you would have to increase the size. Thank of you, Thomas. Thank you. All right, bring it back to council. Any additional questions for staff? Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. I just want some clarification on that risk mitigation pool. Um, Mr. Gwynne, is it? did I hear you say that it would not be, those sums would not be available until fiscal uh, 2021? No, I'm sorry if I was confusing. That risk mitigation pool exists today. It's in your homeless service program. If you wanted to include it to be for property owners of vouchers, we can certainly do that. We're gonna be in front of you within a month on the new round of funding and so we can make that adjustment then. Okay, I think that's what I had, what I was, what I was missing. Because I think that is, having, being able to offer incentives I think is, is um, uh, really important to mitigate some of the, the concern and the fear of, um, of our landlords. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, why don't we then uh, start with Ms. Combs, you have this item, let's get a motion and a second, then we'll have discussion. Yeah, I have this item and I am pleased to bring it forward. Thank you for the opportunity to bring this. Um, we've been working really hard as a community on the three Ps, on preservation, protection, and production. With housing, you have to work on all three Ps. Uh, I think we've done a remarkably good job on really moving production elements forward. Uh, and I appreciate my colleagues who have really worked hard on production issues. Um, 
appreciate that we are now talking about the, some of the tenant protection issues. Um, and I'm hoping that before I make the motion, I can add, um, I am interested in having the risk mitigation pool come back um, with the, you had mentioned that it might come back in about a month. I think that's a good idea. There were some, there's within the documents we've gotten for public comment, the uh, Fair Housing Associates of Northern California have some suggestions with regard to um, penalties or consequences. Um, it might be reasonable for us to look at what they're recommending there, but I am not moving it with this item, uh, thinking that that might come back in the future also. So let me move. Uh, the ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending Title 10 of the City of Santa Rosa Code by adding Chapter 10-46 Housing Anti-Discrimination Code prohibiting housing discrimination based on source of income, including Section 8 housing choice vouchers. I'd like to insert here that to make it clear that we are including Bosch, the V-A-S-H vouchers. So comma, Bosch vouchers, comma, and other rent subsidies and waive further reading of the text. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, who would like to make some comments? Ms. Fleming. Thank you very much. And I do appreciate everybody who came out to speak on this issue. One of the reasons I'm in support of this is that it benefits our city when our resources that come in through the federal government can be deployed in a timely fashion before they're disappeared. And it also benefits our city when we can get people housed and um, in a stable manner. It is a drain on our resources when people cannot access housing. Just because discrimination is inconvenient to enforce does not relieve us of our duty to try to enforce it. Landlords at present have many things that they cannot discriminate against, and I'm not convinced that this change, this additional thing that they could not discriminate against is so onerous um, as to outweigh the benefits of passing this ordinance. No one is compelled to own property. It is a choice to be a landlord. It is not a choice to need housing. Housing is a human right. All investments carry risk. When a landlord decides that they want to be an investor in something and commodify something that is a human right, they accept this risk. And one of the risks, and this is true of both populations that receive housing vouchers and the rest of us who don't, is that there are crappy tenants all over the world. And I'm sorry for the landlords who um, have to deal with that, and I'm very interested in a mitigation pool. I want you to be supported in your provision of housing in our community, and I do thank you for that. However, I do believe that the uh, overwhelming good to our community outweighs the risk on your investment. Anyone else like to make comments? Ms. Alvarez? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you to staff for the presentation and thank you for reaching back out to stakeholders and, and getting the information that you can. Uh, it's sad when we see this as coming, to, coming together as sides because it really isn't about sides. We're talking about real people here. And I don't believe that Section 8 vouchers define who people are. Uh, but, and it's also not a small step in my eyes, uh, having dealt with uh, discrimination in the past. Uh, I think any time we take some kind of an action to eliminate discrimination of any kind is a big step. Uh, is it easy to enforce? Absolutely not, and I know that. Uh, it will be difficult. But I think that we, we can do something with this. We can be a leader in this. This is, again, this has to do with discrimination. This is actual, uh, somebody thinking about saying, no, I'm not gonna rent to you because of your source of income. Uh, landlords will still have choices. They'll, they still have the ability to do what they've always done as far as doing the background checks that they've done uh, to try to approve the best possible person for that, for that spot. Uh, but I think it does kind of even things out when people have an equal opportunity to be, to be considered for rental housing, especially some of our most vulnerable families. But I think with this is going to come more education. There has to be more education, even to 
uh, landlords and property owners to really understand what, what, what rental assistance is. Not, I don't believe that everybody really truly understands what it is and what the processes are. It's like other things, when we talk about it, it becomes a dirty word and we're afraid of it, but it, sometimes it's because we don't know what it is. Uh, and likewise, I think we also uh, need to educate our community about what this ordinance is gonna be about as well, uh, because we have seen the no section eight in the ads. And I think as part of our education, we need to counter with that with our own ads as far as it, providing information about what we've done here in Santa Rosa. Uh, hopefully other communities in the county will begin to consider this. Uh, off the bat, I think uh, some easy ways for us to start out reaching out to some of our residents is uh, the advertising inside of our city bus, for example. I think there's other places where we can provide information about uh, this new ordinance to educate the community that it does exist. Uh, but uh, I, I wholeheartedly support this, um, this, this new ordinance. Thank you. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So two of the striking comments that I heard during public comment, uh, one was from Mr. Mullen who talked about how risk averse uh, business folks uh, tend to be in, in, in particular landlords. And the other one was from uh, Lisa with the Apartment Association talking about the tense relationship that we have in Santa Rosa right now that's between landlords and tenants. And one of the things that I've, where my questioning was, was a little bit of clarity because I do feel like a lot of the landlords that I talk to are trying to do things the right way. And so the only concern that I have in this is some of the landlords who are trying to do it the right way and end up finding themselves in this situation where they are in litigation for having made a determination that they thought they were giving the unit to the correct person, not making a judgment based on their Section 8. So I'm gonna be supportive of the ordinance going forward, but I do wanna make sure that we do have an opportunity to come back maybe a year from now to look at what the actual practical impact has been both on getting folks into their actual uh, housing and utilizing the vouchers, as well as what has happened on the litigation side to see if there's a way that we can provide a little bit more clarity or if that ended up being a non-entity. So I am gonna suggest, if I can, um, in addition to the motion, to bring back some of that data a year from now for discussion from the city council, as well as I am also fully in favor of expanding our risk mitigation pool to uh, incorporate uh, some of the lost uh, income potential and whatnot, particularly as it pertains to the city's side of trying to get these units uh, approved and up and running, because that is an actual practical impact, even if folks are doing it the right way. Uh, and, and I'd feel more comfortable if we could have the whole motion, because I do think that it is a package overall on how we're trying to both release that tension between landlords and tenants, while also trying to make sure that we have a package of tools that actually get people housed when they need help being housed. May I clarify what you're asking? Yes. Um, you are not asking for a sunset, but you Correct. are asking for a review Correct. in a year. Yes. With data. Yep. Okay, I don't have a problem incorporating that in the motion. Are you asking that the risk mitigation pool not wait the month? Uh, I'm, I'm asking for us to, we can have a more broad discussion about that in a month, but when this ordinance goes into effect until the council makes the, the decision not to go forward with that change, if we could, that it, it's a, a permissive at the moment, that it's, we'll do this for now, and if we choose to change it later, we can change it later, but for now, I'd like to make sure that uh, once the ordinance is active and landlords begin to, to go through that process, that they have access to the risk mitigation pool. I have some concerns about the details of the risk mitigation pool, um, which is why I was happy to wait the month. Um, I don't have a problem saying that we want to move a risk mitigation pool forward, but I would like us to have some review of the details of the risk mitigation pool. Absolutely happy to okay. still have that discussion in a month. I just want to make sure okay. that in that meantime, I don't have a problem with covered. saying, yeah, we're going to we're going to move forward a risk mitigation pool. Cool. Is that all right with my second, Mr. Oliveris? It, in under those circumstances, then I think we should also bring back the uh, questions ab uh, about the um, consequences of not moving, of, of being found to be discriminatory. Um, would you have a problem with that? There, there was a discussion in the materials we were provided that we haven't gone into in detail. 
Um, so I would expect either within the month or within the one year period that we would bring back discussion about that also. Does that make sense? Are you trying to include that in your original motion or can we handle that as a separate motion? Well, I'm... If he's including a bundle of these packet things, I'm saying, okay, let's go ahead and do the whole packet. Um, well, so I'm saying, let's review again the, the, the sort of penalties dis as discussed. And, and uh, from my perspective, I'm, I'm fine with that. It seems like the one year review period is an opportunity for us to look at this, what the data is, and see whether or not the enforcement tools right. were sufficient and I think uh, as that's, well. And I'm happy for this, this penalties conversation at the uh, FHA of Northern California has a paragraph in their materials where they make some recommendations with regard to changing penalties. What I am suggesting is that when it comes back in a year, that we've done a review of core issues and other things, that we include their discussion with regard to penalties based upon their letter. I, I wanted to say that I'm not sure if, if we, this needs to go as part of the motion. I think giving staff direction and just come back to us with an update on the ordinance because there's so many other things that I would want to know or may want to know as the, that year comes up. For for example, how do we do on education? How you know there's so many other right. aspects. There's of many this. elements. There. So I think that just giving direction that we get a report back in a year on how this the implementation of this ordinance has gone and all the other things that I think that they heard tonight related to concerns. So what I'm hearing is that we're separating off Mr. Rogers' items and they are not part of the ordinance moving forward, but that they are staff direction. Right. That, okay. I, my preference would be that it be staff direction to come back with some okay. updates on the ordinance. Then I consider any of the items mentioned by Mr. Rogers to not be, based upon the conversation with my second, to not be a part of the ordinance itself, but to be staff direction. I, I believe that when uh, the new council gets the information that this is coming back, that you're going to want to give dire direction to staff about some of the things you want to see, because there may be new things that come up along the way that you may have an interest in. I, and I'm, I'm, I agree with you. So um, I would go back to my original motion um, and uh, encourage that staff bring back um, the pool in a month and the um, the other two items, the uh, data about uh, how it's going on, how it's working out in court and in uh, the penalties in a year. But that's recommendations as direction to staff. Well, and council always has the, um, we have processes to get things on the agenda and next year I'll still be mayor and this would be of interest to me too, whether it be a year or at some point as things are evolving. So I think it's the, I think you're hearing the intent. Um, so let me first go back are to you. Are you okay? Are, are you okay not including that in the original motion? Uh, my preference is to have it in the, in the motion, in particular, the risk mitigation pool portion of it. Um, I think that there is a strong intent for us to do this review in a year. I'd like a little bit of certainty around that, but certainly the risk mitigation pool, I wanna make sure that folks who are especially out there doing this uh, in the beginning do feel like that they are covered as well. I'd like to ask the city attorney a question. If we mentioned today that we want to include the risk mitigation pool, um, What's the time frame for uh, having that be available? Is it, it, this ordinance takes another reading and then 30 days? Correct. And in, within that time period, we have the conversation about the risk mitigation pool. If we amend the risk mitigation pool within 30 days anyway, is, does that amendment take place immediately or does that amendment also have to be delayed? It depends a little bit in the way that you craft um, the, um, the risk mitigation pool, but um, currently it has been established by resolution. So if you amend um, that 
um, program to expand to uh, landlords in this situation, that would also go into effect immediately. So um, it depends on if you're able to, so the time, uh, if we're able to schedule matter, it. Really, if, if what I'm hearing is that it, there isn't really a time gap. We, we, we can say it now, but it doesn't happen tomorrow. But the, right, it, it would not happen. You can uh, direct uh, staff to come back um, with those with that resolution uh, at uh, you know another time. I can't speak for staff as to um, workload uh, workloads and timing and when exactly that would be able to come back. Um, but whenever it did come back, you would be able, the council would be able to act on it uh, at that time, and it would go into effect immediately. I have no problem supporting the risk mitigation pool. It sounds as if the fastest way to do it is to have you bring it back in a month the way that you had suggested you would be because we can do that immediately. Yeah, the reason I use the term month is uh, Kelly Kuykendall, our program manager, and I were planning a consent item for your consideration, renewing Catholic Charities contract with the budget authority you did in June. And in that, we could expand access to the risk mitigation pool to incentivize property owners to accept vouchers. And the, the workload impact would be if we, we could put that on consent and you can always pull it if you didn't like the language, but that was the track we were on in the 30-day time frame. If, if we do that now, if in this ordinance I say I'd like to see it come back and we vote for it in this ordinance, is it okay for it to be on consent? Uh, it's okay for it to be on consent even if you simply, as a council, give direction to staff to come back in a month. Um, and again, as Director Gwine mentioned, um, it could be placed on consent and it could be pulled by any any council member. And, and I... Okay. I, I'm making this this uh, suggestion in lieu of uh, knowing exactly when this is coming back. As, as we've seen earlier today, in fact, <laughs> we're not always the best at planning Thanks. when things coming. And what I don't want to have happen is I don't want to both either delay the implementation of the ordinance or also end up having that discussion get delayed for whatever reason and not having the risk mitigation pool as a part of it. So that's why I'm trying to make sure that we link the two of them together. So what language do I need to give you to link the risk mitigation pool to this ordinance? Let me, um, let me ask a question. I'm not sure I understand exactly what you want to do. If you want this ordinance to not go into effect until a risk mitigation pool is ready and available, um, we can craft the ordinance uh, to provide that. The effective date then would not be 30 days after the second reading, but it would be uh, at such time that a mitigation pool uh, is established for landlords. Alternatively, you can uh, simply you know, uh, proceed with your motion to introduce this ordinance and come back uh, for its second read. Um, and direct staff to come back within the within the 30 days after the second read, um, and then uh, you would have the opportunity. That the risk mitigation pool could be in effect uh, when the ordinance goes into effect. I like you the could, second choice. You could have a, a third yeah, choice. A third choice would be to have the second read come back at the same time as the risk mitigation pool item but you would then maybe have the risk mitigation pool ready and the ordinance wouldn't go into effect until 30 days thereafter. And so I apologize, I didn't sure. mean for this to become such a <laughs> sensitive uh, topic. Sure. What I'm looking for is understanding that we're going to be having that conversation, making sure that in the event that there's a gap between when we have the risk mitigation pool a conversation and when the ordinance goes into effect, not delaying the impact or the, the implementation of the ordinance, but if there ends up being a gap, that the default is that the risk mitigation pool is available until such time that the council deems that it's not or that we change that program. And, and I'm, I'm having some uncomfortableness with sending out a risk mitigation pool without a discussion of what it means. Right, and the risk mitigation pool is not specifically 
on the agenda tonight. You're certainly, it's certainly within the realm of for you to give direction to come back with that program um, or the expansion of that program. At a minimum, you would wanna come back even if you're gonna, if, even if you're gonna provide that just simply the existing fund could be expanded, um, that will need to be agendized and, and, um, well, well, and quite, have you consider it. Quite frankly, so we had this discussion a month ago where it was very clear from the council's perspective that we wanted to have both of those conversations at the same time yes. or in conjunction with one another. So my reading of the item is that because we have talked about that, that there is an opportunity for us to have both conversations simultaneously because they are the same conversation. And again, it's all about how we get people actually into these housing units. So what the, I think the second option that you gave us, Sue, Ms. Geller, yes. I think the second, city, Madam City Attorney, I think the <laughs> second option you gave us meets all of our criteria. Can I ask a question too, Dave? And I'm, I'm gonna use the example of the apartment fire. Council gave you no direction to ever use that risk mitigation fund to support people who lost their apartments due to the fire, correct? That was a staff decision. That's correct. Giving this feedback now, is there anything that you could not, um, if, if you're hearing what the concerns we have, that would prevent you from using those existing funds to support the motion that is before the council? I hear you loud and clear. Okay. That's uh, so, As my second, Mr. Oliveris, are you good? Okay. So I'm recommending the, I think we've made ourselves clear and I'm recommending the second option that you offered us as part of the motion. So to clarify, uh, the ordinance, the motion is to, is to introduce the ordinance uh, to direct staff to come back with a, um, a risk mitigation fund within a month. And in the meantime, to um, authorize either formally or informally um, the director to allow use of that fund in the meantime. Again, this ordinance won't go into effect until 30 days after the second read, so that interim period may or may not, in fact, occur. Right. Okay, are we okay with that? All right, that's On the that. motion. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Lonnie, did you have a question or? I, I had one additional thing that I was hoping, this I don't think will muddy the water, so you don't have to get too nervous. When staff does come back in a year, it would be my request also to hear about um, a delta in the percentage of our vouchers that have been able to be used. It would be nice to see if it um, if it does work in that regard as well. Thank you for not muddying the waters. And Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Margaret. I have a, a quick question for clarification as well. So there was a mention of, of um, not fees, but um, that's where I'm looking for. Consequences? No. Um, Penalties. Penalties, thank you. The, that's already in the ordinance as it's been stated. So there's no, there wouldn't be any, any further conversation about penalties because you did mention that in your. I ask that when it come back in a year that there include information about the effectiveness of penalties and review of the recommendations of um, FHA of Northern California. So the, so the, so what's included in the, in the ordinance? That's not in the ordinance, that's just a recommendation to staff. Okay, so just a conversation that you would be right. looking to have. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, this has been a real struggle for me as a, as a, um, as a landlord. Um, uh, my, my 93 year old father is a landlord, he has a duplex. I know this is, this is going to be very difficult for him to, um, to deal with, um, I believe, that's he was his choice uh, to be a landlord, that is true, um, but it wasn't his choice to be forced to be a part of a government program. And that's part of, I wanna, I wanna give a voice to the landlords that are f concerned and fearful about being forced into a government program that has pitfalls. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a little bit scary um, there's a lot of there's a lot of fear out there about Section 8, and I think that we I've I've grown up with that fear, um, and, and I think that it's part of it. A great deal of it is is because we don't really know um, the how it functions necessarily, and there are there's a lack of clarity, and there's there are, there are unknowns, and it does take you have to navigate and and become a a partner with the city and a partner with the federal government um, to to 
implement or to be a part of a Section 8 program. There's no one in this room, I, I don't believe there's anyone in this room that, that is, uh, that wants to d discriminate against anybody. But being, but there are people in this room who do not feel comfortable being forced into a federal program. And I am one of those people. I don't, I don't like the idea. What I, what I would like to replace the fear with is knowledge and to replace the fear with education and have a really, really comprehensive educational program to start to replace the hyperbole and, and, and that fear that I mentioned, because I think it is mainly fear-based. And we've all heard the horror stories. It doesn't matter whether you're on Section 8 or not. We hear the horror stories as landlords. We know it can happen if you get the wrong tenant, and the wrong tenant can come from anywhere. And, I, and I, you know, I, I, I've seen it happen. But it, it is, there are, when there are delays, and there are, when, if there are delays, and we are hoping that there won't be, and we've heard um, some averages about how long the delays may take. I know that a recent repair on, on we have, I have a, a home with a granny unit. The granny unit re required um, some repair, and that repair um, took out three and a half months of rent, um, in part because we keep our rent so low. And that was, and now we're now we are, um, because of the restrictions placed on on our our rentals, and we have we've we've had a tendency of late to add a lot of sticks as opposed to carrots when it comes to landlords, and I'm concerned about the cumulative um, result in in those sticks. Um, it does it does concern me. Um, so I'm, I'm looking for the carrots. I'm looking for the, the educational program. I'm looking for the risk mitigation pool. I'm really thankful that the council is adding that because I think it's really important. Um, my, my red light tonight is a reflection of my concern about the, un, the, the predictable and unfortunate consequences of, of, the, um, of this coming forward at this time by the city. I do, and I'm, I'm glad that you've defined the number of residents that can be uh, in any one rental and the state ne neglected to do that. Um, I think it's important to have that definition in place. Um, that we, in, in probably in 72 hours, we will have the protections that you seek. Um, and and the, the, we can always, and I, I like the idea of, of reviewing this in a, in a year. I think the vice mayor's recommendation is a, is a good one. And I think that the entire council would be, um, seems to be uh, w willing and able and in fact to, wanting to support that, that review because we, don't have, we can rarely come up with perfection in our ordinances. Um, Lord knows the legislature has very little perfection in their, in their legislative actions. Um, and I think this is probably one of them as well. And there, there will be changes in the future, and I think that we, it's great that we, might have, that we will have an opportunity, I hope, to make changes to improve the, the ordinance. Um, but I think that that, that educational program is, um, is, is vital because there will be a possibility of, of landlords to, go, to work around this ordinance. Um, and what I don't, what I would like to happen is that they embrace the ordinance, that they embrace Section 8, and that they do replace that fear with, with, with the, with knowledge, uh, and that hyperbole st starts to fade away. Because that's really when we'll have a, a, a um, functioning, uh, um, ordinance is when people are, are embracing it as opposed to trying to run in the other direction. So even though I will be voting against it tonight, I know that we will be faced with 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 a um, with this with, with the state action uh, in the very very near future, um, and I hope that we are um, capable of making those changes to our own ordinance in the future uh, to make it function even better and to have those landlords um, embrace it as opposed to want to run in the other direction. So thank you. And uh, won't rehash everything. I agree with so much of what's been said here today. And this coming back to council, m my interest was not to have an adversarial conversation. You know, not 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 to pick sides. And I think when I've met with both tenant groups and with landlord groups, it is about the city of Santa Rosa needs to have skin in the game. And that's why, you know, we've got that risk mitigation. And, and I really think uh, the landlord incentives and risk mitigation show we're serious. We're just not gonna bureaucratize every single thing to do with housing in Santa Rosa. We're trying to get these end results here by getting people housed. And I don't think it's right that someone doesn't accept that and we're willing to uh, actually work with someone with that. It's also, you know, there, I think all of us on council still got a lot of uh, cards and letters uh, about forcing someone in the government program. And I just don't see it that way. All it's saying, you cannot not 
process that person, whatever process you have used historically to decide who you're gonna rent your room to. Um, so I, I, I don't think we're forcing anyone into it. You just can't eliminate them from consideration. So I am supportive uh, of this. And with that, um, we have a motion and a second. Could we have your votes, please? And that passes with five ayes, one no by Mr. Sawyer and abstention from Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you. So what I'm planning on doing, uh, do we have any cards for item 13? We'll take public comment and then we will be taking a break uh, because I'm making the assumption the PG&E situational briefing is ongoing. We'll get updated from that uh, after we do item 13. So item 13, first up, uh, Daniel Pablo, followed by Peter Chernoff. Hey everybody, uh, I just wanted to thoroughly introduce myself. Uh, I'm the new student trustee of the junior college. Uh, and I just wanted to openly invite the city council to attend our meeting at 3 p.m. next Monday. Uh, recently, uh, you guys have the new minimum wage increase uh, next week, uh, and that's an issue that I specifically fought for at the junior college. Uh, so it'd be great if you guys could just show up there, uh, talk with the city council, not the city council, the student government and our student body president as well. Uh, but I also wanted to ask if I could uh, go down there and give you guys my business cards so we can stay into contact. Uh, but yeah, that's really much it, and thank you for the time. You can give your cards to the city clerk and she can get them to us. Would you repeat the thank date and time of the meeting? Date, excuse me. Monday. Would you repeat the date, Monday, time, Monday. and location of the meeting? Yeah, so it'll be next Monday at 3 p.m. Where? Uh, at SRJC Bertolini Center. Uh, I'll give you my contact information so we can just keep into contact, and I'll tell you specifically what room we can meet in. Uh, Peter Chernoff, followed by Bill Keltson. It looks like Peter has left. Is Bill Keltson here? Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council members. Uh, the reason I'm here today is to something that came to my attention after. Um, my girlfriend took a walk in Howarth Park. Now, I don't know if you're all realizing this, but there is a problem up in Howarth Park with some sexual attacks that I feel that need to be addressed uh, for the safety of the women that do go hiking on these trails, my girlfriend being one of them. Um, she doesn't go out there anymore. I won't let her. If I'm not with her, she's not gonna be on that trail. So what I'm trying to propose here, um, when a woman goes into a bathroom in a park or any type of a public place like that, they're basically a trap. There's one way in and there's one way out. Now, in the past, on campuses, you would see uh, the blue lights, phone booth type of thing, in an emergency call. I think we need something a little bit more advanced than that. Those have kind of gone away because of the advent of cell phones. We need something that's more debilitating to an attacker, much like a strobe light, blue light. Somebody's coming in there, they feel that they're about to be attacked, they can punch that thing, and a disorientating light, you see them even on flashlights that are made these days, but it is something that needs to be addressed. Now, I will be reaching out to all members of the council regarding this um, to start the ball rolling on this, but I th we do need to start something on this because um, women and children are the most at risk in these types of situations. And um, it just reminds me of a similar incident that happened in my neighborhood down in Southern California where a woman went into um, a bathroom to use it. She never came out. She was stabbed and killed. And these are things that really, you know, you've got to remember these things because they don't stop. We need to address it. I, I'm sure the police have been informed and are doing recurring, uh, more prominent 
um, patrols, but I, I feel that it's something that can kind of go by the wayside. Um, I think that's pretty much all I've got to say on it, but I will be reaching out to every one of you regarding this and start the ball rolling and see what can be done for the safety of people that are on these trails and on public properties. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Kate Grobel Tazar. Is Kate still here? Nope. Justin Forsyth, followed by Thomas Ells. Justin, yes. Hey there, thank you for taking the time to listen to me today. My name is Justin Forsyth and I'm here today regarding a very large homeless encampment that is building by Food Max on the Joe Rodotta Trail and other encampments along the trail. I live on the other side of the wall, 591 East Jasmine Circle inside the Costa del Sol Community Complex right next to Food Max. And we have had continuous problems with the homeless over there. They yell and fight all night so loud that my three-year-old often comes crying to our room because he is scared of the people yelling outside. They constantly throw garbage over the wall, including heroin needles, random trash, and just last week, a raw egg was thrown on my hood, which now needs to be painted. They're causing stress to my family, and now they're causing financial stress too. Just today, at 1 p.m., I got some pictures I tried to give them to you to show you the size of the encampment. Just today, at 1 o'clock, I went to go take some pictures to bring to you to show you the size of the camp which I was unable to get the whole size of because I was threatened and almost attacked, so I turned around and ran off. I then called the police to report the incident and nothing happened as usual. This is beyond unacceptable. How can we just stand back and just let this happen? Allow them to make large 50-person encampments. Allow them to start fires and then let them stay in the same spot they started the fire in. Uh, allow them to harass people such as myself and nothing happened. We need real change, so whatever policies got us here must change or we're gonna end up like LA or San Francisco with this homeless problem. Santa Rosa will lose its value and it will get a bad name for doing nothing. Don't allow this to happen. Stand up and face the problem because too many people don't see it. And so out of sight, out of mind, so nothing is being done. The areas that are affected by this are largely Latino and are being taken advantage of. In these areas, there's more children and they are being exposed to this problem and it is unhealthy for them. I don't wanna raise my children somewhere that I can't take a walk and worry about needles being thrown over my wall and my child grabbing them. I'm here today asking for your help to break up these large camps and at least try to spread them out so they don't gang up in areas and make them unsafe. If we can't control the trails, only option is to close them down because right now they are just a homeless highway for those who openly do drugs and live on. I've spoken with the police, security, my HOA, and I've done everything possible, and nothing has helped, everything has just gotten worse. So I'm here today as a last resort, because I've tried everything else. Please don't let this ruin Santa Rosa. If nothing is done, this will not stop me. I will do whatever it takes to expose the problem. To, via social media, to the whole country, this needs to be, this needs to be known. This can't end up like LA, like all these other areas. Anyways, thank you for your time. I'm not gonna give up on this. You will hear from me again. You'll see me again. Um, is there anything else you wanna add? Thanks for speaking with me. Thank you. Thomas Ells. Hi, thank you. And uh, I wanted to address my comments to the climate crisis and uh, Greta Thunberg and all the great kids around the country and the world who, um, spoke to the crisis and, and uh, they speak to our heart and ask us to engage to protect the, the world for their future. And um, I don't think it's entirely different from this man's concerns right here. And uh, those are not inconsistent with actually increasing the amount of housing stock that we have, increasing the response to the homelessness and so on. I mean, uh, there are people who are out there who are, who are errant and uh, uh, they can impact the environment and exacerbate the climate crisis. So uh, these are not completely separate issues. Uh, a great deal of the climate crisis, as I explained to, to uh, folks at Homeless Action recently, was that, uh, is that the refugees that are coming from 
South America and Central America are frequently uh, economic refugees, and the climate itself is an economic refugee, is that economic externalities are placed on the, on the environment, and that's the very same issue, is that the environment is just the weakest one of the, of the things and people that we have to place externalities on. And it's the same thing that's happening uh, with the homeless and the same thing that's happening with the, with the uh, underclasses and the, and the people with low incomes and so on. Uh, and I would ask you to consider those and, and really think to, to the climate crisis itself. What can we do here? There's more than just, uh, let's put solar panels on something. No. In fact, I've spoken before about rooftop gardens and when you're going to consider the, the city and county facility that you're, you, I, I think we all hope that, that uh, the encouragement uh, for the downtown development here with more housing and everything, that it really occurs that you could be a catalyst for that. And one part of that, I think, is, is rooftop gardens. And, and there can be vertical gardening along the sides of the buildings that change the perception of, of what it means to be in downtown. We should make it so that it's a toss up. You know, you move to Sonoma County and you want to live in the, in, in sort of the rural areas. Why not make it a hard choice whether or not people live out in a rural area or live in downtown Santa Rosa? I think these are both great. These are such great choices I have. Why, why they could have a, a house in both. I mean, you know, potentially. Thank you. Thank you. All right, council will take a 10 to 15 minute break or recess.
Okay, a lot of moving parts here. Um, just so you know, we are gonna take uh, the public hearing first after we hear an update from our city manager, and then we'll go to 15-1 and then come back to 14-2 and 14-3. Mr. City Manager, could you give us an update, please? So I'd like to follow up uh, as a continuation on my city manager report from earlier. Um, we just received news from uh, uh, PG&E that the city of Santa Rosa is uh, no longer forecast to be in the PSPS event overnight. What I will say is that that there are areas of the county that are impacted by the PSPS and I would refer folks um, back to the, their, their website so that you can track and make sure that you are outside the area of forecast because there will be overnight potentially PSPS in Sonoma County, in Napa County, um, and in the Sierra foothills. And so there are some folks that are gonna experience power outages, we will not. Um, we still need the community to remain vigilant, uh, make sure your cell is on tracking because we still are in a red flag warning. While the EOC is no longer going to be hot for the rest of the evening, it will be in a warm status. We will continue to track um, and monitor the situation because again, we are in a red flag warning. And to repeat, those are high wind events with low humidity. Uh, the other good news is on the horizon, uh, there had been some concern that there would be um, for our area, uh, some potential uh, for PSPS considerations over the weekend. That weather report is now coming in very, very favorable. So it looks like over the next 24 hours, the significant events will, um, will have worked their, themselves out. Um, what I will say is that based on an earlier conversation, we will continue to have a state of emergency because this is one of the most difficult periods of our calendar uh, going into October. And once we get a feeling that um, we're through the worst of it, we will bring back that for consideration for council to relax that, that state of emergency. So just wanted to finish that report out um, and make sure everybody in the community understood that the city of Santa Rosa for this evening, um, we are not in the forecast for a PSPS event, but we still are in a red flag warning. So we ask you to remain um, vigilant and, and prepared because it still is uh, a, a, a a potentially um, challenging situation. Great, thank you for that. And, and if I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, if I may clarify, um, with respect to the declaration of emergency, we will be continuing to monitor and we will bring it back to you uh, under state law. We need to um, uh, keep it in effect only for so long as the emergency is we're in a, a state of emergency and those conditions are met. So we'll continue to monitor and we'll bring it back to you as we need to. Great, thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Gouin, are you gonna be replacing Mr. McGlynn? And let's go item 15.1. Great, thank you. Item 15.1 is a public hearing, pre-zoning 4200 and 4224 Sonoma Highway for annexation and presenting is uh, Susie Murray, our senior planner. Y'all have had a long day, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna try and expedite this as much as possible. The project before you is the recess storage. Um, there we go. Sorry about that. The project before you is the recess self storage. It's a mixed unit or a mixed use development proposed out on Sonoma Highway. <clears throat> The project description includes annexing two parcels into Santa Rosa. Um, the, the project will also subdivide two, um, uh, only one of those two parcels into three new parcels and develop a 124,000 square foot, four story self storage unit and two residential structures, each containing uh, multiple, multiple units, 14 units in total. Um, the entitlements required um, a mitigated negative declaration, 
the hillside development to develop on a slope greater than 10%, a tentative map to, as I said, subdivide the, prop the property at 4224 Sonoma Highway into three individual properties, and a conditional use permit for um, a self-storage facility and for multifamily housing. Those four um, entitlements were approved by the Planning Commission contingent upon the, the pre-zoning for annexation, which is what is before the council tonight. Pre-zoning is the first step to, um, to annexation. After the pre-zoning is complete, assuming it's approved, um, the project will go to LAFCO for annexation. After annexation, or actually concurrent with the annexation process, the final um, uh, entitlement design review will move forward to the, the design review board. So the crux of this meeting is really the pre-zoning. The property, the two properties are located here, an aerial view, you can see that um, there's a couple, um, a residential structure and some other structures on the larger of the two properties. That's one proposed for development. And the other property located at 4200, Sonoma Highway is completely developed. However, the entire, um, the, the scope of the annexation, annexation boundary and MND um, included both properties. <clears throat> And just pulling back for some neighborhood context here, you can see it's, it's located adjacent to Santa Rosa Creek, so the Waterways Advisory Committee was pulled in on this one, and um, it's right near the intersection of Mission and Highway 12. It's got a longer history. We first were introduced to development at the site in November of 2016. Some of the highlights, again, the des uh, design review saw the project uh, as a co concept item in July of 2018. Um, and then we received the applications for the project a couple of months later. Um, let's see, the MND circulated for a 30-day public period in July of 2019. And in August, the Planning Commission, as I said earlier, approved the first, or I guess four entitlements. The site, uh, the two properties are located in an area designated as uh, retail and business services on the general plan land use designation. They're being proposed to be pre-zoned into the CG uh, general commercial zoning district, which is consistent with the general plan land use designation. Properties surrounding the, um, the site are generally consistent with the general plan land use diagram. <clears throat> The property, the, or the project is designed, very thoughtfully designed in, um, in that, uh, just to orient you here, the uh, Sonoma Highway is on the left side of your screen and Sa Santa Rosa Creek is on the right. Um, the the self-storage unit or the self-storage facility will be placed um, adjacent to the highway and there's a six unit residential building on the bottom that's adjacent to the um, uh, residential neighborhood along Streamside. And then there's, uh, there's an eight unit residential structure that overlooks the creek path, which will put eyes on the creek. Oh, there we go. Ah, and I missed the big highlight. Um, this, the, the property or the um, property owner project applicant has agreed and in fact given us a, a given the city an easement um, on the property to build a well site. My understanding is this is one of several sites that were considered for an emergency water re or source, and this, this site ranked the highest. So we're getting a, a well there. The project has been found in compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act. As I mentioned earlier, the Planning Commission has um, approved a mitigated negative declaration. The, um, the, here's a rendering from Sonoma Highway, what, um, what the project is planned to look like. Um, again, it has to go to the design review board before that's finalized. And then from the creek path, both looking east and west, the, um, once vegetation is established, uh, they, the, these are the eight units that will be overlooking the path. So with that, it is recommended by the Planning Commission and the Planning and Economic Development Department that the council introduce and approve an ordinance 
to pre-zone the properties located at 4200 and 4224 Sonoma Highway into the CG zoning district to allow the two parcel county island to be annexed into city limits. And the applicant is here. I don't think he's planning on making a presentation, but he's available for questions as am I. Great, thank you. Uh, council, questions for staff? Ms. Combs. Can you describe the area that is not uh, city, that is county, that is being, you know, part of this is being annexed, is the whole property, uh, currently county property that we will be annexing? And is there any adjacent properties that we are not annexing that are county properties? What's the, what's the diagram of the county there? That is a two parcel county island. Everything around it is city properties and the state prohibits us from annexing only one of the two parcels. Both property owners are very much interested in coming into the city. I'm delighted to hear that answer. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, this is a public hearing, so I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any cards on this item? You don't have to fill out a card if you'd like to address the council on this item. Is anyone interested in Mr. Ells? Do, do forgive me, uh, I just happened to notice that there was a transformer, a, a pole mounted transformer uh, in front of the property and it might be a good idea if it could be encouraged to underground that, those transmission lines or that, or that service to that property. It might be a good place to start doing that, thinking about the fire hazards and danger. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the council? Please, Please uh, identify yourself and go ahead. Hi, my name's Renee Amore and I am the property owner of 4200 Sonoma Highway. Um, and I fully support this and I'm looking forward to both the properties being annexed into the city. Great, thank, thank you. you. Would anyone else like to address the council? Seeing no one else rise, we'll close the public hearing. Um, Ms. Fleming, you've got this item. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to move an ordinance of the city of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa pre-zoning the properties located at 4200 and 4224 Sonoma Highway, also identified as assessor's parcel numbers 032-010-023 and 032-010-005 respectively to the General Commercial Zoning District file number PRJ18-050 and wait for the reading of the text. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional questions or comments? Thanks. Seeing none, your votes please. Thank you for that. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, we'll go back on the agenda to item 14.2, Mr. Gouin. Is it on? Yeah, item 14.2. It's a report, additional homeless service investments, capital and program improvements at Samuel L. Jones Hall Homeless Shelter. And presenting is Kelly Kuckendall and Dave Gwine. Good evening, Mayor Schwethelm and members of the council. I'm gonna jump right in here and provide you an overview of tonight's presentation. I'll provide background on Sam Jones Hall, um, also the state homeless emergency aid program and the city's application for funding for both Sam Jones Hall and the Bennett Valley Senior Center site, and the, also the um, home Sonoma County funding recommendations that came out of that application process. And then uh, we'll cover the proposal that's before you this evening, which is to seek your authorization for the expenditure of funding for capital improvements and programming improvements, including the activation of a navigation center at Sam Jones Hall. 
So to provide some background on the shelter, it's been in operation for more than 13 years. Actually in November it will be 14 years. In August 2017 with the city's support, Catholic Charities uh, launched a housing focused program. The current capacity at the shelter is up to 213 beds. 138 are set aside for vulnerable individuals coming to our system of care through coordinated entry, plus an additional 75 beds for the homeless encampment assistance pilot program. This is the city's heat program, not to be confused with the state's heat program. Beds are also set aside, so in addition to heat dedicated beds, we have beds available for emergent conditions. The shelter provides year-round 24-7 support, including case management services and housing, navigation, location, and stabilization services, as well as financial resources to help individuals find housing. The shelter is funded by the city, the county, and the community foundation. Our current operating agreement with Catholic Charities for this fiscal year is approximately $1.3 million. Catholic Charities also gets an allocation of funding through um, Home Sonoma County, in the approximate amount of 175,000, bringing the budget for the shelter to about 1.5 million for the year. Moving on to the state heat program. If you recall in February, earlier, the, earlier this year, council directed staff to submit an application to home Sonoma County through the Sonoma County Community Devel Development Commission, which is the lead agency for $3.6 million in funding. We asked for 1.6 million for the replacement of the roof at Sam Jones Hall, an additional $2 million for the activation of the Santa Rosa Navigation Center at the former Bennett Valley Senior Center. In April, Home Sonoma County, which is our new uh, continuum of care, um, keep going, sorry, <laughs> okay. Um, through its leadership council, awarded the city of Santa Rosa $1.2 million, and those funds have been prioritized for the roof at Sam Jones Hall. The Sam Jones Hall Navigation Center, so following the leadership council, Home Center County's leadership council decision to award funding, um, which I said is prioritized for the roof at Sam Jones Hall, staff began brainstorming ways to uh, improve uh, the, the shelter, both in terms of programming and uh, capital improvements. And, and this is sort of in light of the fact that we didn't receive funding to activate the Bennett Valley Senior Center. So we worked with Catholic Charities, of course, our partner. We worked with uh, Transportation and Public Works, uh, Building and Fire um, to look at the capital improvements and programming improvements. And we identified a potential source of funds through uh, an affordable housing NOFA from 2016. So there's a balance remaining of approximately $1.6 million that was previously um, allocated. I'll go into how we're proposing to use these funds in the next couple slides. So capital improvements, um, the estimate to replace the roof at Sam Jones Hall and that work is underway, which is great. And we have a timeline to be done with that um, estimated by December, which is good news. So the, the estimate for the roof is 1.6 million. As I mentioned, we received an award of 1.2 million in state heat funding. So that leaves us with a gap, gap of approximately $400,000. We're proposing to use these NOFA funds for that purpose. The balance of the NOFA funds, approximately $1.2 million. We're proposing to modif modify the large dorm, and I have um, some visual uh, screenshots of the, the shelter to show with you in the next couple slides. In that large dorm, we're proposing to subdivide it into three um, areas. One would be a 38-bed navigation center, and then two smaller dorms, both 15 and 18 beds. This would provide us uh, the ability to provide increased privacy and accommodations for shelter clients, particularly those with disabilities um, seeking reasonable accommodation, and would further the city's efforts to align um, with the preliminary injunction um, related to the re recent lawsuit. Additionally, through these improvements, we, could in, we can imp improve or promote both client safe, safety and staff safety at the shelter. And subject to your direction this evening, we would return at a future council date with a contract uh, and a budget for these capital improvements for your consideration. Here's the existing floor plan of the shelter. The highlighted 
section of the shelter is the dorm that we're proposing to modify with the capital improvements. Here is this redesigned large dorm, so the 38-bed navigation center, and then the two smaller dorms with 15 beds and 18 beds. Moving on to programming improvements. So after the capital improvements, so after the roof and after the capital improvements to redesign the large dorm, we're proposing to use the balance of these funds to provide enhanced services to promote retention and housing placements at the shelter and to better serve highly vulnerable individuals coming to our system of care with the implementation of coordinated entry and the implementation of a housing focused program at the shelter. This includes specialized staff, behavioral health specialists to better serve these individuals. We're proposing a one year pilot program at the conclusion of one year, we would come back to council with an evaluation of the program and recommend next steps. We would ensure this pilot program would align with Housing First, coordinated entry, and our regional efforts through Home Sonoma County. Similar to the, the capital improvements being proposed tonight, for the programming for the pilot program, we would return with a contract scope and budget for council consideration at a future date. These modifications do um, reduce the capacity of the shelter. The current capacity is 213 beds, and with this proposal, it would be 208 beds. 138 would still be set aside or preserved for coordinated entry. We would have 38 beds, as I discussed, for the navigation center, and then 38 beds or cots would be activated for HEAP um, for the, the encampment program or during emergent situations. Okay, in terms of outreach that was conducted related to the request before you this evening, we did reach out to Ian DeJong, he's the president of Org Code Consulting, to solicit his feedback on what we're proposing at the shelter. He supported the idea of creating safe spaces in the shelter, particularly for individuals um, with complex needs that are vulnerable and have potentially having behavioral health crises. He also suggested or supported that um, improvements for safety for both clients and for staff that um, the installation of security cameras cameras would be a good idea. And we also talked with him about the staffing model at the shelter and if there's ways that we could potentially improve that to improve shelter outcomes um, and retaining um, clients at the shelter. So Catholic Charities is working with Org Code right now to, to take a closer look at their staffing model and see if there's any improvements that can be made. I presented. Mayor, may I ask, is sure. it possible for us to get a copy of his response or his report on the recommendations that he made based on what he saw? We spoke with him on the phone, so I'm just relaying that information. If there's any written communication regarding the staffing proposal, I'm happy to share that with council. Thank you. So I also presented to the community advisory board and the downtown subcommittee that this request would be coming forward to council. We did outreach to the neighborhood. I did send emails to uh, uh, my neighborhood contacts to let them know that this would be coming forward. They've also been made aware of the construction project. And we pushed it out via social media, so a post went out on next door to the four neighborhoods surrounding the shelter. I did get some feedback from one um, neighbor that I'm in regular communication with that she also, without me prompting her, um, would support uh, the installation of security cameras at the shelter to, to potentially improve neighborhood safety and concerns. And advocacy and community groups. I did share this information that this will be coming forward to council with Homeless Action. I met with a representative of Homeless Action. I think Adrian might still be here. Hi. <laughs> um, she might have comments on this, but I'll, I'll share what we what we discussed during that meeting. Um, seemed the general support for the the capital and program, programming improvements at the shelter, especially around the you know pr trying to provide for reasonable accommodations for persons with disabilities, did express some concern that additional funding could be going to Catholic charities for programming without an official uh, request for a proposals process. And then I also presented to Santa Rosa together last week. So that sums up our outreach efforts around this effort. With this, I'll move forward with a recommendation. It is recommended by the Housing and Community Services Department that the council by resolution authorize the expenditure up to $1.6 million, $1 million remaining from an affordable housing 
pilot program notice of funding availability for capital and programming improvements associated with replacement of the roof and modification of the large dorm, including activation of a navigation center at the Samuel L. Jones homeless, homeless shelter. This concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Great, thank you for that presentation. We're gonna put do a brief pause before we ask any questions because the city manager has some updated information uh, to share. Um, the information is not a change from the information I presented before, uh, but it is apparent that PG&E has posted something on their website that suggests that there are 700 um, customers within the city of Santa Rosa impacted. The area is actually north of that. It is from uh, Porter Valley up to Calistoga. I think it's probably an error in terms of zip code allocation. We've informed PG&E of the era, error, and they are investigating that, that error. So I just wanted to make sure you heard it from us that we've made PG&E aware of an error in the press release they just put out. I've also informed the Press Democrat that, that, that PG&E is looking for the sourcing error, but I wanted to make sure we close that loop. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, back to the presentation. Uh, questions? I do have one. Regarding the um, behavioral health specialists, would they be city employees or would we contract with Beckaloo or the county somewhat? How would that work? And I had the same question for Jenny Lynn earlier today while I was preparing for this, and my understanding is that that work would be contract at, contracted out because Catholic Charities does not have that expertise in-house. And so what would that role be? It would be a subcontract, and we have a similar arrangement right now with our host agreement where Catholic Charities does some subcontract out some of the work, say with social advocates for youth. They've also subcontracted in the past with Bacaloo programs. Okay, and so again, it's... Um, and you may have already said this, sorry if I missed it, but it's more to support the more vulnerable population that we're now serving out at Sam Jones Hall versus what had been done in the past because of our engagement with coordinated entry. Absolutely, and our shift towards housing focused or housing first you know, model at the shelter where we're prioritizing more, more vulnerable individuals with complex needs um, and including you know, persons with, with disabilities. Great, thank you. Okay, seeing no other questions, I have one card on this item, uh, Adrian Lobby. Thank you. Um, I do appreciate that uh, Kelly Kuykendall reached out to me. We had a really interesting and I hope useful conversation for both of us. Um, we don't oppose fixing the roof at Sam Jones, uh, move, checking, making one of those dorms into smaller dorms seems like a reasonable idea. There's a lot of problems at Sam Jones with overcrowding and I think uh, if the staff there feels that they can monitor people in these smaller rooms, it's probably a lot better for the people who are in them. So that seems good. I am a little concerned about, well, two things. One is, again, a big chunk of money going towards Catholic Charities. As I have said repeatedly, uh, we would like to have all these things put out for bids and not just uh, kind of automatically assume that, that they have to go to Catholic Charities. Uh, we also would like to call for an audit of Catholic Charities. We think it needs to be done and should have been done quite some time ago. Um, in terms of this particular item, it's a lot of money that's kind of um, undefined, that it's gonna go for improvements at Sam Jones, including some mental health workers. Now, mental health at Sam Jones is a great idea. It should really happen there, I agree. But we do not, have a plan for a winter shelter this year. We, we've been told that the armory is not available because they're, it's just, they're not gonna rent it to anyone this year. So we're trying to scramble around, uh, some of us, to figure out if there's any way to at least get some people into shelter this winter. But I suspect we're gonna have some emergencies coming up and I'm concerned that um, there isn't, I guess I would recommend that some of this money, after you finish the roof, right, pay for the roof, have some reserve funds in case the roof costs more because you know construction, it always costs more, great. But uh, I would like to see the rest of this money reserved for uh, further thought. 
Thanks. Great. Thank you. Did you fill out a card, Thomas? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I'm right in this, but I saw the, I believe $1.2 million was from the heap funds and then $1.6 million was from the NOFA. That's $2.8 million. And it looks like right there, you're only approving 1.6 million. So I'm just wondering if that's actually accurate and what you're doing or where the funds already previously allocated and, and um, uh, authorized. So in which case this is just an augmentation of that, I don't know. Uh, but as I was hearing the presentation, it sounded like you were gonna have cameras in these rooms and my question is, first of all, people do undress in those spaces and uh, they're in various states of undress. There are all kinds of situations um, which maybe seem like reason enough to have cameras, but there's a lot of stuff that goes on as far as with cameras. Cameras is a very difficult situation and then would that be taped or could that be used any other way? Or, you know, there's, there's, uh, I'm, it doesn't sound good. To me. Oh, thank you, sorry. Thank you. Do we have any other cards? Nothing. Mr. Olivares, you have this item. Thank you, a little resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa authorizing the expenditure of up to $1.6 million remaining from an affordable housing pilot program. Notice of funding available for capital and programming improvements at the Samuel L. Jones Hall homeless shelter located at 4020 Finley Avenue and wait for the reading of the text. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any other questions? Was that yes, Ms. Fleming? I'm wondering what the nature of the behavioral health workers are. What um, do we have a specific idea in mind for who is going to be, what kind of qualifications those individuals might have? We don't have a plan yet, um, but we will be working on that when we bring back a contract and a budget and scope of work to council. And so if you have input on that, please provide it to staff and we'll take it into consideration while we're, we're developing that, that contract and scope of work. And am I right to understand that the, the positions for those individuals would be part of the pilot? Yes. So um, do we have any um, reasonable sense of if it were to be successful, how we would continue to fund that beyond the year? Sustaining is an important piece of this. Um, I don't have an answer for that this evening. The idea is that we'd, we would be evaluating that as we're coming close to that, that year to see the effectiveness of the program and then looking at ways to fund it, mm -hmm. to fund it moving forward. There are a variety of, you know, there are additional funding coming, funding coming down from the state, um, which might be an option to, 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 to sustain, excuse me, that um, portion of the program, but we haven't evaluated sustaining it moving forward, and it's a good question. Okay, thank you. Ms. Combs, you have comments? I have a question, thank you. Um, do we have specific goals and outcomes for this shelter yet, is it? Do we, do we know what we're expecting to get out of this shelter yet? Do we have data or any, anything, metrics set up for the shelter? For the pilot program that we're proposing this evening, I don't have that tonight. When we come back with a contract, a scope of work and budget, we will we'll have it at we'll that have time. We'll metrics yes. then. Yes. Okay. I mean, we have metrics in place for the existing program, but for the pilot that's proposed this evening, Right. I don't have those. Okay. That's what I, it's about the, this evening's pilot that I wanted to know if we had an idea of what kind of metrics we'd be looking at. And uh, one of our commenters mentioned some concerns about winter shelter. Um, it looks as if we're diminishing the number of beds at this site, reasonably so perhaps, but um, have we, do we have winter shelter plans to at least make up the difference in beds somewhere else? So we used to operate a winter shelter program at Sam Jones Hall for about four or five years. Um, we did away with that program when we increased overall capacity year round, so. Yes, we, I appreciate that I'd rather have folks have year round. 
And so, uh, you know, we, we're not planning at the shelter to add a winter shelter component. You know, there, we do have beds set aside. There's the 138 coordinated entry beds, and then we have beds set aside for the pilot program or for emergent situations. So if we have free beds open and there's people out there that need to come in, they can come in, you know, to the shelter that way. And then through Home Sonoma County, um, the continuum of care, they do typically fund winter shelter expansion. I don't have details on that this evening, but I can get that to you where shelters throughout our county do add additional beds during the winter months. So were we thinking that there will be a, we're not thinking there would be additional beds through the winter at this site though? No, I don't because see. Because we've already got it. Full. I don't see how we could possibly add more shelter beds okay. to Sam Jones Hall. And how many beds total are, do we have fewer at this site? So there's currently 213 beds. Which is a lot. The proposal this evening is reducing it only by five okay. to 208. So we did our best okay. with the re redesign of the, the large dorm. It's pretty To spread the beds throughout well. the shelter within building and fire constraints with, you know, sort of mitigating or minimizing our loss of beds. Thank you very much for that hard work. That's not easy to do. All right, your votes, please. And that passes with six ayes. Thank you. Mr. Gowen, item 14.3. Thank you, item 14.3 is a report, developer selection and authorization to begin negotiations to enter into an exclusive negotiation agreement for development of the former Bennett Valley Senior Center Complex. And presenting is Nicole Rathburn, Program Specialist for HCS. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. I'm Nicole Rathbun, Program Specialist for Housing and Community Services. Uh, this item tonight in front of you has three components to it. So first is the selection of a developer for affordable housing at the former Bennett Valley Senior Center Complex uh, with a recommendation from an ad hoc committee who reviewed the proposals to select Freebird Development as the developer for the site to authorize staff to begin negotiations to enter into an exclusive negotiation agreement and to appropriate $35,000 from the general fund undesignated reserve uh, for the consultant fees associated for, with entering into that exclusive negotiation agreement. So for a brief overview, uh, the Bennett Valley Senior Center Complex uh, was reviewed in the 2018 facilities assessment and determined to be in poor condition at that time. Uh, the services for seniors were subsequently uh, moved to the West Steel location and the Finley location for senior services with the site being closed last year. Uh, in February of 2019, Council's direction to utilize this site for affordable housing and or permanent supportive housing in the long term so staff went out and issued a request for developer qualifications and proposals with a due date of July 15th. While that solicitation was open, there were significant outreach efforts performed by staff to engage with the community about the development of the site. Uh, there is a bilingual postcard and flyers mailed out to the site, next door posts, there were several of them, uh, news flashes onto the city's website, uh, collaboration with neighborhood leaders and local nonprofits, an email mailing list, um, which has sent out numerous updates to interested parties in the neighborhood, and lastly, a community meeting um, located in the neighborhood. And from that community meeting, uh, we were able to collect the top tier of priorities from the neighborhood on what they would like to see in an affordable housing development at the site, with the top three priorities being active property management, community involvement, and adequate on-site parking. So 
So from the solicitation, two proposals were received and evaluated for financial capacity, developer experience, property management experience, service provider experience for any permanent supportive housing units, the depth of affordability, an efficient and feasible timeline, and alignment with the neighborhood priorities developed at the community meeting. So based on a review of a joint ad hoc committee of city council and housing authority members, Freebird development was identified for selection tonight and recommended by the ad hoc committee. The proposal categories that Freebird's proposal was deemed most qualified included their financial capacity, their property management and support services offered and experienced, and the conceptual proposal of half of the units being permanent supportive housing for formerly homeless individuals or families, and the other half for affordable housing without a preference. Uh, their proposal also included varied unit sizes between studio all the way up to three bedroom units, um, had a depth of affordability, and inclusion of the neighborhood priorities in the site. So this item relates to two main council goals, uh, to meet the housing needs and to attain functional zero homelessness through the permanent supportive housing units. By acting on this item tonight, you would be positioning the development for future funding opportunities and creating permanent supportive housing units to help attain functional zero and homelessness. So with that, uh, it is recommended by the Housing and Community Services Department then the Bennett Valley Senior Center Proposal Evaluation Ad Hoc Committee that the Council, by resolution, select Freebird Development Company as the developer for the City on Parcels at 702 and 716 Bennett Valley Road and 921 and 927 Rutledge Avenue. Authorize staff to initiate negotiations to enter into an exclusive negotiation agreement with Freebird Development Company and to authorize the Chief Financial Officer to appropriate $35,000 from the General Fund unassigned reserves to the real estate projects for costs associated with entering into an e &A with Freebird Development Company. And with that, I'd like to open it up to the Ad Hoc Committee of Council and Joint Housing Authority Commissioners. Um, if there's any other comments? Well, first of all, uh, we have the Chair of the Housing Authority. Steve, do you wanna make any comments about all right, <laughs> and we'll, um, Mr. Sawyer will be introducing this item, so I'm sure he'll have comments when we get to that point, if you want to. Very brief. Yeah, um, and just for my participation, I was really um, want, want to thank staff for the information that was provided to us on both of those proposals. Um, and what I really liked about this one is just the flexibility, you know, in, with both who it'll be serving and the size of the units from the studio to the three bedroom. I really like that variety. And the fact that feedback from um, the neighbors were factored into and basically are gonna be one of those priorities for the successful development of it. So that's from the ad hoc perspective, that's all I have. So I'd like to open up for other council members. So let's start first, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a, just a quick question. Uh, the dollars are coming out of the city's preserves. Uh, do we know where those currently are? The reserve levels. Yeah, that's more of a for? question for you. Yeah, I, I don't know the, off the top of my head, but uh, we can get that answer for you. Okay, if you could, that'd be helpful, because I know um, we were trying to make sure we reached our reserve policy of, I think, 15%, and we were really striving for that in our last budget process. $35,000, I don't think, is gonna make the, the big difference in, in that impact, but I do wanna see where we're at in the reserves. Ms. Fleming. Thank you. I'm curious to know in the conceptual proposal where we have uh, about half going to permanent supportive housing and the other half going to, and that's what it is, permanent supportive housing, mm -hmm. and then the other half going to affordable housing, are, do we have a guesstimate about how many units we're looking at here? What kind of density we're looking at? Yeah, so as the site is currently zoned, um, it could ac accommodate up to 46 units with a density bonus. Mm -hmm. So we'd be looking at about 23 units of either. And do you have a sense of the, so the permanent supportive housing you touched on saying for being for formerly homeless people, and it says here that 
the affordable housing varied unit sizes, which is great, um, depth of affordability and inclusion of neighborhood priorities. Mm -hmm. I do wonder, uh, having worked directly with formerly homeless people and getting them housed and then also combining that with affordable housing, uh, if there will be a plan to um, either design or execute this with some amount of um, observance for the fact that raising a family on a permanent supportive housing site is a potentially difficult thing to do. Yeah, and that factored into our decision to um, recommend Freebirds development proposal. They have proposed to partner with Allied Housing and Abode Services for the permanent supportive housing, and they have experience in these type of developments where they are part permanent supportive housing and part affordable housing and they, they have the experience in making those projects successful. I'll just speak for myself in saying that when we go forward with things like inclusionary housing and wanting to you know, move away from in lieu fees and toward a percentage of affordable housing within existing developments, a big reason for me in supporting that is that I wanna see um, families be able to raise their children in environments that give their children really great opportunities. And this is, not that. I recognize that we need affordable housing and I recognize that we need permanent supportive housing. It's tough for me to see that this is that this is a good idea to split them. I'd rather see it be all permanent supportive housing. Any other questions from staff? Ms. Combs? Is there any, cons I have not reviewed in detail any conceptual documents um, is there any inclusion, uh, it says inclusion of neighborhood priorities, would that include our need for child care throughout our community, much less in that neighborhood in, in particular? So child care didn't come up as one of the neighborhood's top priorities for the site, uh, but they did express an interest in community space, allowing the community to use portions of uh, the site, how it's developed, and that was incorporated in the conceptual proposal to include uh, community spaces, com community meeting rooms at the site. Okay. Do we have that document? <clears throat> the conceptual proposal document? The full proposals were reviewed by the ad hoc committee um, and they are available. I could send it out to you. It's through a Dropbox because the file size is too large. Okay. I, I would like to receive the document. Okay. I, I am concerned that um, we have such a strong need for child care. We lost a lot of child care in the fires. Uh, seems like a good location for child care. Any other questions from council? We have one card, rather unique situation. Uh, Tyler's filled one out, so we'll let you go ahead and make, go ahead and make your comments. Just since Mr. Tibbetts offered you his seat, go ahead, just yeah. use it there. I'm not gonna make you walk up there. Thanks. So um, I'm a South Park resident, um, and I appreciate you guys taking into, the, uh, the into, into account the July 10th you know, information that we gave you. Um, unfortunately, uh, I mean, I, I like proposal one too. I read them today. I appreciate I appreciate everything you've been doing, Nicole. I really do. But um, as a community, I think the the broader thing we wanted to address was getting more support for the community that already exists there before bringing any more people in. And and you know, we can talk about the best way to do affordable housing or permanent supportive housing, but having um, something for the kids to do. You know, I was talking to Danielle um, on com community advisory board, and she was out there at NeighborFest. And she was talking to all the kids and they were complaining that, you know, everything to do is too far away and they would really like stuff there too. So um, I don't really know where to go with that. I don't want to, you know, make this drag on forever or sort of stop the the, um, the proposals. But if we could uh, maybe even agenda, get something on the agenda for, um, you know, alternate usage for the space beyond permit supportive housing, I, I think our community would appreciate that. Um, I don't know really where to go with that, but I just want to speak for the community. Great, uh, Adrian Lobby. Because I also haven't had time to, or taken time to review this carefully, but I want to address, um, first of all, to thank the staff for, and, and anyone, all of you, for putting some housing in that's very specifically related to homelessness. It, it's, it's so important. 
and in terms of Councilwoman Fleming's concern about children, there are family member, families who have members that need permanent supportive housing. And so I think there's a kind of false dichotomy, dichotomy or there could be, between the people who need that kind of housing and people who have children and families. Um, so I'm just kind of raising it as, an, as a, a discussion point. And thank you so much. Hey, thank you. Mr. Sawyer, you have this item. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you for encapsulating the, the comments really well about the, the subcommittee. And, and also, the, I'd like to emphasize the, the hopes and the needs of, of the neighborhood were um, addressed, and that's not always the case. And I, I think it's a win-win a in this situation. So I'll introduce a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa selecting Freebird Development Company, LLC, as the developer of the city-owned parcels at 702 and 716 Bennett Valley Road and 921 and 927 Rutledge Avenue, AN, APNS 009-333-014, 009-333-014, 009-333-014, and 009-333-014, and 009-333-014, and authorizing staff to initiate negotiations to enter into an ex exclusive negotiating agreement and authorizes the chief financial officer to appropriate $35,000 from the general fund unassigned reserves to fund the project and wait for the reading. Second. Any additional comments? And Mr. Sorry, you, you did get the ENA is with Freebird Development Company, correct? I just missed that when you were reading that. Did I not, did I not in, include that line? <laughs> into uh, selecting Freeware Development Company. Yes, I did. Thank you. Yes, L okay. I remember saying LLC. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second. Your votes, please. Oh, comments, Ms. Fleming? I just want to be very clear that I am in support of affordable housing and I am in support of permanent supportive housing. What I'm not in support of is siloing affordable housing independent of mixed-use housing. I believe that, and the research bears that families raising children tend to do better when they have uh, role models that uh, in their in their in mixed use uh, mixed income housing units it's not a commentary on affordable housing or public um, permanent supportive housing okay. and, we and have if, if, if I may mr. mayor um, I just want to clarify also that councilmember Sawyer um, um, did uh, include an amendment to the title of the resolution as it's in your packet to add the authorization for the chief financial officer to appropriate the 35,000. So just in case someone is um, looking at the resolution, that is additional language and I do recommend that you add that so that it matches up with the recommendation and with the text of the uh, resolution. And Madam City Attorney, so that we, it is written on this page. Shall I just make sure this gets into your hands or the clerk? Uh, the clerk. All right, thank you. Thank you. So we're good. Includes one, two, and three. Correct. So your votes, please. And that passes with six eyes and Mr. Tibbetts abstaining. Thank you. And it looks like we have, for our second public comment period, Thomas Ells. Thomas, did you already comment during the first public comment period? Yeah, I'm sorry, bud. You're only allowed one non-agenda items public comment. So are there any other additional cards? Okay, meeting's adjourned.